Chapter 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Section 1. Part 5. The Period of Expansion The Eagle's Song The lioness whelped, and the sturdy cub was seized by an eagle and carried up, and homed for a while in an eagle's nest, and slept for a while on an eagle's breast, and the eagle taught it the eagle's song, to be staunch and valiant and free and strong. The lion whelp sprang from the eerie nest, from the lofty crag where the queen birds rest. He fought the king on the spreading plain, and drove him back o'er the foaming main. He held the land as a thrifty chief, and reared his cattle and reaped his sheaf, nor sought the help of a foreign hand, yet welcomed all to his own free land. Two were the sons that the country bore to the northern lakes and the southern shore. And chivalry dwelt with the southern sun, And industry lived with the northern one. Tears for the time when they broke and fought, Tears was the price of the union wrought. And the land was red in a sea of blood, Where brother for brother had swelled the flood. And now that the two are one again, Behold on their shield the word refrain, And the lion cubs twain sing the eagle's song, to be staunch and valiant and free and strong. For the eagle's beak and the lion's paw, and the lion's fangs and the eagle's claw, and the eagle's swoop and the lion's might, and the lion's leap and the eagle's sight, shall guard the flag with the word refrain, now that the two are one again. Richard Mansfield Chapter 1. Reconstruction and After The war was over, but three great questions remained to be settled. How were the people of the South to be regarded? How was the Union to be reconstructed? What was to be done with the three millions of Negroes who had been given their freedom? These were the questions which came before the 39th Congress. To the 39th Congress O people chosen, are ye not, likewise the chosen of the Lord, to do His will and speak His word? From the loud thunderstorm of war, not man alone hath called ye forth, but He, the God of all the earth. The torch of vengeance in your hands He quenches, unto Him belongs the solemn recompense of wrongs. Enough of blood the land has seen, and not by cell or gallows stair shall ye the way of God prepare. Say to the pardon seekers, keep your manhood, bend no suppliant knees, nor palter with unworthy pleas. Above your voices sounds the wail of starving men. We shut in vain our eyes to pillows ghastly stain. What words can drown that bitter cry? What tears wash out the stain of death? What oaths confirm your broken faith? From you alone the guarantee Of union, freedom, peace we claim. We urge no conqueror's terms of shame. Alas, no victor's pride is ours. We bend above our triumphs won, Like David or his rebel son. Be men, not beggars. Cancel all, by one brave, generous action, Trust your better instincts, and be just. Make all men peers before the law. Take hands from off the Negro's throat. Give black and white an equal vote. Keep all your forfeit lives and lands, but give the common law's redress to labor's utter nakedness. Revive the old heroic will. Be in the right as brave and strong as ye have proved yourselves in wrong. Defeat shall then be victory. 
your loss the wealth of full amends, and hate be love, and foes be friends. Then buried be the dreadful past, its common slain be mourned, and let all memories soften to regret. Then shall the Union's mother heart, her lost and wandering ones recall, forgiving and restoring all, and freedom break her marble trance above the Capitolian dome. Stretch hands and bid ye welcome home. John Greenleaf Whittier Few men could have been worse fitted for the delicate task of Reconstruction than Andrew Johnson. But even his policy, narrow as it was, was not narrow enough to suit the radical Republicans in Congress. Mr. Johnson's Policy of Reconstruction Some Comment from the Boys in Blue His policy, do you say? By heaven, who says so lies in his throat? T'was our policy, boys, from our muster day, through skirmish and bivouac, march and fray. His policy, do you say? His policy, do but note, tis a pitiful falsehood for you to say. Did he bid all the stars in our banner float? Was it he shouted union from every throat, through the long war's weary day? His policy, how does it hap? Has the old word union no meaning, pray? What meant the U.S. upon every cap, upon every button, belt, and strap? T'was our policy all the way. His policy, that may do, for a silly and empty political brag, but t'was held by every boy in blue, when he lifted his right hand, staunch and true, and swore to sustain the flag. We are with him, none the less. He works for the same great end we sought. We feel for the South in its deep distress, and to get the old Union restored we press. T'was for this we enlisted and fought. Be it his or whose it may, tis the policy, boys, that we avow. There were noble hearts in the ranks of gray, as they proved on many a bloody day, and we would not oppress them now. Let us all forgive and forget. It was thus Grant spoke to General Lee, when, with wounds still raw and bayonets wet, the chiefs of the two great armies met beneath the old apple tree. Charles Graham Halpine The leader of this coterie was Thaddeus Stevens. He declared the South was in a state of anarchy, demanded that it be placed under military rule, and that suffrage be extended to the Negroes. In February 1868, he introduced a resolution that Andrew Johnson, President of the United States, be impeached of high crimes and misdemeanors in office. But at the trial which followed the proceedings were shown to have been actuated by partisan bitterness, and the President was acquitted. The verdict was a heavy blow to Stevens. He had burned himself out and died in August. Thaddeus Stevens died August 11, 1868. An eye with the piercing eagle's fire, not the look of the gentle dove, not his the form that men admire, nor the face that tender women love. Working first for his daily bread with the humblest toilers of the earth, never walking with free, proud tread, crippled and halting from his birth, wearing outside a thorny suit of sharp, sarcastic, stinging power, sweat at the core as sweetest fruit, or inmost heart of fragrant flower. Fierce and trenchant the haughty foe felt his words like a sword of flame, but to the humble, poor and low. Soft as a woman's, his accents came. Not his the closest, tenderest friend, no children blessed his lonely way, but down in his heart until the end the tender dream of his boyhood lay. His mother's faith he had held not fast, but he loved her living, mourned her dead, and he kept her memory to the last, as green as the sod above her bed. He held as sacred in his home whatever things she wrought or planned, and never suffered change to come to the work of her industrious hand. For her, who pillowed first his head, he heaped with a wealth of flowers the grave, while he chose to sleep in an unmarked bed 
by his master's humblest poor, the slave. Suppose he swerved from the straightest course, that the things he should not do he did, that he hid from the eyes of mortals close, such sins as you and I have hid? Or suppose him worse than you, what then? Judge not, lest you be judged for sin. One said who knew the hearts of men, who loveth much shall a pardon win. The Prince of Glory for sinners bled, his soul was bought with a royal price, and his beautified feet on flowers may tread, today with his Lord in paradise. Phoebe Carey The South's condition, meanwhile, was pitiful indeed. Negroes, led by carpetbaggers from the North, secured the ascendancy in state government. Millions of dollars were wasted or stolen, and it looked for a time as though a great section of the country was doomed to Negro domination. South Carolina to the states of the North, especially to those that formed a part of the original Thirteen. I lift these hands with iron fetters banded, Beneath the scornful sunlight and cold stars, I rear my once imperial forehead branded By alien shames and medicable scars. Like some pale captive, shunned by all the nations, I crouch, unpitied, quivering and apart, Laden with countless woes and desolations, The lifeblood freezing round a broken heart. About my feet, splashed red with blood of slaughters, my children gathering in wild, mournful throngs, despairing sons, frail infants, stricken daughters, rehearse the awful burden of their wrongs. Vain is their cry, and worse than vain their pleading. I turn from stormy breasts, from yearning eyes, to mark where freedom's outraged form receding wanes in chill shadow down the midnight skies. I wooed her once in wild, tempestuous places. The purple vintage of my soul outpoured To win and keep her unrestrained embraces. What time the olive crown o'ertopped the sword? Oh, Northmen, with your gallant heroes blending, Mine in old years for this sweet goddess died. But now, ah, shame, all other shame transcending, Your pitiless hands have torn her from my side. What? Tis a tyrant party's treacherous action. Your hand is clean, your conscience clear, ye sigh. Aye, but ere now your sires had throttled faction, or pealed o'er half the world their battle cry. Its voice outrung from solemn mountain passes, swept by wild storm winds of the Atlantic strand, to where the swart Sierra's sullen grasses droop in low languors of the sunset land. Never, since earthly states began their story, hath any suffered, bided, born like me. At last, recalling all mine ancient glory, I vowed my fettered commonwealth to free. Even at the thought, beside the prostrate column, of chartered rights which blasted lay and dim, uprose my noblest son with purpose solemn, while host on host his brethren followed him. Wrong, grasped by truth, Arraigned by law, whose sober majestic mandates rule o'er change in time, smit by the ballot like some flushed October, reeled in the autumn rankness of his crime, struck, tortured, pierced, but not a blow returning, the steadfast phalanx of my honored braves planted their bloodless flag where sunrise burning flashed a new splendor o'er our martyrs' graves. What then, O oh sister states? What welcome omen of love and concord crossed our brightening blue? The foes we vanished, are they not your foemen? Our laws upheld, your sacred safeguards too? Yet scarce had victory crowned our grand endeavor, and peace crept out from shadowy glooms remote. Then, as if bared to blast all hope forever, your tyrant sword shone glittering at my throat. Once more my bursting chains were reunited, once more barbarian plaudits wildly rung, or the last promise of deliverance blighted, the prostrate purpose and the palsied tongue. Ah, faithless sisters, neath my swift undoing, 
peers the black presage of your wrath to come. Above your heads are signal clouds of ruin, whose lightnings flash, whose thunders are not dumb. There towers a judgment seat beyond our seeing. There lives a judge whom none can bribe or blind, before whose dread decree your spirit fleering may reap the whirlwind, having sown the wind. I, in that day of justice, fierce and torrid, when blood, your blood, outpours like poisoned wine, pointing to these chained limbs, this blasted forehead, may mock your ruin as ye mocked at mine. Paul Hamilton Hayne But the white people of the South rallied at last, asserted their supremacy, and seized the reins of government. The famous Ku Klux Klan was organized and spread terror among the Negroes by its sure and swift administration of punishment, just and unjust. Ku Klux We have sent him seeds of the melon's core and nailed a warning upon his door. By the Ku Klux laws we can do no more. Down in the hollow, mid-crib and stack, the roof of his low-porched house looms black. Not a line of light at the door sills crack. Yet arm and mount and mask and ride, the hounds can sense, though the fox may hide, and for a word too much men oft have died. The clouds blow heavy towards the moon. The edge of the storm will reach it soon. The kildee cries and the lonesome loon. The cloud shall flush with a wilder glare than the lightning makes with his angled flare when the Ku Klux verdict is given there. In the pause of the thunder rolling low, a rifle's answer, who shall know, from the wind's fierce hurl and the rain's black blow. Only the signature written grim at the end of the message brought to him, a hempen rope and a twisted limb. So arm and mount and mask and ride, the hounds can sense, though the fox may hide, and for a word too much men oft have died. Madison K. Ween. The North kept its hands off and permitted the South to work out its own destiny, which it did blindly and blunderingly enough, yet bravely, too, for it had only ashes to build from. But from the ashes a new land arose, and a better one. The Rear Guard The guns are hushed, on every field once flowing, with war's red flood May's breath of peace is shed, and spring's young grass and gracious flowers are growing above the dead. Ye gray old men whom we this day are greeting, honor to you, honor and love and trust. Brave to the brave, your soldier hands are meeting across their dust. Bravely they fought who charged when flags were flying, in cannon's crash, in screech and scream of shell. Bravely they fell, who lay alone and dying, in battle's hell. Honor to them! Far graves today are flinging, up through the soil, peace blooms to meet the sun, and daisied heads to summer winds are singing, their long, well done. Our vanguard, they, they went with hot blood flushing, at battle's din, at joy of bugle's call. They fell with smiles, the flood of young life gushing, full brave the fall. But braver ye who, when the war was ended, and bugle's call and wave of flag were done, could come back home, so long left undefended, your cause unwon. And twist the useless sword to hook of reaping, Rebuild the homes, set back the empty chair, And brave a land where waste and want were keeping guard everywhere. All this you did, your courage strong upon you, And out of ashes, wreck, a new land rose. Through years of war no braver battle won you Against fiercer foes. And now today a prospered land is cheering, And lifting up her voice in lusty pride, for you gray men who fought and wrought, not fearing, battle's red tide. Our rear guard, ye whose step is slowing, slowing, whose ranks, earth-thinned, are filling otherwhere, who wore the gray, 
the gray, alas, still showing on bleaching hair. For forty years you've watched this land grow stronger. For forty years you've been its bulwark, stay. Tarry a while, pause yet a little longer upon the way. And set our feet where they may be no turning, and set our faces straight on duty's track, where there may be for stray strange goods no yearning, no looking back. And when for you the last tattoo has sounded, and on death's silent field you've pitched your tent, when bowed through tears the arc of life has rounded to full content. We that are left will count it guerdon royal, our heritage no years can take away, that we were born of those unflinching loyal who wore the gray. Irene Fowler Brown As early as 1867, the women of Columbus Miss decorated alike the graves of Confederate and Union soldiers, an action which was the first of many such. The Blue and the Gray, 1867 By the flow of the inland river, whence the fleets of iron have fled, where the blades of the grave grass quiver, asleep are the ranks of the dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the one, the blue, under the other, the gray. These in the robings of glory, those in the gloom of defeat, all with the battle-blood gory, in the dusk of eternity meet, under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the laurel, the blue, under the willow, the gray. From the silence of sorrowful hours, the desolate mourners go, lovingly laden with flowers, alike for the friend and the foe, under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the roses, the blue, under the lilies, the gray. So with an equal splendor, the morning sun rays fall, with a touch impartially tender, on the blossoms blooming for all. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Broidered with gold, the blue, Mellowed with gold, the gray. So when the summer calleth on forest and field of grain, With an equal murmur falleth the cooling drip of the rain. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Wet with the rain, the blue, wet with the rain, the gray. Sadly, but not with upbraiding, the generous deed was done. In the storm of the years that are fading, no braver battle was won. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, under the blossoms, the blue, under the garlands, the gray. No more shall the war cry sever, or the winding rivers be red. They banish our anger forever, when they laurel the graves of our dead. Under the sod and the dew, waiting the judgment day, Love and tears for the blue, tears and love for the gray. Francis Miles Finch When the South was swept by yellow fever a few years later, the North rushed to its relief, in a way which showed how completely old animosities had been forgotten. The stricken South to the North When ruthful time the South's memorial places, her heroes' graves had wreathed in grass and flowers, when peace ethereal, crowned by all her graces, returned to make more bright the summer hours, when doubtful hearts revived and hopes grew stronger, when old sore cankering wounds that pierced and stung throbbed with their first mad feverous pain no longer, while the fair future spake with flattering tongue, when once, once more she felt her pulses beating to rhythms of healthful joy and brave desire, lo! Round her doomed horizon darkly meeting, A pall of blood-red vapors feigned with fire. Oh, ghastly portent of fast-coming sorrows, Of doom that blasts the blood and blights the breath, Robs youth and manhood of all golden morrows, And life's clear goblet brims with wine of death. Oh, swift fulfillment of this portent dreary, Oh, nightmare rule of ruin racked by fears, 
heartbroken wail and solemn miserere, imperious anguish and soul-melting tears, O oh, faith thrust downward from celestial splendors, O oh, love grief-bound with palely murmurous mouth, O oh, agonized by life's supreme surrenders, behold her now, the scourged and suffering south. No balm in Gilead? Nay, but while her forehead, pallid and drooping, lies in foulest dust, there steals across the desolate spaces torrid a voice of manful cheer and heavenly trust. A hand redeeming breaks the frozen starkness of palsied nerve and dull despondent brain, rolls back the curtain of malignant darkness, and shows the eternal blue of heaven again. Revealing there, o'er worlds convulsed and shaken, that face whose mystic tenderness enticed, to hope newborn earth's lost bereaved forsaken. Ah, still beyond the tempest smiles the Christ. Whose voice, whose hand, O oh, thanks, divinest master, thanks for those grand emotions which impart grace to the north to feel the south's disaster. The south to bow with touched and cordial heart. Now, now at last, the links which war had broken are welded fast at mercy's charmed commands. Now, now, at last, the magic words are spoken, which blend in one two long divided lands. O north, you came with warrior strife and clangor, you left our south one gory burial ground, but love, more potent than your haughtiest anger, subdues the souls which hate could only wound. Paul Hamilton Hain On July 29, 1866, the first submarine cable was completed between Ireland and Newfoundland. The enterprise having been undertaken and carried through by Cyrus Westfield. How Cyrus Laid the Cable July 29, 1866 Come, listen all unto my song. It is no silly fable. Tis all about the mighty cord. They call the Atlantic Cable. Bold Cyrus Field, he said, says he, I have a pretty notion that I can run a telegraph across the Atlantic Ocean. Then all the people laughed and said they'd like to see him do it. He might get half seas over, but he never could go through it. To carry out his foolish plan he never would be able. He might as well go hang himself with his Atlantic Cable. But Cyrus was a valiant man, a fellow of decision, and heeded not their mocking words, their laughter and derision. Twice did his bravest efforts fail, and yet his mind was stable. He want the man to break his heart, because he broke his cable. Once more, my gallant boys, he cried. Three times, you know the fable. I'll make it thirty, muttered he, but I will lay the cable. Once more they tried, Hurrah, hurrah! What means this great commotion? The Lord be praised, the cables laid across the Atlantic Ocean. Loud ring the bells, four flashing through, six hundred leagues of water, old mother England's benison salutes her eldest daughter. O'er all the land the tidings speed, and soon in every nation they'll hear about the cable with profoundest admiration. Now long live President and Queen, and long live gallant Cyrus, and may his courage, faith, and zeal with emulation fire us. And may we honor evermore the manly, bold, and stable, and tell our sons to make them brave how Cyrus laid the cable. John Godfrey Sachs The Cable Hymn O lonely bay of Trinity, O dreary shores give ear, Lean down into the white-lipped sea, The voice of God to hear. From world to world his couriers fly, Thought-winged and shod with fire. The angel of his stormy sky Rides down the sunken wire. What saith the herald of the Lord? The world's long strife is done, Close wedded by that mystic cord. Its continents are one. And one in heart, as one in blood, Shall all her peoples be, 
the hands of human brotherhood are clasped beneath the sea. Through Orient seas or Afric's plain and Asian mountains born, the vigor of the northern brain shall nerve the world outworn. From clime to clime, from shore to shore, shall thrill the magic thread. The new Prometheus steals once more the fire that wakes the dead. Throb on, strong pulse of thunder, beat from answering beach to beach, fuse nations in thy kindly heat, and melt the chains of each. Wild terror of the sky above, glide tamed and dumb below, bear gently, ocean's carrier dove, thy errands to and fro. Weave on, swift shuttle of the Lord, beneath the deep so far, the bridal robe of earth's accord, the funeral shroud of war. For lo, the fall of ocean's wall, space mocked and time outrun, and round the world the thought of all is as the thought of one. The poles unite, the zones agree, the tongues of striving cease, as on the sea of Galilee the Christ is whispering, Peace. John Greenleaf Whittier The most notable accomplishment of Johnson's administration was the purchase from Russia in 1867 of the territory of Alaska. The price paid was $7,200,000, and the session was formally made on June 20. An Arctic Vision, June 20, 1867 Where the short-legged Eskimo waddle in the ice and snow and the playful polar bear nips the hunter unaware, where by day they track the ermine, and by night another vermin, segment of the frigid zone, where the temperature alone warms on St. Elias' cone, polar dock where nature slips from the ways her icy ships, land of fox and deer and sable, shore end of our western cable. Let the news that flying goes Thrill through all your Arctic flows, and reverberate the boast from the cliffs off Beachy's coast, till the tidings circling round every bay of Norton Sound throw the vocal tide wave back to the isles of Kodiak. Let the stately polar bears waltz around the pole in pairs, and the walrus in his glee bear his tusk of ivory, while the bold sea unicorn calmly takes an extra horn. All ye polar skies reveal your very rarest of parhelia. Trip it, all ye merry dancers, in the airiest of lancers. Slide, ye solemn glaciers, slide, one inch farther to the tide, nor in rash precipitation upset Tyndall's calculation. Know you not what fate awaits you, or to whom the future mates you? All ye icebergs make salam. You belong to Uncle Sam. On the spot where Eugene Sue led his wretched, wandering Jew, stands a form whose features strike, Russ and Eskimo alike. He it is whom scalds of old, in their runic rhymes foretold, lean of flank and lank of jaw, see the real northern Thor, see the awful Yankee leering just across the Straits of Bering. On the drifted snow, too plain, sinks his fresh tobacco stain, just beside the deep indentation of his number ten. Leaning on his icy hammer, stands the hero of this drama, and above the wild duck's clamor, in his own peculiar grammar, with its linguistic disguises, lo, the Arctic prologue rises. Wall, I reckon, taint so bad, seein' as twas all they had. True, the springs are rather late, and early falls predominate, but the ice crop's pretty sure, and the air is kind of pure. Taint so very mean a trade, when the land is all surveyed. There's a right smart chance of fur chase, all along this recent purchase. And, unless the stories fail, every fish from cod to whale. Rocks, too, maybe quartz, let's see. T'would be strange if there should be. 
Seems I've heard such stories told. Eh, why bless us. Yes, it's gold. While the blows are falling thick from his California pick, you may recognize the Thor of the vision that I saw. Freed from legendary glamour, see the real magician's hammer. Bret Hart Alaska Ice built, ice bound, and ice bounded. Such cold seas of silence, such room, such snow light, such sea light confounded, with thunders that smite like a doom. Such grandeur, such glory, such gloom. Hear that boom, hear that deep, distant boom of an avalanche hurled down this unfinished world. Ice seas and ice summits, ice spaces, in splendor of white as God's throne, ice worlds to the pole and ice places, untracked and unnamed and unknown. Hear that boom, hear the grinding, the groan of the ice gods in pain, hear the moan of yon ice mountain hurled down this unfinished world. Joaquin Miller Friday, September 24, 1869, witnessed one of the greatest panics ever known in the United States. When Jay Gould and a few associates managed to drive the price of gold up to 162 and a half. Israel Friars bid for gold. Friday, September 24, 1869. Zounds! How the price went flashing through. Wall Street, William, Broad Street, New. All the specie and all the land held in one ring by a giant hand. For millions more it was ready to pay and throttled the street on hangman's day. Up from the gold pit's nether hell while the innocent fountain rose and fell. Loud and higher the bidding rose and the bulls triumphant faced their foes. It seemed as if Satan himself were in it, lifting it, one per cent a minute, through the bellowing broker there amid, who made the terrible final bid. High over all, and ever higher, was heard the voice of Israel Friar. A doleful knell in the storm-swept mart, Five millions more, and for any part, I'll give one hundred and sixty. Israel Friar, the government Jew, good as the best, soaked through and through, with credit gained in the year he sold, our treasury's precious hoard of gold. Now through his thankless mouth rings out the leaguer's last and cruelest shout. Pity the shorts? Not they indeed, while a single rival's left to bleed. Down come dealers in silks and hides, crowding the gold room's rounded sides, jostling, trampling each other's feet, uttering groans in the outer street, watching with upturned faces pale, the scurrying index marks its tail. Hearing the bid of Israel Friar, that ominous voice, would it never tire? Five millions more for any part. If it breaks your firm, if it cracks your heart, I'll give one hundred and sixty. One hundred and sixty can't be. What will the bears at forty do? How will the merchants pay their dues? How will the country stand the news? What'll the banks? But listen, hold, in screwing upward the price of gold to that dangerous last particular peg. They have killed their goose with the golden egg. Just there the metal came pouring out, all ways at once like a water spout, or a rushing, gushing yellow flood that drenched the bulls wherever they stood. Small need to open the Washington main, their coffer dams were burst with the strain. It came by runners, it came by wire, to answer the bid of Israel Friar. It poured in millions from every side, and almost strangled him as he cried, I'll give one hundred and sixty, like Vulcan after Jupiter's kick, or the aphoristical rocket's stick. Down, down, down the premium fell, faster than this rude rhyme can tell. Thirty percent the index slid, yet Friar still kept making his bid. One hundred and sixty for any part. The sudden ruin had crazed his heart. Shattered his senses, 
cracked his brain and left him crying again and again, still making his bid at the market's top, like the Dutchman's leg that never could stop. One hundred and sixty, five millions more, till they dragged him howling off the floor. The very last words that seller and buyer heard from the mouth of Israel Friar, a cry to remember long as they live, were, I'll take five millions more, I'll give, I'll give one hundred and sixty. Suppose, to avoid the appearance of evil, there's such a thing as a personal devil. It would seem that his highness here got hold, for once, of a bellowing bull in gold. Whether bull or bear, it wouldn't much matter, should Israel Friar keep up his clatter. On earth or under it, as they say, he is doomed till the general judgment day. When the clerk, as he cites him to answer for it, shall bid him keep silence in that court. But it matters most, as it seems to me, that my countrymen, great and strong and free, so marvel at fellows who seem to win, that if even a clown can only begin, by stealing a railroad and use its purse, for cornering stocks and gold, or worse, for buying a judge and legislature, and sinking still lower poor human nature, the gaping public, whatever befall, will swallow him, tandem, harlots, and all, while our rich men drivel and stand amazed at the dust and pother his gang have raised, and make us remember a nursery tale of the four and twenty who feared one snail. What's bred in the bone will breed, you know, clowns and their trainers high and low, will cut such capers long as they dare, while honest poverty says its prayer. But tell me what prayer or fast can save some hoary candidate for the grave. The market's wrinkled giant despair, muttering, brooding, scheming there, founding a college or building a church, lest heaven should leave him in the lurch. Better come out in the rival way, issue your scrip in open day, and pour your wealth in the grimy fist of some gross-mouthed gambling pugilist. Leave toil and poverty where they lie. Pass thinkers, workers, artists by. Your pothouse fag from his counters bring, and make him into a railway king. Between such Gentiles and such Jews, little enough one finds to choose, either the other will buy and use. Eat the meat and throw him the bone, and leave him to stand the brunt alone. Let the tempest come that's gathering near and give us a better atmosphere. Edmund Clarence Stedman On October 8 and 9, 1871, Chicago, which had grown to be the greatest city in the West, was almost entirely destroyed by fire. An area of three and a half square miles was burned over. 200 people were killed and 100,000 rendered homeless. Chicago, October 8 through 10, 1871. Men said at Vespers, all is well, and one wild night the city fell. Fell shrines of prayer and marts of gain before the fiery hurricane. On threescore spires had sunset shone, where ghastly sunrise looked on none. Men clasped each other's hands and said, the city of the West is dead. Brave hearts who fought in slow retreat, the fiends of fire from street to street, turned, powerless, to the blinding glare, the dumb defiance of despair. A sudden impulse thrilled each wire that signaled around that sea of fire. Swift words of cheer, warm heart throbs came, in tears of pity died the flame. From east, from west, from south and north, the messages of hope shot forth, and, underneath the severing wave, the world, full-handed, reached to save. Fair seemed the old, but fairer still, the new, the dreary void shall fill, with dearer homes than those o'erthrown, for love shall lay each cornerstone. Rise, stricken city, from thee throw, the ashen sackcloth of thy woe, and build, as to Amphion's strain, to songs of cheer thy walls again. 
How shriveled in thy hot distress The primal sin of selfishness! How instant rose to take thy part The angel in the human heart! Ah! Not in vain the flames that tossed Above thy dreadful holocaust! The Christ again has preached through thee The gospel of humanity! Then lift once more thy towers on high, And fret with spires the western sky, To tell that God is yet with us, And love is still miraculous. John Greenleaf Whittier Chicago Blackened and bleeding, helpless, panting, prone, On the charred fragments of her shattered throne, Lies she who stood but yesterday alone, Queen of the West, by some enchanter taught, To lift the glory of Aladdin's court, Then lose the spell that all that wonder wrought. Like her own prairies by some chance seed sown, Like her own prairies in one brief day grown, Like her own prairies in one fierce night moan. She lifts her voice, and in her pleading call, We hear the cry of Macedon to Paul, The cry for help that makes her kin to all, but haply with wane fingers may she feel The silver cup hid in the proffered meal, The gifts her kinship and our loves reveal. Bret Hart The whole country rallied to the aid of the stricken city. An aid and relief society was at once formed, and within a month had received subscriptions aggregating three and a half millions. Chicago Gaunt in the midst of the prairie, she who was once so fair, Charred and rent are her garments, heavy and dark like cerements, Silent, but round her the air, plaintively wails, miserere. Proud like a beautiful maiden, art-like from forehead to feet, Was she still pressed like a leman, close to the breast of the demon? Lusting for one so sweet, so were her shoulders laden. Friends she had, rich in her treasures, Shall the old taunt be true? Fallen, they turned their cold faces, Seeking new wealth gilded places, Saying we never knew Aught of her smiles or her pleasures. Silent she stands on the prairie, Wrapped in her fire-scathed sheet. Around her, thank God, is the nation, Weeping for her desolation, Pouring its gold at her feet, Answering her, Miserere. John Boyle O'Reilly Only second to the Chicago fire in destructiveness was that which visited Boston in the following year. It started on Saturday evening, November 9, 1872, and 65 acres were laid waste before it was controlled. Boston, November 9, 1872 O broad-breasted queen among nations, O mother, so strong in thy youth, Has the Lord looked upon thee in ire, And wilt thou be chastened by fire, Without any ruth? Has the merciful tired of his mercy, And turned from thy sinning in wrath, That the world with raised hand sees and pities, Thy desolate daughters, thy cities, Despoiled on their path? One year since thy youngest was stricken, Thy eldest lies stricken today. Ah, God, thy wrath without pity, To tear the strong heart from our city, And cast it away? O oh, Father, forgive us our doubting, The stain from our weak souls efface. Thou rebukest, we know, but to chasten, Thy hand has but fallen to hasten. Return to thy grace. Let us rise purified from our ashes, As sinners have risen who grieved, let us show that twice-sent desolation On every true heart in the nation Has conquest achieved. John Boyle O'Reilly The district burned contained the finest business blocks in the city, and the loss was estimated at $80 million. For a time, it seemed that the famous Old South would be destroyed. The Church of the Revolution the Old South Stands Loud through the still November air The clang and clash of fire bells broke From street to street, from square to square 
rolled sheets of flame and clouds of smoke. The marble structures reeled and fell. The iron pillars bowed like lead. But one lone spire rang on its bell, above the flames. Men passed and said, The Old South stands. The gold moon, gainst a copper sky, hung like a portent in the air. The midnight came, the wind rose high, and men stood speechless in despair. But as the marble columns broke, and wider grew the chasm red, a seething gulf of flame and smoke, the firemen marked the spire and said, The Old South stands. Beyond the harbor, calm and fair, the sun came up through bars of gold, then faded in a wanish glare. As flame and smoke still upward rolled, the princely structures crowned with art, where commerce laid her treasures bare, the haunts of trade, the common mart, all vanished in the withering air. The Old South stands. The Old South must be leveled soon to check the flames and save the street. Bring fuse and powder, but at noon the ancient fane still stood complete. The mitred flame had lipped the spire, the smoke its blackness o'er its cast. Then, hero-like, men fought the fire, and from each lip the watchword passed, the Old South stands. All night the Red Sea round it rolled, and o'er it fell the fiery rain. And, as each hour the old clock told, men said, "'Twill never strike again." But still the dial plate at morn was crimsoned in the rising light. Long may it redden with the dawn, and mark the shading hours of night. Long may it stand. Long may it stand, where help was sought, in weak and dark and doubtful days, where freedom's lessons first were taught, and prayers of faith were turned to praise, where burned the first Shekinah's flame, in God's new temples of the free, long may it stand in freedom's name, like Israel's pillar by the sea, long may it stand. Hezekiah Butterworth The nation rushed to Boston's aid, just as it had done to Chicago's, and the city soon rose from her ashes greater than ever. After the Fire While far along the eastern sky I saw the flags of havoc fly, as if his forces would assault the sovereign of the starry vault, and hurl him back the burning rain that seared the cities of the plain. I read as on a crimson page the words of Israel's sceptred sage. For riches make them wings, and they do as an eagle fly away. O vision of that sleepless night, what hue shall paint the mocking light that burned and stained the orient skies, where peaceful morning loves to rise, as if the sun had lost its way and dawned to make a second day. Above how red with fiery glow, how dark to those it woke below. On roof and wall, on dome and spire, flashed the false jewels of the fire. Girt with her belt of glittering panes, and crowned with starry gleaming veins, our northern queen in glory shone, with newborn splendors not her own, and stood, transfigured in our eyes, a victim decked for sacrifice. The cloud still hovers overhead, and still the midnight sky is red, as the lost wanderer strays alone to seek the place he called his own. His devious footprints sadly tell how changed the pathways known so well. The scene how new, the tale how old, ere yet the ashes have grown cold. Again I read the words that came, writ in the rubric of the flame, howe'er we trust to mortal things. Each hath its pair of folded wings. Though long their terrors rest unspread, Their fatal plumes are never shed. At last, at last, they stretch in flight, And blot the day and blast the night. Hope, only hope, of all that clings, Around us never spreads her wings. Love, though he break his earthly chain, Still whispers he will come again. But faith that soars to seek the sky shall teach our half-fledged souls to fly, and find, 
Beyond the smoke and flame, the cloudless azure whence they came. Oliver Wendell Holmes On May 16, 1874, the bursting of a reservoir dam at Williamsburg, Mass., caused a disastrous flood, costing 140 lives and the loss of $1,500,000 in property. The loss of life would have been far greater, but for the heroism of a milkman named Collins Graves, who rode forward in front of the flood, giving warning. The Ride of Collins Graves May 16, 1874 No song of a soldier riding down To the raging fight from Winchester town No song of a time that shook the earth With the nation's throw at a nation's birth But the song of a brave man Free from fear As Sheridan's self or Paul Revere Who risked what they risked Free from strife and its promise of glory pay his life. The peaceful valley has waked and stirred, and the answering echoes of life are heard. The dew still clings to the trees and grass, and the early toilers smiling pass. As they glance aside at the white-walled homes, or up the valley, where merrily comes, the brook that sparkles in diamond rills, as the sun comes over the Hampshire hills, what was it passed like an ominous breath, like a shiver of fear or a touch of death? What was it? The valley is peaceful still, and the leaves are a fire on top of the hill. It was not a sound nor a thing of sense, but a pain like the pang of the short suspense that thrills the being of those who see at their feet the gulf of eternity. The air of the valley has felt the chill, the workers pause at the door of the mill. The housewife, keen to the shivering air, arrests her foot on the cottage stair. Instinctive taught by the mother love, and thinks of the sleeping ones above. Why start the listeners? Why does the course of the mill stream widen? Is it a horse? Hark to the sound of the hooves, they say, that gallop so widely Williamsburg way. God, what was that? Like a human shriek. From the winding valley, will nobody speak? Will nobody answer those women who cry as the awful warnings thunder by? Whence came they? Listen, and now they hear the sound of the galloping horse hoofs near. They watch the trend of the veil and see the rider who thunders so menacingly with waving arms and warning scream to the home-filled banks of the valley stream. He draws no rein, but he shakes the street with a shout and the ring of the galloping feet, and this the cry he flings to the wind, To the hills for your lives, the flood is behind. He cries and is gone, but they know the worst, the breast of the Williamsburg Dam has burst. The basin that nourished their happy homes is changed to a demon. It comes, it comes, a monster in aspect, with shaggy front, of shattered dwellings to take the brunt, of the homes they shatter, white-maned and hoarse, the merciless terror fills the course of the narrow valley and rushing raves, with death on the first of its hissing waves, till cottage and street and crowded mill are crumbled and crushed. But onward still, in front of the roaring flood is heard, the galloping horse and the warning word, thank God the brave man's life is spared. From Williamsburg town he nobly dared, to race with the flood and take the road in front of the terrible swath it mowed. For miles it thundered and crashed behind, but he looked ahead with a steadfast mind. They must be warned, was all he said, as away on his terrible ride he sped. When heroes are called for, bring the crown. To this Yankee rider, send him down on the stream of time with the courteous old. His deed as the Romans was brave and bold. And the tale can as noble a thrill awake, for he offered his life for the people's sake. John Boyle O'Reilly End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Lore. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Chapter 2. Chapter 2, The Year of a Hundred Years. The year 1876 marked the completion of the first century of independence, and it was decided to celebrate it in a worthy manner. The city of Philadelphia, where the country had been born, was fittingly selected as the place for the celebration. Our first century. It cannot be that men who are the seed of Washington should miss fame's true applause. Franklin did plan us. Marshall gave us laws and slow the broad scroll grew a people's creed. Union and liberty, then at our need. Time's challenge coming, Lincoln gave it pause, upheld the double pillars of the cause, and dying left them whole, our crowning deed. Such were the fathering race that made all fast, who founded us and spread from sea to sea, a thousand leagues the zone of liberty, and built for man this refuge from his past, unkinged, unchurched, unsoldiered, shamed we were, failing the stature that such sires forecast. George Edward Woodbury The celebration took the form of a great industrial exposition at which the arts and industry of the whole world were present, represented. The exposition was open on May 10, 1876, more than a hundred thousand people being present. Wigner had composed a march for the occasion and Whittier's Centennial Hymn was sung by a chorus of a thousand voices. Centennial Hymn 1. Our Father's God, from out whose hand the centuries fall like grains of sand, we meet today united free and loyal to our land and thee, to thank thee for the error done and trust thee for the opening one. 2. Here, where of old by thy design the Father spake the word of thine, whose echo is the glad refrain of rended bolt and falling chain. To grace our festal time from all, the zones of earth our guests we call. 3. Be with us while the new world greets, the old world thronging all its streets, unveiling all the triumphs won by art or toil beneath the sun, an unto common good ordain, this rivalship of hand and brain. 4. Thou who hast here in conquered furled the war flags of a gathered world, beneath our western skies fulfill the Orient's mission of goodwill, and freighted with love's golden fleece, send back its argonauts of peace. 5. For art and labor met in truce, for beauty made the bride of use, we thank thee, but withal we crave the austere virtues, virtues strong to save, the honor proof to place or gold, the manhood never bought nor sold. 6. O oh, make thou us through centuries long, in peace secure, in justice strong, around our gift of freedom draw the safeguards of thy righteous law, and cast in some diviner mold let the new cycle shame the old. John Greenleaf Whittier The Restored South chanted the praises of the Union in the words of Sidney Lanier, the Georgia poet. The poem was written as a cantata, the music for which was composed by Dudley Buck. The Centennial Meditation of Columbia, 1776-1876 from this hundred terraced height, sight more large with nobler light, ranges down yon towering years, humbler smiles and lordlier tears, shine and fall, shine and fall, while old voices rise and call, yonder where the to and fro, weltering of my long ago, moves about the moveless base, far below my resting place. Mayflower, Mayflower, slowly hither flying, trembling westward o'er yon balking sea, hearts within, farewell dear England sighing, winds without, but dear in vain replying, gray-lipped waves about thee shouted, crying, no, it will not be. 
Jamestown out of thee, Plymouth thee, thee Albany. Winter cries, ye freeze away, Fever cries, ye burn away, Hunger cries, ye starve away, Vengeance cries, your graves shall stay. Then old shapes and masks of things, Framed like faiths or clothed like kings, Ghosts of goods once fleshed and fair, Grown foul beds and alien air, War and his most noisy lords, Tongued with lithe and poisoned swords, Error, terror, rage, and crime, All in a windy night of time, Cried to me from land and sea, No, thou shalt not be. Hark! Huguenots whispering, Yea, in the dark, Puritans answering, Yea, in the dark, Yeah, like an arrow shot true to his mark, Darts through the tyrannous heart of denial, Patience and labor and solemn soul trial, Foiled, still beginning, soiled, but not sinning. Toil through this stertorous death of night. Toil when wild brother wars new dark the light. Toil and forgive and kiss o'er and replight. Now praise to God's oft-granted grace. Now praise to man's undaunted face. Despite the land, despite the sea, I was, I am, and I shall be. How long, good angel, oh, how long? Sing me from heaven a man's own song. Long as thine art shall love true love, Long as thy science truth shall know, Long as thine eagle harms no dove, Long as thy law by law shall grow, Long as thy God is God above, Thy brother every man below, So long, dear land of all my love, Thy name shall shine, thy fame shall grow. O oh, music, from this height of time my word unfold, In thy large signals all men's hearts man's heart behold. Mid heaven unroll thy chords as friendly flags unfurled, And wave the world's best lovers welcome to the world. Sidney Lanier President Grant then declared the exposition open. It was a success from the very start, and great crowds were every day in attendance. Centennial Hymn, 1876. Through calm and storm the years have led our nation on from stage to stage, a century's pace until we tread the threshold of another age. We see where o'er our pathway swept a torrent stream of blood and fire, and thank the guardian power who kept our sacred league of states entire. O checkered train of years farewell, with all thy strifes and hopes and fears, yet with us let thy memories dwell to warn and teach the coming years. And thou, the new beginning age, warned by the past and not in vain, write on a fairer, whiter page the record of thy happier reign. William Cullen Bryant. On July 4th, 1876, simple but impressive exercises were held in the public square in the rear of Independence Hall, where, a century before, a great throng had awaited the promulgation of the Declaration. Welcome to the Nations, Philadelphia, July 4th, 1876. Bright on the banners of lily and rose, lo, the last sun of our century sets. Wreathe the black cannon that scowled our foes. All but her friendships the nation forgets. All but her friends and their welcome forgets. These are around her, but where are her foes? Lo, while the sun of her century sets, Peace with her garlands of lily and rose. Welcome, a shout like the war's trumpet swell, Wakes the wild echoes that slumber around. Welcome, it quivers from liberty's bell. Welcome. The walls of her temple resound. Hark, the gray walls of her temple resound. Fade the far voices o'er hillside and dell. Welcome, still whisper the echoes around. Welcome, still trembles on liberty's bell. Thrones of the continent, isles of the sea, Yours are the garlands of peace we entwine. Welcome, once more, to the land of the free, Shadowed alike by the palm and the pine. Softly they murmur, the palm and the pine, 
Hushed is our strife in the land of the free, for your children their branches entwine, thrones of the continents, isles of the sea. Oliver Wendell Holmes The National Ode was read by its author, Boehner Taylor, whose deep voice and impressive delivery added appreciably to the majesty of the lines. The National Ode, Independence Square, Philadelphia, July 4th, 1876. One. Son of the stately day, let Asia into the shadow drift. Let Europe bask in thy ripened ray, and o'er the severing ocean lift. A, broad, a brow of broader splendor, give light to the eager eyes of the light that waits to behold thee rise. The gladness of morning lend her, with the triumph of noon attend her, and the peace of the vesper skies, for lo, she cometh now, with hope on the lip and pride on the brow, stronger and dearer and fairer, to smile on the love we bear her, to live as we dreamed her and sought her, liberty's latest daughter. In the clefts of the rock, in the secret places, we found her traces. On the hills, in the crash of woods that fall, we hear her call. When the lines of battle broke, we saw her face in the fiery smoke. Through toil and anguish and desolation, we followed and found her with the grace of a virgin nation. As a sacred zone around her, who shall rejoice with a righteous voice far headed through the ages, if not she? For the menace is dumb that defied her, the doubt is dead that denied her, and she stands acknowledged and strong and free. 2. Ah, hark, the solemn undertone. On every wind of human story blown, a large, divinely molded fate questions the right and purpose of a state, and in its plan sublime, our errors are the dust of time. The far-off yesterday of power creeps back with stealthy feet, invades our lordship of the hour, and at our banquet takes the unbidden seat from all unchronicled and silent ages, before the future first begot the past, till history dared at last, to write eternal words on granite pages, from Egypt's tawny drift and Assur's mound, and where uplifted wide and far, Earth's highest yearns to meet a star, and man his manhood by the Ganges found, imperial heads of old millennial sway, and still by some pale splendor crowned, chill as a corpse, light in our full orb day, in ghostly grandeur rise, and say through stony lips and vacant eyes, Thou that assertest freedom, power, and fame, declare to us thy claim. 1, 2. On the shores of the co uh, continent cast, she won the inviolate soil, by loss of heirdom of all the past and faith in the royal right of toil. She planted homes on the savage sod into the wilderness lone. She walked with fearless feet in her hand the divining rod till the veins of the mountain beat her with fire of metal and force of stone. She set the speed of the river head to turn the mills of her bread. She drove her plowshare deep through the Prairies thousand centuries sleep, to the south and west and north, she called Pathfinder forth, her faithful and sole companion, where the flushed Sierra snow starred, her way to the sunset barred, and the nameless rivers in thunder and foam channeled the terrible canyon, nor paused till her uttermost home was built in the smile of a softer sky and the glory of beauty still to be, where the haunted waves of Asia die, on the strand of the worldwide sea. I, I, too. The race in conquering, some fierce titanic joy of conquest knows, whether in veins of surf or king, our ancient blood beats restless in repose, challenge of nature subdued, unsubdued, awaits not man's defiant answer long, for hardship, even as wrong, provokes the level-eyed heroic mood, 
This for herself she did, but that which lies as over earth's the skies, blending all forms in one benignant glow, crowned conscience, tender care, justice that answers every bondman's prayer, freedom, freedom where faith may lead and thought may dare, the power of minds that know, passion of hearts that feel, purchased by blood and woe, guarded by fire and steel, hath she secured what blazon on her shield, in the clear century's light shines the world revealed, declare nobler triumph born of right. I three. Foreseen in the visions of sages, foretold when martyrs bled, she was born of the longing of ages, by the truth of the noble dead, and the faith of the living fed, no blood in her lightest veins, frets at remembered chains, no shame of bondage has bowed her head, in her form and features still, the unblenching Puritan will, cavalier honor, Huguenot grace, the Quaker truth and sweetness, and the strength of the danger-girdled race, of Holland, blend in a proud completeness, from the homes of all, where her being began. She took what she gave to man, justice that knew no station, belief as soul decreed. Free air for inspiration, free force for independent deed, she takes but to give again, and the sea returns the rivers in rain and gathers the chosen of her seed from the hunted of every crown and creed. Her Germany dwells by a gentler Rhine, her Ireland sees the old sunburnt shine, her France pursues some dream divine, her Norway keeps his mountain pine, her Italy waits by the western brine, and broad-based under all is planted England's oaken-hearted mood, as rich in fortitude, as air went worldward from the island wall, fused in her candid light, to one strong race all races here unite, tongues melt in hers, hereditary foemen, forget their sword and slogan, kith and clan, t'was glory once to be a Roman, she makes it glory now to be a man. I, I, three. Bow down, doth thine Aenonian crown, one hour forget, the glory and recall the debt, make expiation of humbler mood for the pride of thine exaltation, or peril conquered and strife subdued. But half the right is rested when victory yields her prize, and half the marrow tested when old endurance dies. In the sight of them that love thee, bow to the greater above thee. He faileth not to smite the idle ownership of right nor spares to sinews fresh from trial and virtued school in long denial. The test set wait for thee in larger perils of prosperity. Here at the century's awful shrine, bow to the Father's God and thine. I four. Behold, she bendeth now, humbling the chaplet of her hundred years. There's a solemn sweetness on her brow, and in her eyes are sacred tears. Can she forget, in present joy, the burden of her debt, when for a captive race she grandly staked and won the total promise of her power begun, and bared her bosom's grace to the sharp wound that inly tortures yet? Can she forget the million graves her young devotion set, the hands that clasp above from either side in sad returning love? Can she forget, here where the ruler of today the citizen of tomorrow, and equal thousands rejoice and pray. Beside these holy walls are met, her birth cry mixed of keenest bliss and sorrow. Here on July's immortal morn, held forth the people saw her head, and shouted to the world, the king is dead. But lo, the heir is born, when fire of youth and sober trust of age, and farmer, soldier, priest, and sage, arose and cast upon her, Baptismal garments, never robes so fair, clad prince in old world air, their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. I, I, four. Arise, recrown thy head, radiant with blessings of the dead. Bear from this hallowed place the prayer that purifies thy lips, 
The light of courage that defies eclipse, The rose of man's new morning on thy face. Let no iconoclast invade thy rising pantheon of the past, To make a blank where Adam stood, To touch the father's sheathed and sacred blade, Spoil crowns on Jefferson and Franklin lay, Or wash from freedom's feet the stains of Lincoln's blood. Hearken, as from the haunted hall, their voices call. We lived and died for thee. We greatly dared that thou mightest be. So from thy children still, we claim denials which at last fulfill, and freedom yielded to preserve thee free. Beside clear-hearted right, that smiles at power's uplifted rod, plant duties that requite, and order that sustains upon thy sod, and stand in stainless might, above all self, and only less than God. I, I, I won. Here may thy solemn challenge end, all proving past and each discordance die, of doubtful augury, or in one choral with the present blend, and that half heard sweet harmony, of something nobler than our sons may see, though poignant, poignant memories burn, of days that were and may again return, when thy fleet foot, O huntress of the woods, The slippery brinks of danger knew, And dim the eyesight grew, That was so sure in thine old solitudes, Yet stays some richer sense, One from the mixture of thine elements, To guide the vagrant scheme, And winnow truth from each conflicting dream. Yet in thy blood shall live Some force unspent, some essence primitive, to seize the highest use of things, for fate, to mold thee to her plan, denied thee food of kings, withheld the utter and orchard fruits, fed thee with savage roots, and forced thy harsher milk from barren breasts of man. I, I, I too. O oh, sacred woman form of the first people's need and passion wrought, no thin pale ghost of thought, but fair as morning and his heart's blood warm, wearing thy priestly tire on Judah's hill, clear-eyed beneath Athene's helm of gold, or from Rome's central seat, hearing the pulses of the continent be continents beat, in thunder where her legions rolled, compact of high heroic hearts and wills, whose being circles all, the selfless aim of men, and all fulfills, Thyself not free, so long as one is thrall. Goddess, that is, as a nation lives, and as a nation dies, that for her children as a man defies, and to her children as a mother gives, take our fresh fealty now, no more chieftainess with wampum zone, and feather cinctured brow, no more a new Britannia grown to spread an equal banner to the breeze, and lift thy trident o'er the trouble, double seas, but with unborrowed crest, in thine own native beauty dressed, the front of pure command, the unflinching eye, thine own. I, 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 three. Look up, look forth, and on. There's light in the dawning sky. The clouds are parting, the night is gone. Prepare for the work of the day. Fallow thy pastures lie and far thy shepherds stray, and the fields of thy vast domain are waiting for purer seed, of knowledge, desire, and deed, for keener sunshine and mellower rain. But keep thy garments pure, pluck them back with the old disdain, from the touch, from touch of the hands that stain, so shall thy strength endure, transmute into good the gold of gain. Compel to beauty thy ruder powers, till the bounty of coming hours shall plant on thy fields apart with the oak of toil the rose of art be careful and keep us so be strong and fear no foe be just and the world shall know with the same love love us as we give and the day shall never come that finds us weak or dumb to join and smite and cry in the great task for thee to die and the greater task for thee to live bayard taylor Richard Henry Lee, grandson of the mover of the Declaration, came to the front with the original document in his hands and read its sonorous sentences. 
William M. Evers delivered an oration in Our National Banner, words by Dexter Smith, music by Sir Julius Benedict, was sung. Our National Banner, July 4th, 1876. O'er the high and o'er the lowly floats that banner bright and holy in the rays of freedom's sun, in the nation's heart embedded, o'er our union newly wedded, one and all and all in one. Let that banner wave forever, may its lustrous stars fade never, till the stars shall pale on high, while there's right the wrong defeating, while there's hope in true hearts beating, truth and freedom shall not die. As it floated long before us, be it ever floating o'er us, o'er the land from shore to shore. There are freedmen yet to wave it, millions who would die to save it. Wave it, save it, evermore. Dexter Smith The exposition closed November 10, 1876. It had served to draw all sections of the country more closely together and to establish the industrial position of the United States among the nations of the world. After the centennial, a hope. Before our eyes a pageant rolled, whose banners every land unfurled, and as it passed its splendors told, the art and glory of the world. The nations of the earth have stood, with face to face and hand in hand, and sworn to common brotherhood, that sundered souls of every land. And while America is pledged to light her faro's towers for all, while her broad mantle starred and edged, with truth o'er high and low shall fall, and while the electric nerves still belt the state and continent in one, Discords of the past shall melt like ice beneath the summer sun. O'er land of hope, thy future years are shrouded from our mortal sight. But thou canst turn the century's fears to heralds of a cloudless light. The sacred torch our fathers lit, no wild misrule can ever quench. Still in our midst, midst wise judges sit, whom party passion cannot blench. From soul to soul, from hand to hand. Thy sons have passed the torch along, whose flame by wisdom's breath is fanned, whose staff is held by runners strong. O spirit of immortal truth, thy power alone that circles all, can feed the fire as in its youth, can hold the runners lest they fall. Christopher Pierce Cranch End of chapter 2 Recording by Jason Lohr Chapter 3 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Chapter 3, The Conquest of the Plains. The Indians had long ceased to be a serious menace to the United States, and the policy of the government for many years had been to settle them upon various selected tracts of land west of the Mississippi. But the population of the West was increasing very rapidly, the completion of the railway to the Pacific having given it a great impetus. The Pacific Railway finished May 10, 1869, and a highway shall there be. Tis done, the wondrous thoroughfare, type of that highway all divine, no ancient wonder can compare. With this in grandeur of design. For twas no visionary scheme To immortalize the builder's name, No impulse rash, no transient dream Of some mere worshipper of fame. Rare common sense conceived the plan For working out a lasting good, The full development of man, The growth of human brotherhood. And lo, 
by patient toil and care the work with rare success is crowned and nations yet to be will share in blessings that shall e'er abound across a continent's expanse the lengthening track now runs secure o'er which the iron horse shall prance so long as earth and time endure his course extends from east to west from where atlantic billows roar to where the quiet waters rest beside the far pacific shore proud commerce by atlantic gales tossed to and fro her canvas rent will gladly furl her wearied sails and glide across a continent through smiling valleys broad and free o oh, rivers wide or mountain crest her course shall swift and peaceful be till she has reached the farthest west and even the treasures of the east diverted from their wonted track with safety gained with speed increased will follow in her footsteps back and thus the nations greatly blessed will share another triumph one that links yet closer east and west the rising and the setting sun this glorious day with joy we greet may faith abound may love increase and may this highway now complete be the glad harbinger of peace god bless the work that it may prove the source of greater good in store when man shall heed the law of love and nations shall learn war no more c r ballard during the autumn of eighteen seventy four gold was discovered in the black hills sioux reservation and explorers rushed in a still worse grievance was the wanton destruction of bison by hunters and excursionists driven to fury at last tribe after tribe of savages took up arms and started on a career of murder and rapine after the comanches saddle 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 mount mount and away over the dim green prairie straight on the track of day spare not spur for mercy hurry with shout and thong fiery and tough is the mustang the prairie is wide and long saddle 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 leap from the broken door where the brute comanche entered and the white foot treads no more the hut is burnt to ashes there are dead men stark outside and only a long torn ringlet left of the stolen bride go like the east winds howling ride with death behind stay not for food or slumber till the thieving wolves ye find they came before the wedding swifter than prayer or priest the bridemen danced to bullets the wild dogs ate the feast look to rifle and powder buckle the knife belt sure loose the coil of the lasso and make the loop secure fold the flask in the poncho fill the pouch with maize and ride as if to-morrow were the last of living days saddle 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 redden spur and thong ride like the mad tornado the track is lonely and long spare not horse nor rider fly for the stolen bride bring her home on the crupper a scalp on either side it was decided to transfer the sioux to another reservation but under the advice of sitting bull they refused to stir a detachment under lieutenant colonel george a custer was sent against them and came suddenly upon their encampment on june twenty five eighteen seventy six a terrific fight followed in which custer and all of his men were killed down the little big horn june twenty five 
eighteen seventy six down the little big horn o oh, troop forlorn right into the camp of the sioux what was the muster two hundred and sixty two went into the fight with custer went out of the fight with custer went out at a breath staunch to the death just from the canyon emerging saw they the braves of sitting bull surging two thousand and more painted and feathered thirsting for gore did they shrink and turn back hear how the rifles crack did they pause for a life for a sweetheart or wife and one in that savage throng his revenge had waited long pomped with porcupine quills his deerskins beaded and fringed an eagle's plume in his long black hair his tall lance fluttering in the air glanced at the circling hills his cheeks flushed with a keen surmise a demon's hate in his eyes remembering the hour when he cringed a prisoner thonged chief rain in the face there was a sachem wronged saw his enemy's heart laid bare feasted and thought like a beast in his lair cavalry cavalry tramp of the hoof champ of the bit horses prancing cavorting shying and snorting accoutrements rattling children at home are prattling gallantly gallantly company dismount from the saddle they swing with their steeds from a ring hear how the bullets sing who can their courage recount do you blanch at their fate who would hesitate two hundred and sixty-two immortals in blue standing shoulder to shoulder like some granite boulder you must blast to displace were they of a valiant race two hundred and sixty-two and never a man to say i rode with custer that day give the savage his triumph and bluster give the hero to perish with custer to his god and his comrades true closing and closing nearer the redskins creep with cunning disposing with yell and with whoop there are women shall weep they gather and swoop they come like a flood maddened with blood they shriek plying the knife was there one begged for his life where but a moment ago stood serried and sternly the foe now fallen mangled below down the little big horn tramp of the hoof champ of the bit a single steed in the morn comanche seven times hit comes to the river to drink lists for the sabre's clink lists for the voice of his master oh glorious disaster comes sniffing the air gazing lifts his head but his master lies dead who but the dead were there but stay what was the muster two hundred and sixty-two two thousand and more the sioux went into the fight with custer went out of the fight with custer for never a man can say i rode with custer that day went out like a taper blown by a sudden vapor went out at a breath true to the death francis brooks little big horn june twenty five eighteen seventy six beside the lone river that idly lay dreaming flashed sudden the gleaming of sabre and gun in the light of the sun as over the hillside the soldiers came streaming one peal of the bugle in stillness unbroken that sounded a token of soul-stirring strife savage war to the knife then silence that seemed like defiance unspoken but out of an ambush came warriors riding swift ponies bestriding shook rattles and shells with a discord of yells that fired the hearts of their comrades in hiding then fierce on the wigwams 
the soldiers descended and madly were blended the red man and white in hand-to-hand -hand fight with the indian village assailed and defended and there through the passage of battle-torn spaces from dark lurking places with blood-curdling cry and their knives held on high rushed amazon women with wild painted faces then swung the keen sabres and flashed the shore rifles their message that stifles the shout in red throats all the reckless blue coats laughed on mid the fray as men laugh over trifles grim cavalry troopers unshorn and unshaven and never a craven in ambuscade caught and like demons they fought round the knoll on the prairie that marked their last haven but the sioux circled nearer the shrill war-whoop crying and death hail was flying yet still they fought on till the last shot was gone and all that remained were the dead and the dying a song for their death and no black plumes of sorrow this recompense borrow like heroes they died man to man side by side we lost them to-day we shall meet them to-morrow and on the lone river has faded the seeming of bright armor gleaming but there by the shore with the ghosts of no more the shades of the dead through the ages lie dreaming ernest mcgaffey custer's last charge june twenty five eighteen seventy six dead is it possible he the bold rider custer our hero the first in the fight charming the bullets of yore to fly wider far from our battle king's ringlets of light dead our young chieftain and dead all forsaken no one to tell us the way of his fall slain in the desert and never to waken never not even to victory's call proud for his fame that last day that he met them all the night long he had been on their track scorning their traps and the men that had set them wild for a charge that should never give back there on the hilltop he halted and saw them lodges all loosened and ready to fly hurrying scouts with the tidings to all them told of his coming before he was nigh all the wide valley was full of their forces gathered to cover the lodge's retreat warriors running in haste to their horses thousands of enemies close to his feet down in the valleys the ages had hollowed there lay the sitting bull's camp for a prey numbers what wrecked he what wrecked those who followed men who had fought ten to one ere that day out swept the squadrons the fated three hundred into the battle line steady and full then down the hillside exultingly thundered into the hordes of the old sitting bull wild ogalala arapaho cheyenne wild horses braves and the rest of their crew shrank from that charge like a herd from a lion then closed around the grim horde of wild sioux right to their center he charged and then facing hark to those yells and around them o oh, see over the hilltops the indians come racing coming as fast as the waves of the sea red was the circle of fire around them no hope of victory no ray of light shot through that terrible black cloud without them brooding in death over custer's last fight then did he blench did he die like a craven begging those torturing fiends for his life was there a soldier who carried the seven flinched like a coward or fled from the strife no by the blood of our custer no quailing there in the midst of the indians they close hemmed in by thousands but ever assailing fighting like tigers 
all bade amid foes thicker and thicker the bullets came singing down go the horses and riders and all swiftly the warriors round them were ringing circling like buzzards awaiting their fall see the wild steeds of the mountain and prairie savage eyes gleaming from forests of maine quivering lances with pennons so airy were painted warriors charging amain backward again and again they were driven shrinking to close with the lost little band never a cap that had worn the bright seven bowed till its wearer was dead on the strand closer and closer the death circle growing ever the leader's voice clarion clear rang out his words of encouragement glowing we can but die once boys we'll sell our lives dear dearly they sold them like berserkers raging facing the death that encircled them round death's bitter pangs by their vengeance assuaging marking their tracks by their dead on the ground comrades our children shall yet tell their story custer's last charge on the old sitting bull and ages shall swear that the cup of his glory needed but that death to render it full frederick whittaker custer june twenty five eighteen seventy six what shall that sudden blade leap out no more no more thy hand be laid upon the sword hilt smiting sore oh for another such the charger's rein to clutch one equal voice to summon victory sounding thy battle cry brave darling of the soldier's choice would there were one more voice o gallant charge too bold o fierce imperious greed to pierce the clouds that in their darkness hold slaughter of man and steed now stark and cold among thy fallen braves thou liest and even with thy blood defiest the wolfish foe but ah thou liest low and all our birthday song is hushed indeed young lion of the plain thou of the tawny mane hotly the soldiers hearts shall beat their mouths thy death repeat their vengeance seek the trail again where thy red doomsmen be but on the charge no more shall stream thy hair no more thy sabre gleam no more ring out thy battle shout thy cry of victory not when a hero falls the sound a world appalls for while we plant his cross there is a glory even in the loss but when some craven heart from honor dares to part then then the groan the blanching cheek and men in whispers speak nor kith nor country dare reclaim from the black depths his name thou wild young warrior rest by all the prairie winds caressed swift was thy dying pang even as the war cry rang thy deathless spirit mounted high and sought columbia's sky there to the northward far shines a new star and from it blazes down the light of thy renown Edmund Clarence Stedman, July 10, 1876 The Indians were led by rain in the face. The year before, he had been arrested by Captain Tom Custer at Standing Rock, and had threatened to eat the latter's heart. The captain was among the killed, and rain in the face is said to have made good his threat. Mr. Longfellow is mistaken in saying, the colonel george custer was thus mutilated his body was not disfigured in any way the revenge of rain in the face june twenty five eighteen seventy six in that desolate land and lone where the big horn and yellow stone 
roar down their mountain path by their fires the sioux chiefs muttered their woes and griefs and the menace of their wrath revenge cried rain in the face revenge upon all the race of the white chief with yellow hair and the mountains dark and high from their crags re-echoed the cry of his anger and despair in the meadow spreading wide by woodland and riverside the indian village stood all was silent as a dream save the rushing of the stream and the blue jay in the wood in his war paint and his beads like a bison among the reeds in ambush the sitting bull lay with three thousand braves crouched in the clefts and caves savage unmerciful into the fatal snare the white chief with yellow hair and his three hundred men dashed headlong sword in hand but of that gallant band not one returned again the sudden darkness of death overwhelmed them like the breath and smoke of a furnace fire by the river's bank and between the rocks of the ravine they lay in their bloody attire but the foemen fled in the night and rain in the face in his flight uplifted high in air as a ghastly trophy bore the brave heart that beat no more of the white chief with yellow hair whose was the right and the wrong sing it o funeral song with a voice that is full of tears and say that our broken faith wrought all this ruin and scathe in the year of a hundred years henry wadsworth longfellow one survivor there was and only one comanche the horse ridden by captain miles keogh he was found several miles from the battlefield and had been wounded seven times by order of the secretary of war a soldier was detailed to take care of him as long as he lived and no one was ever afterwards permitted to ride him miles keogh's horse on the bluff of the little big horn at the close of a woeful day custer and his three hundred in death and silence lay three hundred to three thousand they had bravely fought and bled for such is the will of congress when the white man meets the red the white men are ten millions the thriftiest under the sun the reds are fifty thousand and warriors every one so custer and all his fighting men lay under the evening skies staring up at the tranquil heaven with wide accusing eyes and of all that stood at noonday in that fiery scorpion ring miles keogh's horse at evening was the only living thing alone from that field of slaughter where lay the three hundred slain the horse comanche wandered with keogh's blood on his mane and sturgis issued this order which future times shall read while the love and honor of comrades are the soul of the soldier's creed he said let the horse comanche henceforth till he shall die be kindly cherished and cared for by the seventh cavalry he shall do no labor he never shall know the touch of spur or rein nor shall his back be ever crossed by living rider again and at regimental formation of the seventh cavalry comanche draped in mourning and led by a trooper of company one shall parade with the regiment thus it was commanded and thus done by order of general sturgis signed by adjutant garlington even as the sword of custer in his disastrous fall flashed out a blaze that charmed the world and glorified his pall 
this order issued amid the gloom that shrouds our army's name when all foul beasts are free to rend and tear its honest fame shall prove to a callous people that the sense of a soldier's worth that the love of comrades the honor of arms have not yet perished from earth john hay the government rushed a large force to the scene and finally after painful fighting and toilsome marches stretching over many months the indians were brought to terms rain in the face afterwards professed himself a man of peace and in eighteen eighty six tried to enter hampton institute he was killed during the sioux outbreak in eighteen ninety on the big horn eighteen eighty six the years are but half a score and the war whoop sounds no more with the blast of bugles where straight into a slaughter pen with his doomed three hundred men rode the chief with the yellow hair o oh, hampton down by the sea what voice is beseeching thee for the scholar's lowliest place can this be the voice of him who fought on the big horn's rim can this be rain in the face his war paint is washed away his hands have forgotten to slay he seeks for himself and his race the arts of peace and the lore they give to the skilled hand more than the spoils of war and chase o chief of the christ-like school can the zeal of thy heart grow cool when the victor scarred with fight like a child for thy guidance craves and the faces of hunters and braves are turning to thee for light the hatchet lies overgrown with grass by the yellow stone wind river and paw of bear and in sign that foes are friends each lodge like a peace pipe sends its smoke in the quiet air the hands that have done the wrong to right the wrong it are strong and the voice of a nation saith enough of the war of swords enough of the lying words and shame of a broken faith the hills that have watched afar the valleys ablaze with war shall look on the tasseled corn and the dust of the grinded grain instead of the blood of the slain shall sprinkle thy banks big horn the oot and the wandering crow shall know as the white men know and fair as the white men fair the pale and the red shall be brothers one's rights shall be as another's home school and house of prayer o mountains that climb to snow o river winding below through meadows by war once trod o wild waste lands that await the harvest exceeding great break forth into praise of god john greenleaf whittier in 1886 another somewhat serious uprising took place among the apaches a band of hostiles taking the warpath under the chief geronimo general nelson a miles after a long pursuit succeeded in capturing them the gray horse troop all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me nothing to see but the sky and the plain nothing to see but the driving rain nothing to see but the painted sioux galloping galloping whoop whirroo the devil in yellow is down in the mud says larry to barry i'm losing blood cheers for the greys yells barry second dragoons groans larry hurrah hurrah for egan's gray troop whoop ye devils you've got to whoop cheer for the troopers who die says i cheer for the troop that never shall die all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me flat on our bellies and pourin' in lead seven rounds left and the horse is dead 
Barry a cursin at every breath, Larry beside him, as white as death. Indians galloping, galloping by, Wheelin' and squealin' like hawks in the sky. Cheers for the greys, yells Barry. Second dragoons, groans Larry. Hurrah, hurrah, for Egan's grey troop. Whoop, ye devils, ye've got to whoop cheer for the troopers who die says i cheer for the troop that never shall die all alone on the hillside larry and barry and me two of us livin and one of us dead shot in the head and god how he bled larry's done up says barry to me divvy his cartridges quick gimme three while nearer and nearer and plainer in view Gallop and gallop the murderin' Sioux. Cheers for the greys, yells Barry. Cheer! And he falls on Larry. Alas, alas, for Egan's great troop, the Red Sioux hovering stoop to swoop. Two out of three lay dead, while I cheered for the troop that never shall die. All alone on the hillside, larry and barry and me and i fired and yelled till i lost my head cheerin the livin cheerin the dead swingin my cap i cheered until i stumbled and fell then over the hill there floated a trumpeter's silvery call and egan's great troop galloped up that's all drink to the greys and barry second dragoons and larry Here's a bumper to Egan's great troop, let the crepe on the guidance droop. Drink to the troopers who die while I drink to the troop that never shall die. Robert W. Chambers Geronimo was sent to Fort Pickens, Florida, where he was kept in captivity for the remainder of his life. Geronimo Beside that tent and under guard, in majesty alone he stands, as some chained eagle, broken-winged, with eyes that gleam like smoldering brands, a savage face, streaked o'er with paint, and coal-black hair and unkempt mane, thin, cruel lips set rigidly, a red Apache Tamerlane. As restless as the desert winds, Yet here he stands like carven stone, his raven locks by breezes moved, and backward o'er his shoulders blown, silent yet watchful as he waits, robed in his strange barbaric guise, while here and there go searchingly the cat-like wanderings of his eyes. The eagle feather on his head is dull with many a bloody stain, while darkly on his lowering brow forever rests the mark of Cain. Have you but seen a tiger caged and sullen through his barrier's glare? Mark well his human prototype, the fierce Apache fettered there. Ernest McGaffey In 1889, the territory known as Oklahoma was opened to settlement, and again the Indians saw their hunting grounds invaded by the white man, while they themselves were compelled to remove to a new reservation. Sitting Bull again advised resistance, and was killed while trying to escape arrest. A squaw of the tribe, made desperate by the removal, killed her baby and committed suicide. THE LAST RESERVATION Sullen and dark, in the September day, on the bank of the river, they waited the boat that would bear them away from their poor homes forever. For progress strides on, and the order had gone to these wards of the nation. Give us land and more room, was the cry, and move on to the next reservation. With her babe, she looked back at the home neath the trees. From which they were driven, where the smoke of the last camp fire, borne on the breeze, rose slowly toward heaven. 
behind her fair fields and the forest and glade the home of her nation around her the gleam of the bayonet and blade of civilization clasping close to her bosom the small dusky form with tender caressing she bent down on the cheek of her babe soft and warm a mother's kiss pressing there's a splash in the river the column moves on close guarded and narrow with hardly more note of the two that are gone than the fall of a sparrow only an indian wretched obscure to refinement a stranger and a babe that was born in a wigwam as poor and rude as a manger moved on to make room for the growth in the west of a brave christian nation moved on and thank god forever at rest in the last reservation walter learned that was the last of the indian outbreaks although there are still more than two hundred thousand indians in the united states by far the greater part of them have adopted the dress and customs of the white man and are engaged in peaceful occupations the remainder are content to live in idleness upon the government's bounty indian names ye say they all have passed away that noble race and brave that their light canoes have vanished from off the crested wave that mid the forests where they roamed there rings no hunter's shout but their name is on your waters ye may not wash it out tis where ontario's billow like ocean's surge is curled where strong niagara's thunders wake the echo of the world where red missouri bringeth rich tribute from the west and rappahannock sweetly sleeps on green virginia's breast ye say their cone-like cabins that clustered o'er the vale have fled away like withered leaves before the autumn's gale but their memory liveth on your hills their baptism on your shore your everlasting rivers speak their dialect of yore old massachusetts wears it within her lordly crown and broad ohio bears it mid all her young renown connecticut hath wreathed it where her quiet foliage waves and bold kentucky breathes it hoarse through all her ancient caves wachusett hides its lingering voice within his rocky heart and allegheny graves its tone throughout his lofty chart monadonic on his forehead hoar doth seal the sacred trust your mountains build their monument though ye destroy their dust lydia huntley sigourney end of section three recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter 4, Part 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Chapter 4, Part 1. Chapter 4. The Second Assassination On the fourth day of March, 1881, James Abram Garfield, Republican, was inaugurated President of the United States. He had served with distinction in the Civil War and afterwards in Congress, and seemed destined to enjoy a peaceful and prosperous administration. But on July the 1st he was shot down at Washington by Charles J. Guiteau, a half-crazed, disappointed office-seeker. The President fought manfully for life, but blood poisoning developed and death followed on September 19th. Rejoice! 
Bear me out of the battle, for, lo, I am sorely wounded. From out my deep, wide-bosomed west, where unnamed heroes hew the way, for worlds to follow, with stern zest, where gnarled old maples make a ray deep scarred from red men gone to rest, where pipes the quail, where squirrels play through tossing trees with nuts for toy, a boy steps forth, clear-eyed and tall, a bashful boy, a soulful boy, yet comely as the sons of Saul, a boy all friendless, poor, unknown, yet heir apparent to a throne. Lo, freedom's bleeding sacrifice! So like some tall oak tempest-blown beside the storied stream he lies now at the last, pale-browed and prone. A nation kneels with streaming eyes, a nation supplicates the throne, a nation holds him by the hand, a nation sobs aloud at this, the only dry eyes in the land now at the last, I think, are his. Why? We should pray, God knoweth best, that this grand, patient soul should rest. The world is round, the wheel has run full circle. Now behold a grave beneath the old love trees is done. The druid oak slipped up and wave a solemn welcome back. The brave old maples murmur, every one, receive him, earth. In center land, as in the center of each heart, as in the hollow of God's hand, the coffin sinks. And with it part all party hates. Now, not in vain, he bore his peril and hard pain. Therefore, I say, rejoice. I say the lesson of his life was much, this boy that won as in a day the world's heart utterly, a touch of tenderness and tears, the page of history grows rich from such. His name the nation's heritage, but oh, as some sweet angel's voice spake this brave death that touched us all. Therefore, I say, rejoice, rejoice, run high the flags, put by the pall. Lo, all is for the best, for all. Joaquin Miller The Bells at Midnight, September 19th, 1881 In their dark house of cloud the three weird sisters toil till time be sped. One unwinds life, one ever weaves the shroud, one waits to part the thread. Clotho How long, O sister, how long ere the weary task is done? How long, O oh sister, how long shall the fragile thread be spun? Lachesis, tis mercy that stays her hand, else she had cut the thread. She is a woman, too, like her who kneels by his bed. Atropos, patience, the end is come, he shall no more endure. See with a single touch, my hand is swift and sure. Two angels pausing in their flight. First angel, listen. What was it fell an instant ago on my ear? A sound like the throb of a bell from yonder darkling sphere. Second angel, the planet where mortals dwell. I hear it not. Yes, I hear. How it deepens, a sound of dole. Listen, it is the knell of a passing soul, the midnight lamentation of some stricken nation for a chieftain's soul. It has just begun, the many-throated moan. Now the clangor swells as if a million bells had blent their tones in one. Accents of despair are these to mortal ear, but all this wild funereal music blown and sifted through celestial air turns to triumphant peons here. Wave upon wave the silvery anthems flow, wave upon wave the deep vibrations roll from that dim sphere below. Come, let us go, surely some chieftain's soul. Thomas Bailey Aldrich J. A. G. Our sorrow sends its shadow round the earth, so brave, so true, a hero from his birth. The plumes of empire molt in mourning draped, the lightning's message by our tears is shaped. Life's vanities that blossom for an hour heap on his funeral car their fleeting flower. Commerce forsakes her temples, blind and dim and pours her tardy gold to homage him. 
the notes of grief to age familiar grow before the sad privations all must know but the majestic cadence which we hear to-day is new in either hemisphere what crown is this high hung and hard to reach whose glory so outshines our laboring speech the crown of honor pure and unbetrayed he wins the spurs who bears the knightly aid while royal babes incipient empire hold and for bare promise grasp the sceptre's gold this man such service to his age did bring that they who knew him servant hailed him king in poverty his infant couch was spread his tender hands soon wrought for daily bread but from the cradles bound his willing feet the errand of the moment went to meet when learning's page unfolded to his view the quick disciple straight a teacher grew and when the fight of freedom stirred the land armed was his heart and resolute his hand wise in the council stalwart in the field such rank supreme a workman's hut may yield his onward steps like measured marbles show climbing the height where god's great flame doth glow ah rose of joy that hits to thorn so sharp ah golden woof that meets to severed warp ah solemn comfort that the stars rain down the hero's garland his the martyr's crown julia ward howe midnight september nineteenth eighteen eighty one once in a lifetime we may see the veil tremble and lift that hides symbolic things the spirit's vision when the senses fail sweeps the weird meaning that the outlook brings deep in the midst of turmoil it may be a crowded street a forum or a field the soul inverts the telescope to see today's events in futures years revealed back from the present let us look at rome behold what cato meant what brutus said hark the athenians welcome simon home how clear they are those glimpses of the dead but we hard toilers we who plan and weave through common days the web of common life what word alas shall teach us to receive the mystic meaning of our peace and strife whence comes our symbol surely god must speak no less than he can make us heed or pause self-seekers we too busy or too weak to search beyond our daily lives and laws from things occult our earth-turned eyes rebel no sound of destiny can reach our ears we have no time for dreaming hark a knell a knell at midnight all the nation hears a second grievous throb the dreamers wake, the merchant soul forgets his goods and ships, the weary workmen from their slumbers break, the women raise their eyes with quivering lips, the miner rests upon his pick to hear, the printer's type stops midway from the case, the solemn sound has reached the roisterer's ear and brought the shame and sorrow to his face. Again it booms, O mystic veil upraise, behold, tis lifted. On the darkness drawn a picture lined with light. The people's gaze from sea to sea beholds it till the dawn. A deathbed scene. A sinking sufferer lies. Their chosen ruler crowned with love and pride. Around his counselors with streaming eyes. His wife heartbroken kneeling by his side. Death shadow holds her. It will pass too soon. She weeps in silence, bitterest of tears. He wanders softly, nature's kindest boon, and as he murmurs all the country hears. For him the pain is past, the struggle ends, his cares and honors fade, his younger life in peaceful mentor comes with dear old friends, his mother's arms take home his dear young wife. He stands among the students, tall and strong, and teaches truths republican and grand. He moves ah pitiful he sweeps along o'er fields of carnage leading his command he speaks to crowded faces round him surge thousands and millions of excited men he hears them cheer sees some vast light emerge is borne as on a tempest then ah then the fancies fade the fever's work is past a deepening pang then recollections thrill he feels the faithful lips that kiss their last. His heart beats once in answer and is still. 
the curtain falls, but hushed, as if afraid. The people wait, tear-stained, with heaving breast. Twill rise again, they know, when he is laid with freedom, in the capital, at rest. John Boyle O'Reilly For two days, September 22nd and 23rd, the body lay in state in the rotunda of the capital. Then, in a long train crowded with the most illustrious of his countrymen, the dead president was born to Cleveland, Ohio, and buried on September 26th in a beautiful cemetery overlooking the waters of Lake Erie. At the President's Grave All summer long the people knelt and listened at the sick man's door. Each pang which that pale sufferer felt throbbed through the land from shore to shore. And as the all-dreaded hour drew nigh, what breathless watching! night and day what tears what prayers great god on high have we forgotten how to pray o broken-hearted widowed one forgive us if we press too near dead is our husband father son for we are all one household here and not alone here by the sea and not in his own land alone are tears of anguish shed with thee in this one loss the world is one Epitaph, a man not perfect, but of heart so high, of such heroic rage that even his hopes became a part of earth's eternal heritage. Richard Watson Gilder The public rage against the assassin knew no bounds. Only by the utmost vigilance was his life saved from the attacks upon it. He was brought to trial and found guilty of murder in January 1882, and was executed June 30th. ON THE DEATH OF PRESIDENT GARFIELD Fallen with autumn's falling leaf, ere yet his summer's noon was past, Our friend, our guide, our trusted chief, What words can match a woe so vast? And who's the chartered claim to speak the sacred grief where all have part, Where sorrow saddens every cheek and broods in every aching heart? Yet nature prompts the burning phrase that thrills the hushed and shrouded hall, the loud lament, the sorrowing praise, the silent tear that love lets fall. In loftiest verse, in lowliest rhyme, shall strive unblamed the minstrel choir, the singers of the newborn time, and trembling age without worn lyre. No room for pride, no place for blame, we fling our blossoms on the grave, pale, scentless, faded, all we claim, this only, what we had, we gave. Ah, could the grief of all who mourn Blend in one voice its bitterest cry, The wail to heaven's high arches borne Would echo through the cavern sky. O happiest land whose peaceful choice Fills with a breath its empty throne, God, speaking through thy people's voice, Has made that voice for once his own. No angry passion shakes the state Whose weary servant sinks for rest, and who could fear that scowling hate would strike at that unguarded breast? He stands, unconscious of his doom in manly strength, erect, serene. Around him summer spreads her bloom. He falls. What horror clothes the scene? How swift the sudden flash of woe where all was bright as childhood's dream, as if from heaven's ethereal bow had leaped the lightning's arrowy gleam. Blot the foul deed from history's page. Let not the all-betraying sun blush for the day that stains an age when murder's blackest wreath was won. Pale on his couch the sufferer lies, the weary battleground of pain. Love tends his pillow. Science tries her every art, alas, in vain. The strife endures. How long? How long? Life! Death seemed balanced in the scale, while round his bed a viewless throng await each morrow's changing tale. In realms the desert ocean parts, what myriads watch with tear-filled eyes, his pulse beats echoing in their hearts, his breathings counted with their sighs. Slowly the stores of life are spent, yet hope still battles with despair. Will heaven not yield when knees are bent? Answer, O thou who hearest prayer! But silent is the brazen sky. On sweeps the meteor's threatening train, Unswerving nature's mute reply, Bound in her adamantine chain. Not ours the verdict to decide Whom death shall claim or skill shall save. 
the hero's life though heaven denied it gave our land a martyr's grave nor count the teaching vainly sent how human hearts their griefs may share the lesson woman's love is lent what hope may do what faith can bear farewell the leaf-strown earth enfolds our stay our pride our hopes our fears and autumn's golden sun beholds a nation bowed a world in tears oliver wendell holmes president garfield Eveni dal martirio a questa pace paradiso fifteen one forty eight these words the poet heard in paradise uttered by one who bravely dying here in the true faith was living in that sphere where the celestial cross of sacrifice spread its protecting arms athwart the skies and set thereon like jewels crystal clear the souls magnanimous that knew not fear flashed their effulgence on his dazzled eyes ah me how dark the discipline of pain were not the suffering followed by the sense of infinite rest and infinite release this is our consolation and again a great soul cries to us in our suspense i came from martyrdom unto this peace henry wadsworth longfellow the hundredth anniversary of the surrender of the british at yorktown was celebrated on october nineteenth eighteen eighty one the lyric for the occasion was written by paul hamilton haney yorktown centennial lyric october nineteenth eighteen eighty one hark Hark down the centuries long reaching slope to those transports of triumph, those raptures of hope, the voices of main and of mountain combined in glad resonance borne on the wings of the wind, the bass of the drum and the trumpet that thrills through the multiplied echoes of jubilant hills. And mark how the years, melting upward like mist, which the breath of some splendid enchantment has kissed, reveal on the ocean reveal on the shore the proud pageant of conquest that graced them of yore when blended forever in love as in fame see the standard which stole from the starlight its flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france o oh, stubborn the strife ere the conflict was won and the wild whirling war rack half stifled the sun the thunders of cannon that boomed on the lee, but re-echoed far thunders pealed up from the sea, where guarding his sea-lists a night on the waves, bold de Grasse kept at bay the bluff bulldogs of graves. The day turned to darkness, the night changed to fire, still more fierce waxed the combat, more deadly the ire undimmed by the gloom, in majestic advance. O oh, behold where they ride o'er the red battle-tide, those banners united in love as in fame the brave standard which drew from the star-beams their flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france no respite no pause by the york's tortured flood the grim lion of england is writhing in blood cornwallis may chafe and coarse tarleton aver as he sharpens his broadsword and buckles his spur this blade which so often has reaped rebels like grain shall now harvest for death the rude yeoman again vain boast for ere sunset he's flying in fear with the rebels he scouted close close in his rear while the french on his flank hurl such volleys of shot that even gloucester's redoubt must be growing too hot thus wedded in love as united in fame lo the standard which stole from the starlight its flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france o morning superb when the siege reached its close see the sundawn out bloom like the alchemist rose the last wreaths of smoke from dim trenches upcurled are transformed to a glory that smiles on the world joy joy save the wan wasted front of the foe with his battle flags furled and his arms trailing low respect for the brave in stern silence they yield and in silence they pass with bowed heads from the field then triumph transcendent so tightened of tone that some vowed it must startle king george on his throne when peace to her own timed the pulse of the land and the war weapon sank from the war wearied hand young freedom upborne to the height of the goal she had yearned for so long with deep travail of soul 
a song of her future raised thrilling and clear till the woods leaned to hearken the hill slopes to hear yet fraught with all magical grandeurs that gleam on the hero's high hope or the patriot's dream what future though bright in cold shadow so cast the proud beauty that halos the brow of the past o wedded in love as united in fame see the standard which stole from the starlight its flame and type of all chivalry glory romance the lilies the luminous lilies of france paul hamilton haney on may twenty fourth eighteen eighty three the great bridge spanning the east river and connecting brooklyn with new york city was open to the public having been thirteen years in process of construction the brooklyn bridge may twenty fourth eighteen eighty three a granite cliff on either shore a highway poised in air above the wheels of traffic roar below the fleets sail fair and in and out forevermore the surging tides of ocean pour and past the towers the white gulls soar and winds the sea clouds bear o oh, peerless this majestic street this road that leaps the brine upon its heights twin cities meet and throng its grand incline to east to west with swiftest feet though ice may crash and billows beat though blinding fogs the waves may greet or golden summer shine sail up the bay with morning's beam or rocky hellgate by its columns rise its cables gleam great tents athwart the sky and lone it looms august supreme when with the splendor of a dream its blazing cressets gild the stream till evening shadows fly by nile stand proud the pyramids but they were for the dead the awful gloom that joy forbids the mourners silent tread the crypt the coffin stony lids sad is a soul the maze that threads of dark amenti ere it rids its way of judgment dread this glorious arch these climbing towers are all for life and cheer part of the new world's nobler dowers hint of millennial year that comes apace though evil lowers when loftier aims and larger powers will mould and deck this earth of ours and heaven at length bring near unmoved its cliff shall crown the shore its arch the chasm dare its network hang the blue before as gossamer in air while in and out forevermore the surging tides of ocean pour and past its towers the white gulls soar and winds the sea clouds bear edna dean proctor brooklyn bridge no lifeless thing of iron and stone but sentient as her children are Nature accepts you for her own, kin to the cataract and the star. She marks your vast, sufficing plan, cable and girder, bolt and rod, and takes you from the hand of man for some new handiwork of God. You thrill through all your cords of steel, responsive to the living sun, and quickening in your nerves you feel life with its conscious currents run. Your anchorage upbears the march of time and the eternal powers. The sky admits your perfect arch. The rock respects your stable towers. Charles G. D. Roberts The first week in September, 1886, a destructive earthquake shook the eastern portion of the United States, Charleston, South Carolina, suffering a tremendous shock which snuffed out scores of lives and rendered seven-eighths of the houses unfit for habitation. Charleston, 1886. Is this the price of beauty? Fairest thou of all the cities of the sunrise sea, yet thrice thou art stricken. First war harried thee, then the dread circling tempest drove its plough right through thy palaces, and now, oh now, a sound of terror and thy children flee into the night and death. O oh, deity! Thou god of war and whirlwind, whose dark brow frowning makes tremble sea and solid land, these are thy creatures who to heaven cry while hell roars neath them and its portals ope. To thee they call, to thee who bids them die, who hast forgotten to withhold thy hand, for thou, destroyer, art man's only hope. Richard Watson Gilder On September ninth and eleventh, 1886 
the American yacht Mayflower defeated the English yacht Galatea in the international races for the America's Cup. Mayflower Thunder our thanks to her, guns, hearts, and lips. Cheer from the ranks to her, shout from the banks to her, Mayflower, foremost and best of our ships. Mayflower Twice in the national story thy dear name in letters of gold, woven in texture that never grows old, winning a home and winning glory, sailing the years to us welcome for a, cherished for centuries dearest to-day. Every heart throbs for her, every flag dips, Mayflower, first and last, best of our ships. White as a seagull she swept the long passage, true as the homing bird flies with its message. Love her? Oh, richer than silk every sail of her. Trust her? More precious than gold every nail of her. Write we down faithfully every man's part in her, greet we all gratefully every true heart in her. More than a name to us, sailing the fleetest symbol of that which is purest and sweetest. More than a keel to us, steering the straightest, emblem of that which is freest and greatest. More than a dove bosom sail to the windward, flame passing on while night clouds fly hindward. Kiss every plank of her, none shall take rank of her, frontward or weatherward none can eclipse. Thunder our thanks to her, cheer from the banks to her, Mayflower, foremost and best of our ships. John Boyle O'Reilly On October 28, 1886, Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty Enlightening the World, a gift to America from the people of France, was unveiled on Bedloe's Island in New York Harbor. Fairest of Freedom's Daughters Read at the dedication of the Bartholdi Statue, New York Harbor, October 28, 1886. Night's diadem around thy head, the world upon thee gazing, beneath the eye of heroes dead thy queenly form upraising. Lift up, lift up thy torch on high, fairest of freedom's daughters, flash it across thine own blue sky, flash it across the waters. Stretch up to thine own woman's height thine eye lit with truth's luster, as though from God himself a light, earth's hopes around thee cluster. The stars touch with thy forehead fair, at them thy torch was lighted, they grope to find where truth's ways are, the nations long benighted. Thou hast the van in earth's proud march, to thee all nations turning, thy torch against thine own blue arch, in answer to their yearning. Show them the pathway thou hast trod, the chains which thou hast broken. Teach them thy trust in man and God, the watchwords thou hast spoken. Not here is heard the Alp herd's horn, the mountain stillness breaking, nor do we catch the roseate morn, the alpine summits waking. Is Necker's vale no longer fair that German hearts are leaving? Ah, German hearts from hearthstones tear in thy proud star, believing. Has Rhineland lost her grapes' perfume, her waters green and golden? And do her castles no more bloom, with legends rare and olden? Why leave strong men the fatherland? Why cross the cold blue ocean? Truce torch in thine uplifted hand, ha, kindles their devotion. God, home, and country be thy care, thou queen of all the ages. Belting the earth is this one prayer, unspotted be thy pages. Lift up, lift up thy torch on high, fairest of freedom's daughters. Flash it against thine own blue sky, flash it against the waters. Jeremiah Eames Rankin Liberty Enlightening the World Warden at ocean's gate, thy feet on sea and shore, Like one the skies await when time shall be no more. What splendors crown thy brow? What bright dread angel thou dazzling the waves before thy station great? My name is Liberty. From out a mighty land I face the ancient sea. I lift to God my hand. By day in heaven's light, a pillar of fire by night. At ocean's gate I stand nor bend the knee. The dark earth lay in sleep, her children crouched forlorn. Ere on the western steep I sprang to height, reborn. Then what a joyous shout the quickened lands gave out, and all the choir of morn sang anthems deep. 
Beneath yon firmament the new world to the old my sword and summons sent, my azure flag unrolled. The old world's hands renew their strength, the form ye view came from a living mould and glory blent. O ye whose broken spars tell of the storms ye met, enter, fear not the bars across your pathway set, enter at freedom's porch, for you I lift my torch, for you my coronet is rayed with stars, but ye that hither draw to desecrate my fee, nor yet have held in awe the justice that makes free, avaunt ye darkling brood, by right my house has stood, my name is liberty. My throne is law. O wonderful and bright, immortal freedom, hail! Front in thy fiery might the midnight and the gale. Undaunted on this base, guard well thy dwelling place. Till the last sun grow pale, let there be light. Edmund Clarence Stedman The Bartholdi Statue, 1886 The land that from the rule of kings in freeing us itself made free, our old world sister to us brings her sculptured dream of liberty. Unlike the shapes on Egypt's sands, uplifted by the toil-worn slave, on freedom's soil, with free men's hands, we rear the symbol free hands gave. O France the beautiful, to thee once more a debt of love we owe. In peace beneath thy colors three we hail a later Rochambeau. Rise, stately symbol, Holding forth thy light and hope to all who sit in chains and darkness. Belt the earth with watchfires from thy torch uplit. Reveal the primal mandate still, which chaos heard and ceased to be. Trace on mid-air the eternal will and signs of fire. Let man be free. Shine far, shine free, a guiding light to reason's ways and virtue's aim. A lightning flash, the wretch to smite who shields his license with thy name. John Greenleaf Whittier End of Chapter 4, Part 1 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion Recording by Philip Gould Chapter 4, Part 2 of Poems of American History, Volume 5 the period of expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Philip Gould. Poems of American History, Volume 5. The period of expansion by various. Chapter 4, Part 2. On September 18, 1887, the one hundredth anniversary of the adoption of the Constitution of the United States was suitably observed at Philadelphia. President Grover Cleveland, Justice Samuel Freeman Miller, and John Adams Casson delivered addresses, and the new Hail Columbia was sung by a chorus of two thousand voices. Additional Verses to Hail Columbia Written at the request of the Committee for the Constitutional Centennial Celebration at Philadelphia, 1887. Look our ransom shores around. Peace and safety we have found. Welcome, friends, who once were foes. Welcome, friends, who once were foes, to all the conquering years have gained. A nation's rights, a race unchained. Children of the day newborn, mindful of its glorious morn. Let the pledge our fathers signed heart to heart forever bind. While the stars of heaven shall burn, while the ocean tides return, ever may the circling sun find the many still are one. Graven deep with edge of steel, crowned with victory's crimson seal, all the world their name shall read. All the world their name shall read, enrolled with his, the chief that led the hosts, whose blood for us was shed. Pay our sires their children's debt, love and honor, nor forget only Union's golden key guards the ark of liberty. While the stars of heaven shall burn, while the ocean tides return, ever may the circling sun find the many still are one. Hail Columbia, strong and free, throned in hearts from sea to sea, thy march triumphant still pursue. 
thy march triumphant still pursue with peaceful stride from zone to zone till freedom finds the world her own blessed in union's holy ties let our grateful song arise every voice its tribute lend all in loving chorus blend while the stars in heaven shall burn while the ocean tides return ever shall the circling sun find the many still are one oliver wendell holmes following this came the recital by james edward murdoch of the new national hymn the marine band leading the people and the singers in the chorus new national hymn hail freedom thy bright crest and gleaming shield thrice blessed mirror the glories of a world thine own hail heaven-born peace our sight led by thy gentle light shows us the paths with deathless flowers strown peace daughter of a strife sublime abide with us till strife be lost in endless time chorus thy sun is risen and shall not set upon thy day divine ages of unborn ages yet america are thine her one hand seals with gold the portals of night's fold her other the broad gates of dawn unbars or silent waste of snows crowning her lofty brows gleams high her diadem of northern stars while clothed in garlands of warm flowers round freedom's feet the south her wealth of beauty showers sweet is the toil of peace sweet is the years increase to loyal men who live by freedom's laws and in war's fierce alarms god gives stout hearts and arms to freemen sworn to save a rightful cause fear none trust god maintain the right and triumph in unbroken union's might welded in war's fierce flame forged on the hearth of fame the sacred constitution was ordained tried in the fire of time tempered in woes sublime an age was passed and left it yet unstained god grant its glory still may shine while ages fade forgotten in time's slow decline honor the few who shared freedom's first fight and dared to face war's desperate tide at the full flood who fell on hard-won ground and into freedom's womb poured the sweet balsam of their brave hearts blood they fell but o'er that glorious grave floats free the banner of the cause they died to save in radiance heavenly fair floats on the peaceful air that flag that never stooped from victory's pride those stars that softly gleam those stripes that o'er us stream in war's grand agony were sanctified a holy standard pure and free to light the home of peace or blaze in victory father whose mighty power shields us through life's short hour to thee we pray bless us and keep us free all that is past forgive teach us henceforth to live that through our country we may honor thee and when this mortal life shall cease take thou at last our souls to thine eternal peace francis marion crawford on march fifteenth eighteen eighty nine a destructive hurricane visited the samoan islands there were in the harbor of appia at the time one english three german and three american warships sent there to safeguard the interest of their respective countries the english ship the calliope succeeded in steaming out of the harbor the crew of the american flagship trenton cheering her as she passed the trenton was wrecked a few minutes later as were the five other ships in the harbor in Appia Bay. Morituri vos salutimus. Ruin and death held sway that night in Appia Bay, and smote amid the loud and dreadful gloom. But hearts no longer weep the salt unresting sleep of the great dead, victorious in their doom. Vain, vain the straight retreat that held the fated fleet, trapped in the twofold thread of sea and shore fell reefs on either hand and the devouring strand above below the tempest deafening roar what mortal hand shall write the horror of that night the desperate struggle in that deadly close the yelling of the blast the wild surf white aghast the whelming seas the thunder in the throes 
how the great cables surged the giant engines urged as the brave ships the unequal strife waged on not hope not courage flagged but the vain anchors dragged down on the reefs they shattered and were gone and now were wrought the deeds whereof each soul that reads grows manlier and burns with prouder breath heroic brotherhood the loving bonds of blood proclaim from high hearts face to face with death at length the english ship her cables had let slip crowded all steam and steered for the open sea resolved to challenge fate to pass the perilous strait and wrench from jaws of ruin victory with well-tried metal strained in the storm's teeth she gained foot by slow foot made head and crept toward life across her dubious way the good ship trenton lay helpless but thrilled to watch the splendid strife helmless she lay her bulk a blind and wallowing hulk by her strained hawsers only held from wreck but dauntless each brave heart played his immortal part in strong endurance on the reeling deck they fought fate inch by inch could die but could not flinch and biding the inevitable doom they mark the English ship, baffling the tempest grip, forge hardly forth from the expected tomb. Then with exultant breath these heroes, waiting death, thundered across the storm a peal of cheers, to the triumphant brave, a greeting from the grave, whose echo shall go ringing down the years. To you who well have won, from us whose courses run, glad greeting as we face the undreaded end. The memory of those cheers shall thrill in English ears, where'er this English blood and speech extend. No manlier deed comes down, blazoned in broad renown, from men of old who live to dare and die. The old fire yet survives here in our modern lives of splendid chivalry and valor high. Charles George Douglas Roberts An International Episode March 15, 1889 We were ordered to Samoa from the coast of Panama, and for two long months we sailed the unequal sea, till we made the horseshoe harbor with its curving coral bar, smelt the good green smell of grass and shrub and tree. We had barely room for swinging with the tide. There were many of us crowded in the bay, three Germans and the English ship beside our three and from the Trenton, where she lay, through the sunset calms and after, we could hear the shrill sweet laughter of the children's voices on the shore at play. We all knew a storm was coming, but, dear God, no man could dream of the furious hell horrors of that day. Through the roar of winds and waters we could hear wild voices scream, see the rocking mast reel by us through the spray. In the gale we drove and drifted helplessly, with our rudder gone, our engine fires drowned, and none might hope another hour to see, for all the air was desperate with the sound, of the brave ships rent asunder, of the shrieking souls sucked underneath the waves, where many a good man's grave was found. About noon upon our quarter, from the deeper gloom afar, came the English man-of-war Calliope. We have lost our anchors, comrades, and though small the chances are, we must steer for safety in the open sea. Then we climbed aloft to cheer her as she passed through the tempest and the blackness and the foam. Now God speed you, though the shout should be our last, through the channel where the maddening breakers come. Through the wild sea's hill and hollow, on the path we cannot follow, to your women and your children and your home. O oh, remember it, good brothers, we two people speak one tongue, and your native land was mother to our land. But the head, perhaps, is hasty when the nation's heart is young, and we prate of things we do not understand. But the day when we stood face to face with death, upon whose face few men may look and tell, as long as you could hear or we had breath, four hundred voices cheered you out of hell. By the will of that stern chorus, by the motherland which bore us, judge if we do not love each other well. Carolyn Dewar On May 31st, 1889, western Pennsylvania was visited by one of the worst catastrophes in the history of the country. A flood from a broken reservoir overwhelmed Johnstown, Conemaugh, and a number of smaller towns, destroying over 2,000 lives and property to the value of $10 million. 
by the Conomaw, May 31, 1889. Foreboding sudden of untoward change, a tightening clasp on everything held dear, a moan of waters, wild and strange, a whelming horror near, and midst the thunderous din a voice of dune, Make way for me, O life, for death make room. I come like the whirlwind rude, gainst all thou hast cherished warring. I come like the flaming flood from a crater's mouth outpouring. I come like the avalanche gliding free, and the power that sends thee forth sends me. Where thou hast builded with strength secure, my hand shall spread disaster. Where thou hast barred me with forethought sure, shall ruin flow the faster. I come to gather where thou hast sowed, but I claim of thee nothing thou hast not owed. On my mission of mercy forth I go, where the Lord of being sends me. His will is the only will I know, and my strength is the strength he lends me. Thy loved ones I hide neath my waters dim, but I cannot hide them away from him. Florence Earl Coates the reservoir was known to be weak, and the people below had been warned of the danger yet remained where they were. When, just before the break, engineer John G. Park galloped down the valley, shouting to all to run for their lives, it was too late. The Man Who Rode to Conemaw, May thirty first, 1889 Into the town of Conemaw, striking the people's souls with awe, dashed a rider, aflame and pale never alighting to tell his tale, sitting his big bay horse astride, Run for your lives to the hills, he cried. Run to the hills, was what he said, as he waved his hand and dashed ahead. Run for your lives to the hills, he cried, spurring his horse, whose reeking side was flecked with foam as red as flame. Whither he goes and whence he came, nobody knows. They see his horse, plunging on in his frantic course, veins distended and nostrils wide, fired and frenzied at such a ride. Nobody knows the rider's name, dead forever to earthly fame. Run to the hills, to the hills, he cried, run for your lives to the mountainside. Stop him. He's mad. Just look at him go. Tain't safe, they said, to let him ride so. He thinks he can scare us, said one with a laugh, but Conemaw folks don't swallow no chaff. Tain't nothing, I'll bet, but that same old leak in the dam above the South Fork Creek. Blind to their danger, callous of dread, they laughed as he left them and dashed ahead. Run for your lives to the hills, he cried, lashing his horse in his desperate ride. Down through the valley the rider passed, shouting and spurring his horse on fast, but not so fast did the rider go as the raging roaring, mighty flow of the million feet and the millions more of water whose fury he fled before. On he went, and on it came, the flood itself a very flame of surging, swirling, seething tide, mountain high and torrents wide. God alone might measure the force of the Conemaw flood in its V-shaped course. Behind him were buried under the flood Conemaw town and all who stood jeering there, at the man who cried, Run for your lives, to the mountainside. On he sped in his fierce wild ride, Run to the hills, to the hills, he cried. Nearer, nearer, raged the roar, Horse and rider fled before. Dashing along the valley ridge, They came at last to the railroad bridge. The big horse stood, the rider cried, Run for your lives, to the mountainside, Then plunged across, but not before the mighty, Merciless, mountain roar struck the bridge and swept it away like a bit of straw or a wisp of hay but over and under and through that tide the voice of the unknown rider cried run to the hills to the hills it cried run for your lives to the mountainside john elliot bowen it is said that another hero named daniel periton rode in front of the flood giving warning and was finally caught by it and drowned a Ballad of the Conemaw Flood, May 31, 1889 The windows of heaven were open wide, the storm cloud broke, and the people cried, Will the Conemaw Dam hold out? But the great folks down at Johnstown played, they ate, they drank, they were not afraid, for Conemaw Dam holds Conemaw Lake, by Conemaw Dam their pleasure they take, 
fine catching are Conoma trout. The four-mile lake at the back of its wall is growing to five, and the rain still fall, and the flood by night and by day is burrowing deep through buttress and mound, fresh water spring and spurt from the ground, while God is thundering out of his cloud. The fountain voices are crying aloud, Away to the hills, away! Away to the hills, leave altar and shrine, away to the hills, leave table and wine, away from the trade in your tills. Let the strong man speed with the weakest child, and the mother who just on her babe has smiled be carried, leave only the dead on their biers. No time for the tomb and no time for tears, away, away to the hills. Daniel Periton heard the wail of the waters gathering over the vale. With sorrow for city and field, felt already the mountain quake twixt living and dead. For the brethren's sake, Daniel Periton dared to ride full in front of the threatening tide, and what if the dam do yield? To a man it is given but once to die. Though the flood break forth, he will raise his cry for the thousands there in the town. At least some child may be saved by his voice, some lover may still in the sun rejoice. Some man that is fled when he wins his breath shall bless the rider who rode through death for his fellow's life gave his own. He leapt to his horse that was black as night, he turned not left and he turned not right, down to the valley he dashed. He heard behind him a thunderous boom, the dam had burst and he knew his doom. Fly, fly for your lives, it was all he spoke. Fly, fly for the Konoma dam has broke and the cataract after him crashed. They saw a man with the god in his face, pale from the desperate whirlwind pace, they heard an angel cry. And the steed's black mane was flecked as he flew, and its flanks were red with the spurs red dew into the city and out of the gate. Rider and ridden were racing with fate, wild with one agony. Flash on the news that the dam is burst, and one looked forth, and she knew the worst. My last message, she said. The words at her will flashed on before Periton's call and the torrent's roar, and not in vain had Periton cried. His heart had caught a brave heart to his side, as bold for the saving he sped. The flood came down, and its strong arms took the city, and all together shook tower, and church, and street, like a pack of cards that a player may crush, the houses fell in the whirlpool rush, rose and floated and jammed at the last, then a fierce flame fed by the deluge blast wove them a winding sheet. God have mercy! Was ever a pyre lit like that of the flood's fierce fire? Cattle and men caught fast, prisoners held between life and death, while the flame struck down with its sulphurous breath, and the flood struck up with its strong, cold hand. No hope from the water, no help from the land, and torrent thundering past. Daniel Periton, still he rides, by the heaving flank and the shortening strides, the race must be well nigh won. Away to the hills, but the cataract's bound has caught and has dashed him from saddle to ground, and the man who saw the end of the race saw a dark dead horse, and a pale dead face. Did they hear heaven's great well done? Hardwick Drummond Ronsley In charge of the telegraph office at Johnstown was a Mrs. Ogle. She stayed at her post, sending message after message of warning down the valley until she herself was overwhelmed and swept away. Konoma Fly to the mountain, fly! Terribly rang the cry. The electric soul of the wire quivered like sentient fire. The soul of the woman who stood face to face with the flood answered to the shock like the eternal rock. For she stayed, with her hand on the wire, unafraid, Flashing the wild word down into the lower town. Is there a lower yet, and another? Into the valley she and none other can hurl the warning cry. Fly to the mountain, fly! The water from Konoma has opened its awful jaw. The dam is wide on the mountain side. Fly for your life, oh fly, they said. She lifted her noble head. I can stay at my post and die. Face to face with duty and death, dear is the drawing of human breath. Steady, my hand, hold fast to the trust upon thee cast. Steady, my wire, go, say that death is on the way. Steady, strong wire, go, save, grand is the power you have. 
Grander the soul that can stand behind the trembling hand. Grander the woman who dares, glory her high name wears. This message is my last shot over the wire and passed to the listening ear of the land. The mountain and the strand reverberate the cry. Fly for your lives, O oh fly! I stay at my post and die. The torrent took her. God knows all. Fiercely the savage currents fall to muttering calm. Men count their dead. The June sky smileth overhead. God's will we neither read nor guess. Poor by one more hero less. We bow the head and clasp the hand. Teach us, although we die, to stand. Elizabeth Stuart Phelps Ward on May 1, 1893, the most remarkable exposition ever held in America opened at Chicago to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the discovery of America. The group of exposition buildings soon became known as the White City. The White City Greece was. Greece is no more. Temple and town have crumbled down. Time is the fire that hath consumed them all. Statue and wall in ruin strow the universal floor. Greece lives, but Greece no more. Its ashes breed the undying seed blown westward, Till in Rome's imperial towers Athens reflowers. Still westward, lo, a veiled and virgin shore. Say not Greece is no more. Through the clear morn on light winds borne, her white-winged soul sinks on the new world's breast. Ah, happy west, Greece flowers anew and all her temples soar. One bright hour, then no more, shall to the skies these columns rise. But though art's flower shall fade, again the seed onward shall speed, quickening the land from lake to ocean's roar. Art lives, though Greece may never from the ancient mold, as once of old, exhale to heaven the inimitable bloom. Yet from that tomb, beauty walks forth to light the world forever. Richard Watson Gilder On February 2, 1894, the famous old corvette Kearsarge, which destroyed the Confederate cruiser Alabama off Cherbourg during the Civil War, was wrecked on Roncador Reef in the Caribbean Sea. The Kearsarge, February 2, 1894 In the gloomy ocean bed dwelt a formless thing, and said, in the dim and countless eons long ago, I will build a stronghold high, ocean's power to defy, and the pride of haughty man to lay low. Crept the minutes for the sad, sped the cycles for the glad, but the march of time was neither less nor more. While the formless Adam died, myriad millions by its side, and above them slowly lifted Roncador. Roncador of Caribbee, coral dragon of the sea, ever sleeping with his teeth below the wave. Woe to him who breaks the sleep! Woe to them who sail the deep! Woe to ship and man that fear a shipman's grave! Hither many a galleon old, heavy keeled with guilty gold, fled before the hardy rover smiting sore. But the sleeper silent lay, till the prayer and his prey brought their plunder and their bones to Roncador. Be content, O conqueror, now our bravest ship of war, war and tempest who had often braved before. All her storied prowess past, strikes her glorious flag at last to the formless thing that builded Roncador. James Jeffrey Roche In 1896, Tennessee celebrated the 100th anniversary of her admission to the Union by an exposition held at Nashville. Tennessee, Prize Centennial Ode, June 1, 1896 She is touching the cycle. Her tender tread is soft on the hearts of her hallowed dead, and she proudly stands where her sons have bled for God in Tennessee, where the love of her women set the seal of the warrior's faith for the country's wheel, with hand on the rifle and hand on the wheel, by the altars of Tennessee. They have builded well for the niche of fame, though the sleet of want and the heart of blame, but the courage of heroes tried the flame as they builded Tennessee. 
"'Twas up to the portholes and down in the dust, "'not the weight of might but the force of must, "'with faith and rifle bore free from rust, "'they were building Tennessee. "'Twas up in the saddle and off to the fight, "'where arrow and tomahawk shrieked in the light, "'but the sinews of pioneers won for the right "'the bulwarks of Tennessee. "'She was true when they pressed like a shadowy fate "'her royal foes at her unbarred gate.' and is true when were menaced her rights of state, the mother Tennessee. And she gave of her life for the stars and bars, as she gave of her sons for the earlier wars, and the breast of her motherhood wears the scars for the manhood of Tennessee. But she wrought again in the strength of might, in the face of defeat and a yielded right, the cloth of gold from the loom of night, the mantle of Tennessee. She has given all that she held most dear with a Spartan hope and a Spartan fear, crowned in her statehood volunteer, glorious Tennessee. She has rounded the cycle, the tale is told, the circlet is iron, the clasp is gold, and the leaves of a wonderful past unfold, the garland of Tennessee. And her garments gleam in the sunset years, and the songs of her children fill her ears, and the listening heart of the great world hears the peons of Tennessee. Virginia Fraser Boyle On May 31, 1897, a monument to the memory of Robert Gould Shaw, who fell at the head of his colored regiment during the Civil War, was unveiled on Boston Common. The monument, designed by Augustus San Gaudin, is perhaps the most noteworthy of its kind in America. An Ode on the Unveiling of the Shaw Memorial on Boston Common, May 31, 1897 not with the slow funereal sound come we to this sacred ground not with wailing fife and solemn muffled drum bringing a cypress wreath to lay with bended knee on the cold brows of death not so dear god we come but with the trumpets blare and shot torn battle banners flung to air as for a victory hark to the measured tread of martial feet the music and the murmurs of the street no bugle breathes this day disaster and retreat. Hark how the iron lips of the great battleships salute the city from her azure bay. Time was, time was, ah, unforgotten years, we paid our hero tribute of tears. But now let go all sounds and signs and formulas of woe. Tis life, not death, we celebrate. To life not death we dedicate this storied bronze whereon is wrought the lithe immortal figure of our thought to show forever to men's eyes our children's 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 eyes how once he stood in that heroic mood he and his dusky braves so fain of glorious graves one instant stood and then drave through that cloud of purple steel and flame which wrapped him held him gave him not again but in its trampled ashes left to fame an everlasting name that was indeed to live at one bold swoop to wrest from darkling death the best that death to life can give he fell his roland fell that day at roncevaux with foot upon the ramparts of the foe a peon not a knell for heroes dying so no need for sorrow here, no room for sigh or tear, save such rich tears as happy eyelids know. See where he rides, our knight, within his eyes the light of battle and youth's gold about his brow, our paladin, our soldier of the cross, not weighing gain with loss, world loser that won all obeying duty's call. Not his at perils frown a pulse of quicker beat, nor his to hesitate and parley hold with fate, but proudly to fling down his gauntlet at her feet. O soul of loyal valor and white truth, here by this iron gate, thy serried ranks about thee as of yore, stand thou forevermore in thy undying youth, the tender heart, the eagle eye, O oh, unto him belong the homages of song. Our praises in the praise of coming days to him belong, to him, to him the dead that shall not die. Thomas Bailey Aldrich The years 1897 and 1898 witnessed a great rush of gold seekers to Alaska where placer gold in large quantities had been discovered the year before in the Yukon district on Klondike Creek. 
the Klondike, 1898. Never mind the day we left, or the way the women clung to us. All we need now is the last way they looked at us. Never mind the twelve men there amid the cheering. Twelve men or one man, twill soon be all the same. For this is what we know. We are five men together. Five left of twelve men to find the Golden River. For we came to find it out, but the place was here for all of us. Far, far we came, and here we have the last of us. We that were the front men, we that would be early, we that had the faith and the triumph in our eyes, we that had the wrong road, twelve men together, singing when the devil sang to find the golden river. Say the gleam was not for us, but never say we doubted it. Say the wrong road was right before we followed it. We that were the front men, fit for all forage, say that while we dwindle we are front men still. For this is what we know tonight. We're starving here together, starving on the wrong road to find the golden river. Wrong, we say, but wait a little. Hear him in the corner there. He knows more than we, and he'll tell us if we listen there. He that fought the snow sleep less than all the others, stays a while yet, and he knows where he stays. Foot and hand a frozen clout, brain a freezing feather, still he's here to talk with us and to the golden river. Flow, he says, and flow along, but you cannot flow away from us. All the world's ice will never keep you far from us. Every man that heeds your call takes the way that leads him, the one way that's his way, and lives his own life. Starve or laugh, the game goes on, and on goes the river. Gold or no, they go their way, twelve men together. Twelve, he says, who sold their shame for a lure you call too fair for them, you that laugh and flow to the same word that urges them. Twelve who left the old town shining in the sunset, left the weary street and the small safe days. Twelve who knew but one way out, wide the way or narrow. Twelve who took the frozen chance and laid their lives on yellow. Flow by night and flow by day, nor ever once be seen by them. Flow, freeze and flow, till time shall hide the bones of them. Laugh and wash their names away, leave them all forgotten. Leave the old town to crumble where it sleeps. Leave it there, as they have left it shining in the valley. Leave the town to crumble down and let the women marry. Twelve of us are five, he says. We know the night is on us now. Five while we last, and we may as well be thinking now. Thinking each his own thought, knowing when the light comes. Five left or none left, the game will not be lost. Crouch or sleep, we go the way, the last way, together. Five or none, the game goes on, and on goes the river. For after all that we have done, and all that we have failed to do, life will be life, and the world will have its work to do. Every man who follows us will heed in his own fashion the calling, and the warning, and the friends who do not know. Each will hold an icy knife to punish his heart's lover, and each will go the frozen way to find the golden river. There you hear him, all he says and the last we'll ever get from him. Now he wants to sleep, and that will be the best for him. Let him have his own way. No, you needn't shake him. Your own turn will come, so let the man sleep. For this is what we know. We are stalled here together, hands and feet and hearts of us, to find the golden river. And there's a quicker way than sleep, never mind the looks of him. All he needs now is a finger on the eyes of him. You there, on the left hand, reach a little over. Shut the stars away, or he'll see them all night. He'll see them all night, and he'll see them all tomorrow, crawling down the frozen sky, cold and hard and yellow. Won't you move an inch or two to keep the stars away from him? No, he won't move, and there's no need of asking him. Never mind the twelve men, never mind the women. Three while we last, we'll let them all go, and we'll hold our thoughts north while we starve here together, looking each his own way to find the Golden River. Edwin Arlington Robinson
End of chapter 4, part 2 of Poems of American History, volume 5, The Period of Expansion. Recording by Philip Gould. Section 6 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Chapter 5 the war with spain section one for three centuries and a half spain held possession of the island of cuba although she had lost long before her possessions in north and south america the cubans desired freedom for the spanish yoke was a galling one and as early as eighteen twenty two sympathy with this desire was openly expressed in the united states apostrophe to the island of cuba November, 1822. There is blood on thy desolate shore, thou island of plunder and slaves. Thy billows are purpled with gore, and murder has crimsoned thy waves. The vengeance of nations will come, and wrath shall be rained on thy head, and in terror thy voice shall be dumb, when they ask for their brothers who bled. Thy hand was not stirred when their life-blood was spilt, and therefore that hand must partake in the guilt. Thou art guilty or weak, and the rod should be wrenched from thy palsied hand. By the pirate thy green fields are trod, and his steps have polluted thy land. Unmoved is thy heart and thine eye, when our dear ones are tortured and slain but their blood with a terrible cry calls on vengeance and calls not in vain. If Europe regard not, our land shall awake, and thy walls and thy turrets shall tremble and shake. The voice of a world shall be heard, and thy faith shall be tried by the call, and that terrible voice shall be feared and obeyed, or the proud one shall fall. Enough of our life has been shed in watching and fighting for thee. If thy foot linger still on thy head, the guilt and the vengeance shall be. We have sworn that the spirit of Allen shall lead, and our wrath shall not rest till we finish the deed. James Gates Percival The people of Cuba revolted against their Spanish rulers in 1848 and kept up a guerrilla warfare for some years. In August, 1851, a filibustering expedition, led by Narciso Lopez, sailed from New Orleans. The expedition was captured, and most of its members were executed, among them Lopez himself, and Colonel William L. Crittenden of Kentucky, who, with fifty others, was shot at Havana, August 16th. The Gallant Fifty One who formed part of the Lopez expedition, and were executed by the Spanish authorities in Havana. August 16, 1851 Freedom called them, up they rose, grasped their swords and showered blows, on the head of freedom's foes, and freedom's foes alone. Fate decreed that they should die, pitying angels breathed a sigh, freedom wildly wept on high, for the gallant fifty-one. There they stood in proud array, none for mercy there would pray, none would coward looks betray, all stood forth with fearless eye, showing by their dauntless air what their noble souls could dare, showing to the tyrants there how freedom's sons could die. None there strove their fate to shun, gallant band of fifty-one. Then a voice the stillness broke, t'was their gallant leader spoke, scorning to receive death's stroke, kneeling humbly on the sod, gazing calmly on the dead, whose life-blood had just been shed, proudly then the words he said, Americans kneel but to God. Perish thus Kentucky's son, leader of the fifty-one. Rejoice, sons of Thermopylae, kindred spirits join with thee, who fell in fight for liberty, for freedom's sacred name. 
future days their deeds shall tell how they nobly fought and fell youthful bosoms proudly swell at mention of their fame rays of light from freedom's sun gallant band of fifty one honor's rays will ever shed glory round their hallowed bed though their hearts are cold and dead though their sands of life have run still their names revered will be among the noble and the free glorious sons of liberty gallant band of fifty one henry linden flash spain at last found it necessary to put the whole island under martial law and american sympathy grew more outspoken cuba eighteen seventy is it not is it not that the south wind brings her wail to our shore that the spoilers compass our desolate sister is it not must we say to her strive no more with the lips wherewith we loved her and kissed her with the mocking lips wherewith we said thou art the dearest and fairest to us of all the daughters the sea hath bred of all green girdled eyes that woo us is it not must ye wait must ye wait till they ravage her gardens of orange and palm till her heart is dust till her strength is water must ye see them trample her and be calm as priests when a virgin is led to slaughter shall they smite the marvel of all lands the nation's longing the earth's completeness on her red mouth dripping myrrh her hands filled with fruitage and spice and sweetness must ye wait in the day in the night in the burning day in the dolorous night her sun-brown cheeks are stained with weeping her watch-fires beacon the misty height why are her friends and lovers sleeping ye at whose ear the flatterer bends who were my kindred before all others hath he set your hearts afar my friends hath he made ye alien my brothers day and night hear ye not hear ye not from the hollow sea the sound of her voice the passionate far-off tone which saith alas my brothers alas what choice the lust that shameth the sword that slayeth they bind me they rend my delicate locks they shred the beautiful robes i won me my round limbs bleed on the mountain rocks save me ere they have quite undone me hear ye not hear ye not speak at last speak at last in the might of your strength in the strength of your right speak out at last to the treacherous spoiler say will ye harry her in our sight ye shall not trample her down nor soil her loose her bonds let her rise in her loveliness our virginal sister or if ye shame her dark amnon shall rue for her sore distress and her sure revenge shall be that of tamar speak at last Edmund Clarence Stedman. Then, in 1873, came what was certain to come, sooner or later, an outrage by Spain against the United States. The Virginius, a vessel of American register, was captured on the high seas by a Spanish gunboat, taken to a Cuban fort, and some fifty of her officers and crew, Americans for the most part, summarily shot. America was wild with rage, but Spain was permitted to settle by paying an indemnity. The Gospel of Peace, 1873 Aye, let it rest, and give us peace. Tis but another blot on freedom's fustian flag, and gold will gild the unclean spot. Yes, fold the hands and bear the wrong, as Christians over meek and wipe away the bloody stain, and turn the other cheek. What boots the loss of freemen's blood beside imperiled gold? Is honor more than merchandise, and cannot pride be sold? Let Cuba groan, let patriots fall, Americans may die, our flag may droop in foul disgrace, but peace be still our cry. Ay, give us peace, and give us truth to nature, to resign the counterfeit which freedom wears upon her banner fine. Remove the stars, they light our shame, but keep the stripes of gore, and craven white to tell the wrong a prudent nation bore. James Jeffrey Roche 
the insurrection in cuba dragged on its horrors steadily increasing and at last in eighteen seventy five the american government intimated that if spain did not stop the war foreign intervention might become necessary spain took the hint and ended the struggle by granting cuba certain reforms cuba isle of a summer sea fragrant with eden's flowers god meant thee to be free and wills thee to be ours the blood of generous hearts has freely drenched thy soil that blood but strength imparts which tyrants cannot foil within thy fair retreat mid victory and flame thy sons shall yet repeat huzzas in freedom's name yet where his ashes rest whose eye revealed a world from towers and mountains crest our flag shall be unfurled in truth it is but just that freedom's hand should hold confined to her trust the key to lands of gold harvey rice but with a cynical disregard of good faith spain kept only such of her promises as she pleased increased abuses followed and in eighteen ninety five revolution flamed out again under such leaders as gomez maceo and garcia the revolutionists soon gained control of most of the provinces cuba to colombia april eighteen ninety six a voice went over the waters a stormy edge of the sea fairest of freedom's daughters have you no help for me do you not hear the rusty chain clanking about my feet have you not seen my children slain whether in cell or street oh if you were sad as i and i as you were strong you would not have to call or cry you would not suffer long patience have i not learned it under the crushing years freedom have i not earned it toiling with blood and tears not of you my banners wave not on egyptian shore or by armenia's mammoth grave but at your very door oh if you were needy as i and i as you were strong you should not suffer bleed and die under the hoofs of wrong is it that you have never felt the oppressor's hand fighting with fond endeavor to cling to your own sweet land were you not half dismayed there in the century's night till to your view a sister's aid came like a flash of light oh what gift could ever be grand enough to pay the debt if out of the starry western land should come my lafayette will carleton american sympathy was soon awakened and grew rapidly in strength this was increased when spain placed valeriano whaler in command in cuba whaler had an evil reputation for cruelty and extortion and at once proceeded to make it more evil by exterminating the pacificos or quiet people who were taking no active part in the war cuba libre comes a cry from cuban water from the warm dusk antilles from the lost atlanta's daughter drowned in blood as drowned in seas comes a cry of purpled anguish see her struggles hear her cries shall she live or shall she languish shall she sink or shall she rise she shall rise by all that's holy she shall live and she shall last rise as we when crushed and lowly from the blackness of the past bid her strike lo it is written blood for blood and life for life bid her smite as she is smitten stars and stripes were born of strife once we flashed her lights of freedom lights that dazzled her dark eyes till she could but yearning heed them reach her hands and try to rise till they stabbed her choked her drowned her till we scarce could hear a note ah those rusting chains that bound her oh these robbers at her throat and the kind who forged the fetters ask five hundred years for news stake and thumbscrew for their betters inquisitions banished jews chains and slavery what reminder of one red man in that land why these very chains that bind her bound columbus foot and hand 
shall she rise as rose columbus from his chains from shame and wrong rise as morning matchless wondrous rise as some rich morning song rise a ringing song and story valor love personified stars and stripes espouse her glory love and liberty allied Joaquin miller the situation of americans in havana began to cause uneasiness and it was decided to send a ship of war to that port the battleship maine was selected for this duty and reached havana on the morning of january twenty fourth eighteen ninety eight the parting of the ways untrammeled giant of the west with all of nature's gifts endowed with all of heaven's mercy blessed nor of thy power unduly proud peerless in courage force and skill and godlike in thy strength of will before thy feet the ways divide one path leads up to heights sublime the other downward slopes where bide the refuse and the wrecks of time choose then nor falter at the start o oh, choose the nobler path and part be thou the guardian of the weak of the unfriended thou the friend no guerdon for thy valor seek no end beyond the avowed end wouldst thou thy godlike power preserve be godlike in the will to serve joseph b gilder on the morning of february sixteenth eighteen ninety eight the news flashed over the country that on the previous evening the Maine had been blown up at her anchorage and that two hundred and sixty-four men and two officers had been killed. The Men of the Maine, February 15th, 1898 Not in the dire and sanguined front of war, conquered or conqueror, mid the dread battle peal, did they go down to the still under seas with fair renown to weave for them the hero martyr's crown they struck no blow gainst an embattled foe with valiant hearted saxon hardihood they stood not as the essex sailors stood so sore bestead in that far chilean bay yet no less faithful they these men who in a passing of the breath were hurled upon death no warning the salt-scented sea-wind bore no presage whispered from the cuban shore of the appalling fate that in the tropic night-time lay in wait to bear them whence they shall return no more some lapsed from dreams of home and love's clear star into a realm where dreams eternal are and some into a world of wave and flame wherewith they came to living agony that no words can name tears for them all in the low-tuned dirge funeral their place is now with those who wear green set about the brow the deathless immortales the heroes torn and scarred whose blood made red the barren ocean dells fighting with him the gallant ranger bore daring to do what none had dared before to wave new world banner freedom starred at england's very door Yet with such noble ones their names shall stand, As those who heard the dying Lawrence speak, His burning words upon the Chesapeake, And grappled in the hopeless hand to hand. With those who fell on Erie and Champlain, Beneath the pouring pitiless battle rain, With such as these are lost men of the main. What, though they faced no storm of iron hail, That freedom and the right might still prevail, the path of duty it was theirs to tread to death's dark vale through ways of travail led and they are ours our dead if it be true that each loss holds a gain it must be ours through saddened eyes to see from out this tragic holocaust of pain the whole land bound in closer amity clinton scholard the word of the lord from havana February 16th, 1898. Thus spake the Lord. Because ye have not heard, because ye have given no heed to my people in their need, because the oppressed cried from the dust where he died, and ye turned your face away from his cry in that day. 
because ye have bought and sold that which is above gold, because your brother is slain, while ye get you drunk with gain. Behold, these are my people, I have brought them to birth, on whom the mighty have trod, the kings of earth, saith the Lord God. Because ye have fawned and bowed down, lest the spoiler frown, and the wrongs that the spoiled have borne, ye have held in scorn. Therefore, with rending and flame, I have marred and smitten you. Therefore, I have given you to shame, that the nations shall spit on you. Therefore, my angel of death hath stretched out his hand on you. Therefore, I speak in my wrath, laying command on you. Once have I bared my sword, and the kings of the earth gave a cry. Twice have I bared my sword, that the kings of the earth should die. Thrice shall I bear my sword, and ye shall know my name, that it is I. Ye who held peace less than right, when a king laid a pitiful tax on you, hold not your hand from the fight, when freedom cries under the axe on you. I who called France to you, call you to Cuba in turn. Repay, lest I cast you adrift, and you perish astern. Ye who made war, that your ships should lay to at the beck of no nation, make war now on murder, that slips the lease of her hounds of damnation. Ye who remembered the Alamo, remember the Maine. Richard Hovey Half Mast February 16th, 1898 on every schoolhouse, ship, and staff, from Frisco clear to Marblehead, let droop the starry banner now, in sorrow for our sailors dead. Half-mast, half-mast o'er all the land, the verdict wait, your wrath restrain, half-mast for all the gallant band, the sailors of the main. Not till a treachery is proved, his sword the patriot soldier draws. War is the last alternative, be patient till ye know the cause. Meanwhile, half-mast o'er all the land, the verdict wait, your wrath restrain, half-mast for all the gallant band, the martyrs of the main. Lloyd Mifflin The Fighting Race, February 16th, 1898 Read out the names, and Burke sat back, and Kelly drooped his head, while Shea, they call him Scholar Jack, went down the list of the dead. Officers, seamen, gunners, marines, the crews of the gig and yawl, the bearded man and the lad in his teens, carpenters, coal-passers, all. Then knocking the ashes from out his pipe, said Burke in an offhand way, we're all in that dead man's list by Cripe, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's to the main, and I'm sorry for Spain, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. Wherever there's Kellys, there's trouble, said Burke, wherever fighting's the game, or a spice of danger in grown man's work, said Kelly, you'll find my name. And do we fall short, said Burke, getting mad, when it's touch and go for life? Said Shea, it's thirty-odd years, bedad, since I charged to drum and fife. Up Mary's Heights and my old canteen stopped a rebel ball on its way. There were blossoms of blood on our sprigs of green, Kelly and Burke and Shea, and the dead didn't brag. Well, here's to the flag, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. I wish t'was in Ireland, for there's the place, said Burke, that we'd die by right, in the cradle of our soldier race, after one good stand-up fight. My grandfather fell on Vinegar Hill, and fighting was not his trade, but his rusty pikes in the cabin still, with Hessian blood on the blade. Aye, Aye, said Kelly, the pikes were great when the word was clear the way. We were thick on the roll in ninety-eight, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's to the pike and the sword and the like, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. And Shea, the scholar, with rising joy, said, We were at Ramillies. We left our bones at Fontenoy and up in the Pyrenees. Before Dunkirk, on Landon's plain, Cremona, Lille, and Ghent, we're all over Austria, France, and Spain, wherever they pitched a tent. We've died for England from Waterloo to Egypt and Dargai, and still there's enough for a corps or crew, 
Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's to good honest fighting blood, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. Oh, the fighting races don't die out, if they seldom die in bed. For love is first in their hearts, no doubt, said Burke, then Kelly said. When Michael, the Irish archangel, stands, the angel with the sword, and the battle dead from a hundred lands arranged in one big horde, our line that for Gabriel's trumpet waits will stretch three deep that day, from Jehoshaphat to the Golden Gates, Kelly and Burke and Shea. Well, here's thank God for the race and the sod, said Kelly and Burke and Shea. Joseph I. C. Clark A wave of fierce wrath swept over the American people. But Captain Sigsby, of the destroyed ship, asked that judgment be suspended till the cause of the accident had been investigated. ON THE EVE OF WAR O God of battles, who art still, the God of love, the God of rest, subdue thy people's fiery will, and quell the passions in their breast. Before we bathe our hands in blood, we lift them to thy holy rood. The waiting nations hold their breath to catch the dreadful battle cry, and in the silence as of death the fateful hours go softly by. O oh, hear thy people where they pray, and shrive our souls before the fray. Before the sun of peace shall set, we kneel apart a solemn while. Pity the eyes with sorrow wet, but pity most the lips that smile. The night comes fast, we hear afar the baying of the wolves of war. Not lightly, O oh, not lightly, Lord, let this awful task begin. Speak from thy throne a warning word above the angry faction's din. If this be thy most holy will, be with us still, be with us still. Donske Dandridge, Good Friday, 1898 Spain without waiting for investigation, announced that the main had been blown up by an explosion of her magazines, due to the carelessness of her officers. The American people waited in ominous silence for the investigation to be concluded. To Spain, a last word. Iberian, palter no more. By thine hands, thine alone, they were slain. Oh, t'was a deed in the dark. Yet mark, we will show you a way, only one, by which ye may blot out the stain. Build them a monument, whom to death sleep, in their sleep ye betrayed. Proud and stern let it be, Cuba free. So only the stain shall be raised, so only the great debt be paid. Edith M. Thomas Meanwhile the sailor dead were buried in the cemetery at Havana, with impressive ceremony. They were afterwards disinterred and placed in the military cemetery at Arlington on the Potomac. THE MARTYRS OF THE MAIN And they have thrust our shattered dead away in foreign graves. Exiled forever from the port, the homesick sailor craves. They trusted once in Spain, they're trusting her again, and with the holy care of our own sacred slain. No! No, the stripes and stars must wave above our tars. Bring them home. On a thousand hills the darling dead of all our battles lie, in nooks of peace, with flowers and flags, but now they seem to cry, from out their biovac, here every good man Jack belongs, nowhere but here, with us. So bring them back, and on the Cuban gales a ghostly rumor wails, bring us home. Poltroon, the people that neglects to guard the bones, the dust, the revered relics its warriors have bequeathed in trust. But heroes, too, were these who sentineled the seas, who gave their lives to shelter us in careless ease. Shall we desert them, slain, and proffer them to Spain as alien mendicants, these martyrs of our main? No, bring them home. Rupert Hughes at last the investigation was ended, and showed that the main had been blown up from the outside, probably by a submarine mine, exploded by men who wore the uniform of Spain. 
The report reached Congress March 28, 1898, and on April 11th, President McKinley asked Congress for authority to establish an independent government in Cuba. El Emplazado El Emplazado, the summoned, the doomed one, Spain whom the nations denounce and abhor, robe thy dismay in the black San Benito, come to the frowning tribunal of war. Cursed were thy minions, their roster and scutcheon, Alvas, Alfonsos, archarchons of hate, pillared on bigotry, pride and extortion, topples to ruin thy mansion of state. Violence, cruelty, intrigue and treason, these false courtiers who flattered thy throne, empires thy sisters, forebode thee disaster, even thy children their mother disown. Suppliant Cuba, thy daughter forsaken, famished and bleeding and buffeted sore, ghastly from gashes and stabs of thy rancor, binds up her wounds at an alien door. Courts and corregidors erst at thy bidding, banished or butchered, Moresco and Jew, ghosts from all Christendom, shades of the martyrs, flock from the sepulchre thee to pursue. Wrath of retributive justice o'ertakes thee, brand of time's malice and blisters thy brow. Armed caballeros and crowned kings of Bourbon, all are unable to succor thee now. El Emplazado, the summoned, the doomed one, God's inquisition condemns thee to-day. Earth-shaking cannonballs thunder thy sentence. Heaven re-echoes the auto da fe. William Henry Venable on April 19, 1898, Congress adopted a resolution declaring that Spanish rule in Cuba must cease, recognizing the independence of the Cubans and empowering the President to use the entire land and naval forces of the United States to drive Spain from the island. It was, in effect, a declaration of war. Battle Song When the vengeance wakes, when the battle breaks, and the ships sweep out to sea, when the foe is neared, when the decks are cleared, and the colors floating free, when the squadrons meet, when it's fleet to fleet, and front to front with Spain, from ship to ship, from lip to lip, pass on the quick refrain, remember, remember the main. When the flag shall sign, advance in line, train ships on an even keel, when the guns shall flash, and the shot shall crash, and bound on the ringing steel, when the rattling blasts from the armored masts are hurtling their deadliest rain, let their voices loud through the blinding cloud cry ever the fierce refrain, Remember, remember the main. God's sky and sea in that storm shall be fate's chaos of smoke and flame, but across that hell every shot shall tell not a gun can miss its aim. Not a blow shall fail on the crumbling mail, and the waves that engulf the slain shall sweep the decks of the blackened wrecks with a thundering dread refrain. Remember, remember the main. Robert Burns Wilson England was the only country in Europe whose sympathies were openly with the United States. In France, Italy, and elsewhere, the hostility to America was bitter and outspoken. Greeting from England America, dear brother land, while yet the shotted guns are mute, accept a brotherly salute, a hearty grip of England's hand. Tomorrow, when the sulphurous glow of war shall dim the stars above, be sure the star of England's love is over you, come weal or woe. Go forth in hope, go forth in might, to all your nobler self be true that coming times may see in you the vanguard of the hosts of light. Though wrathful justice load and train, your guns be every breach they make a gateway pierced for mercy's sake, that peace may enter in and reign. Then should the hosts of darkness band against you, lowering thunderously, flash the word brother o'er the sea, and England at your side shall stand. Exulting, for, though dark the night, and sinister with scud and rack, the hour that brings us back to back, but harbingers the larger light. London Chronicle, April 22, 1898 Diplomatic relations between Spain and the United States were at once severed, 
and on April 25, 1898, Congress formally declared that war with the Kingdom of Spain had existed since April 21st. The first blow was to be struck with surprising suddenness. Battle Cry, May 1st, 1898 The loud drums are rolling, the mad trumpets blow, to battle, the war is begun, and we go to humble the pride of an arrogant foe. The ensign and standard which wave for the crown of Castile and Aragon trample them down. Granada and Leon and haughty Navarre shall lower their banner to Cuba's lone star. Now under old glory, the blue and the gray, united march shoulder to shoulder away to meet the Hidalgos in furious fray. With musket and haversack ready are we to tramp the globe over to sweep every sea from isles of dead Philip to Florida's key. We think of the main, and our hot bosoms swell with rage of love's sorrow which vengeance must quell, and then we are ready to storm gates of hell. Our flag streams aloft by the tempest unfurled. We strike for a continent, nay, for the world, Mean, tuckle, up, harson, the thunder is hurled. The ensign and standard which wave for the crown of Castile and Aragon trample them down. Granada and Leon and haughty Navarre shall lower their banner to Cuba's lone star. William Henry Venable Thousands of miles away, across the Pacific, lay another island dependency of Spain, the Philippines. The Navy Department, with singular foresight, had been gradually increasing the Asiatic Squadron, commanded by Commodore George Dewey, and that officer was carefully preparing for the work he saw before him. The fleet was assembled at Hong Kong, and on April 26, 1898, came a cablegram to Dewey stating that war had commenced and ordering him to proceed at once to the Philippines and capture or destroy the Spanish fleet there. At two o'clock the next afternoon, the American fleet started on its 600-mile journey. It reached Manila on the night of April 30th and steamed straight into the harbor. Just One Signal May 1st, 1898 The war path is true and straight. It knoweth no left or right. Why ponder and wonder and vacillate? The way to fight is to fight. The officer of the deck hath climbed to a perch aloft. He leaned far out, and he craned his neck, and his tones were gentle and soft. I see, he whispered, off there to port, through the night shade lesser black, the darker blur of the outer fort, preparing for the attack. They signaled it so, the sharp and short, the answer was signaled back, keep on. Again from the upper air came the quiet voice of the guide. The Admiral's flagship's over there, two miles on the starboard side. It's a long, long way for the best of eyes, but I know her by moon or sun. I know her by lines, and I know her by size, and there goes her warning gun. That boat will make a most excellent prize, said the Admiral, when we've won. Keep on. The whispering came again. I think by the hints and signs, appearing ahead of us now and then, that we're getting among their minds. Ten fathom in front, as the searchlights show, I fancy that I can detect the line of their outermost works. Ah, no, it is nearer than I'd suspect. The message was sent to the admiral so, and he answered to this effect, Keep on. The haze of the dawning day slid into the shades of night, and he called, Off there in the upper bay, they're lining their ships for a fight. I think they are training on us. No more, he said, for the dawn was lit by the blaze of a gun from the neighboring shore, and he fell to the deck hard hit. They signaled. The first man struck, as before. The admiral answered it. Keep on. The sun came over the hills, as wishing a world-wide wheel, and the guns were fired with the aim that kills, and steel pierced heart of steel. In the line of shore was the fringe of hell, and the center of hell was the sea. And the woe was the woe no tongue may tell, and no eye view tearlessly. And over that crater of bomb and shell the signal continued to be, Keep on. O Lawrence, whose passing cry grows ever the more sublime, And thou, O Nile King, whose word shall die when we learn the death of time, We send you the third of a glorious three, we send you a battle shout, 
that echoes up from the blood-thick sea and up from the wreck and rout and down from the staff on the high cross tree where the flag is signaling out keep on the war path is true and straight it knoweth no left or right mars loves not the man who would deviate for the way to fight is to fight End of section 6Section 7 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humple. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. Chapter 5, Part 2. The War with Spain. A shot from Corregidor and another from El Fraile told that the fleet was discovered, but the ships glided quietly on, and at dawn the Spanish fleet was seen anchored under the batteries of Cavite. Dewey steamed straight for them. The Spanish ships were sunk, one after another, by the deadly fire of the American gunners, and by noon the Spanish fleet had been destroyed, the shore batteries silenced, and a white flag floated over the citadel of Cavite. Dewey had not lost a man, and had won the greatest naval battle since Trafalgar. Dewey at Manila, May 1st, 1898 Twas the very verge of May, when the bold Olympia led into Boca Grande Bay Dewey's squadron, dark and dread, creeping past Corregidor, guardian of Manila's shore. Do they sleep who wait the fray? Is the moon so dazzling bright that our cruiser's battle gray melts into the misty light? Ah, the red flash and the roar wakes at last, Corregidor. All too late their screaming shell tears the silence with its track. This is but the gate of hell. We've no leisure to turn back. Answer, Concord, then once more. Slumber on, Corregidor. And as, like a slowing tide, onward still the vessels creep, Dewey watching, falcon-eyed, orders, let the gunners sleep, For we meet a foe at four, fiercer than Corregidor. Well they slept, for well they knew what the morrow taught us all, He was wise as well as true, thus upon the foe to fall. Long shall Spain the day deplore, Dewey ran Corregidor. May is dancing into light, as the Spanish admiral, from a dream of phantom fight, wakens at his sentry's call. Shall he leave Cavite's lee, hunt the Yankee fleet at sea? O oh, Montoyo, to thy deck, that today shall float its last. Quick, to quarters, yonder speck, grows a hull of portent vast. Hither, toward Cavite's lee, comes the Yankee hunting thee. Not for fear of hidden mine, halts our doughty commodore. He of old heroic line follows Farragut once more, hazards all on victory here within Cavite's lee. If he loses, all is gone. He will win because he must, and the shafts of yonder dawn are not thicker than his thrust. Soon, Montoyo, he shall be with thee in Cavite's lee. Now, Manila, to the fray, show the hated Yankee host this is not a holiday. Spanish blood is more than boast, fleet and mine and battery, crush him in Cavite's lee. Lo, hell's geysers at our fore pierce the plotted path in vain, nerving every man the more with the memory of the main. Now at last our guns are free, here within Cavite's lee. Gridley, says the Commodore, you may fire when ready, then, long and loud like lions roar, when a rival dares the den, breaks the awful cannonry, full across Cavite's lee. Who shall tell the daring tale of our thunderbolt's attack, finding when the chart should fail, by the lead his dubious track, five ships following faithfully, five times o'er the Cavite's lee. Of our gunner's deadly aim, of the gallant foe and brave, Who unconquered faced with flame, seek the mercy of the wave, Choosing honor in the sea, underneath Cavite's lee. 
let the mead the victors gain be the measure of their task less of flinching stouter strain fiercer combat who could ask and surrender twas a word that cavite ne'er had heard noon the woeful work is done not a spanish ship remains but of their eleven none ever was so truly spain's which is prouder they or we thinking of cavite's lee envoy but remember when we've ceased giving praise and reckoning odds man shares courage with the beast wisdom cometh from the gods who would win on land or wave must be wise as well as brave robert underwood johnson dewey and his men may first eighteen ninety eight glistening high in the midnight sky the starry rockets soar to crown the height so soon to be uncrowned corregidor and moaning into the middle night resounds the answering shock from fraley's island battery within the living rock like Fargut before him, so Dewey down the bay, past fort and mine in single line, holds on toward Cavite. When the earth was new, a raven flew o'er the sea on a perilous quest, by his broad black pinions buoyed up as he sought him a spot to rest. So to-day from British China sweeps our Commodore mid the cheers of England's dauntless ships of steel, and into the night he steers with never a home but the furrowy foam and never a place for ease save the place he'll win by the dint and din of his long lean batteries a misty dawn on the may day shone yet the enemy sees afar on our ships of war great flags flung out as bright as the morning star then the cannon of spain crash over the main and their splendor flecks the ports as the crackling thunder rolls along the frowning fleet and forts but the Olympia in her majesty leads up the broadening bay, and behind her come gaunt ships and dumb toward crested Cavite. All pearl and rose the dawnlight glows, and ruddy and gray the gloom of battle over their squadron sinks as we sweep like a vast simoon, when our broadsides flash and ring at last in a hoarsening, staggering crush. On the arsenal and fleet in wrath our lurid lightnings rush, Malate knows us, Cavite, Cana Coca crazed with hate, but Corregidor shall speak no more, El Fraile fears his fate. Montoyo fights as fought the knights by the Cid Campeador. He leaves his flagship all afire, the Cuba takes him o'er. The Don Antonio roars in flames, the Austria lights and lifts. From Sangley to Manila Mole the battle vapor drifts. But the Queen Christine in one great blast dies as becomes her name, her funeral shroud a pillar of cloud, all filigreed with flame. From peak to peak our quick flags speak, the rattling chorus ends, and cheer on cheer rolls o'er the sea at the word the signal sends. From Commodore to Powder Boy, from Bridge to Stoker's Den, no battle rips have found our ships, nor wounds nor death our men. We cheer and rest, we rest and cheer, and ever above the tides, the flag that knows no conquering foes in newer glory rides. When the reek of war is rolled afar by the breezes down the bay, we turn our deadly guns again on the walls of Cavite. The Spaniard dreamed of victory, his final hope is flown, as winged destruction up and down our batteries have strown. In horrid havoc, red and black, the storm throbs on amain, till in the glare of carnage there fade all the flags of Spain. In old Madrid sad eyes are hid for an empire sore bestead. Manila's mad with misery, Havana sick with dread. As the great bells toll each gallant soul, Castile shall see no more. Toll Fraley's rock, a thing for sport, toll lost Corregidor. Spain's fortresses are fluttering, with banners blanched and pale. Her admiralty in agony lies, shattered steam and sail. And the home we sought was cheaply bought, for no mother, wife, nor maid. From Maine to Loma Point bewails the land for whom she prayed. Now everywhere, from Florida to the blue Vancouver Straits, 
the flag we've flown abroad is thrown and a word of cheer awaits the ships and men that never failed the nation from her birth have done again all ships and men may do upon this earth glistening high in the noontide sky the starry banners soar to crown anew the height so soon uncrowned corregidor they bring the promise of the free to philip's jewelled isles and hearts oppressed thrill hard with hope whene'er that promise smiles for the spirit of old ironsides broods o'er that tropic bay and the wildfire lights as dewey fights on the broad manila bay wallace rice off manili ay lads ay we fought em and we sent em to the bottom and you'll say i'm a talkin like a silly i hear your cheers and jokes but lads them's human folks what is soakin in the water off manili ay lads and when we shot it's just as like as not we hit some mother's heart in old granadee she didn't sink no main way over there in spain but she won't never see her laddie's body i can see a black-eyed gal something like my little sal what is crying out her eyes in old Seville? there's a widow in madrid with a poor little kid and his daddy has went down off manili ay lads ay we fought em and we sent em to the bottom and i hopes you won't be thinkin i'm a booby but that little black-eyed gal what reminds me so of sal she didn't never do no harm to Cuby. And if instead of Sanchi it had been the hated Yankee, which you know, my lads, is me and Jack and Billy, you know who would be crying for us fellows what was dying and a soakin in the water off Manili. Edmund Vance Cook Manila Bay From keel to fighting top I love our Asiatic fleet. I love our officers and crews who'd rather fight than eat. I love the breakfast ordered up when enemies ran short. But most I love our chaplain with his head out of the port. Now a naval chaplain cannot charge as chaplains can on land. With his Bible in his pocket, his revolver in his hand. He must wait and help the wounded. No danger must he court. So our chaplain helped the wounded with his head out of the port. Beneath his red and yellow, at bay the Spaniards stood, till the yellow rose in fire and the crimson sank in blood, until the last fouled rifle sped its impotent retort, our chaplain watched the Spaniard with his head out of the port. Then here's our admiral on the bridge, above the bursting shell, and here's our sailors who went in for victory or hell. And here's the ships, and here's the guns that silenced fleet and fort. But don't forget our chaplain, with his head out of the port. Arthur Hale, May 1st, 1898 A Ballad of Manila Bay Your threats how vain, Corregidor! Your rampired batteries feared no more! Your frowning guard at Manila Gate, when our captain went before! lights out into the unknown gloom from the windy glimmering wide sea room challenging fate in that dark strait we dared the hidden doom but the death in the deep awoke not then mine and torpedo they spoke not then from the heights that loomed on our passing line the thunders broke not then safe through the perilous dark we sped quiet each ship as the quiet dead till the guns of El Fraile roared too late, and the steel prows forged ahead. Mute each ship as the mute mouth grave, a ghost leviathan cleaving the wave, but deep in its heart the great fires throb, the travailing engines rave. The ponderous pistons urge like fate, the red-throat furnaces roar elate, and the sweating stokers stagger and swoon in a heat more fierce than hate. So through the dark we stole our way, past the grim waters and into the bay, past Calibayo and past Salinas, and came at the break of day, where strong Cavite stood to oppose 
where, from a sheen of silver and rose, a thronging of masts, a soaring of towers, the beautiful city arose. How fine and fair! But the shining air, with a thousand shattered thunders there, flapped and reeled, for the fighting foe we had caught him in his lair. Surprised, unready, his proud ships lay idly at anchor in Bacor Bay. Unready, surprised, but proudly bold, which was ever the Spaniard's way. Then soon on his pride the dread doom fell, red doom, for the ruin of shot and shell lit every vomiting, bursting hulk with a crimson reek of hell. But to the brave, though beaten, hail, all hail to them that dare and fail, to the dauntless boat that charged our fleet and sank in the iron hail. Manila Bay, Manila Bay, how proud the song on our lips today, a brave old song of the true and strong and the will that has its way, of the blood that told in the days of Drake when the fight was good for the fighting's sake, for the blood that fathered Farragut is the blood that fathered Blake. And the pride of the blood will not be undone while war's in the world and a fight to be won. For the master now, as the master of old, is the man behind the gun. The dominant blood that daunts the foe, that laughs at odds and leaps to the blow, it is Dewey's glory today, as Nelson's a hundred years ago. Charles George Douglas Roberts The Battle of Manila A Fragment May 1st, 1898 by Cavite on the bay, t'was the Spanish squadron lay, and the red dawn was creeping o'er the city that lay sleeping to the east like a bride in the May. There was peace at Manila, in the May morn at Manila, when Ho, the Spanish admiral, awoke to find our line, had passed by gray Corregidor, had laughed at shoal and mine, and flung to the sky its banners, with remember for the sign. With the ships of Spain before, in the shelter of the shore, and the forts on the right, they drew forward to the fight, and the first was the gallant Commodore in the Bay of Manila, in the doomed Bay of Manila, with succor half the world away, no port beneath that sky, with nothing but the ships and guns and Yankee pluck to try. They had left retreat behind them, they had come to win or die. For we spoke at Manila, we said it at Manila, O be ye brave or be ye strong, ye build our ships in vain. The children of the Sea Queen's brood will not give up the main. We hold the sea against the world as we held it against Spain. Be warned by Manila, take warning by Manila. Ye may trade by land, ye may fight by land, ye may hold the land in fee but not go down to the sea in ships to battle with the free, for England and America will keep and hold the sea. Richard Hovey This remarkable victory amazed the world and set America wild with excitement and enthusiasm. Dewey became a popular hero, and Congress made haste to revive the grade of admiral and to confer it upon him. Dewey in Manila Bay. He took a thousand islands, and he didn't lose a man. Raise your heads and cheer him as he goes. He licked the sneaky Spaniard till the fellow cut and ran. Her fighting's part of what a Yankee knows. He fought him and he licked him without any fuss or flam. It was only his profession for to win. He sank their boats beneath him, and he spared them as they swam, and then he sent his ambulances in. He had no word to cheer him, and had no bands to play. He had no crowds to make his duty brave. But he risked the deep torpedoes as the breaking of the day, for he knew he had our self-respect to save. He flew the angry signal, crying justice for the main. He flew it from his flagship as he fought. He drove the tardy vengeance in the very teeth of Spain, and he did it just because he thought he ought. He busted up their batteries and sank eleven ships. He knew what he was doing every bit. He set the maxims going like a hundred cracking whips, and every shot that crackled was a hit. 
He broke em and he drove em, and he didn't care at all. He only liked to do as he was bid. He crumpled up their squadron and their batteries and all. He knew he had to lick em, and he did. And when the thing was finished and they flew the frightened flag, he slung his guns and sent his foot ashore. He gathered in their wounded, and he quite forgot to brag, for he thought he did his duty, nothing more. Oh, he took a thousand islands, and he didn't lose a man. Raise your heads and cheer him as he goes. He licked the sneaky Spaniard till the fellow cut and ran, for fighting's part of what a Yankee knows. R. V. Risley Another fleet, and a much more powerful one than Dewey's, had been collected at Key West under command of Admiral Sampson, ready to proceed to Cuba, and on April 21st orders came for it to sail. On the morning of April 22nd, it put to sea and steamed slowly off toward Havana. Mene, Mene, Tekel, Abharsen April 22nd, 1898 Behold, we have gathered together our battleships, near and afar. Their decks they have cleared for action, their guns they are primed for war. From the east to the west there is hurry, in the north and the south a peal of hammers in fort and shipyard, and the clamor and clang of steel. In the rush and roar of engines, and clanking of derrick and crane, thou art weighed in the scales and found wanting, the balance of God, O Spain. Behold, I have stood on the mountains, and this was writ in the sky. She is weighed with the scales and found wanting, the balance of God holds on high. The balance he once weighed Babylon, the mother of harlots in. One scale holds thy pride and power, an empire begotten of sin. Heavy with woe and torture, the crimes of a thousand years, mortared and welded together with fire and blood and tears. In the other, for justice and mercy, a blade with never a stain, is laid the sword of liberty, in the balance dips, O Spain. Summon thy vessels together. Great is thy need for these. Cristobal Colon, Vizcaya, Oquendo, Marie, Therese. Let them be strong and many, for a vision I had by night. From that ancient wrongs thou hast done, the world came howling to the fight. From new world shores they gathered, Inca and Aztec Spain. To the Cuban shot but yesterday, our own dead seamen, Spain. Summon thy ships together. Gather a mighty fleet, for a strong young nation is arming that never hath known defeat. Summon thy ships together, there on thy blood-stained sands, for a shadowy army gathers with manacled feet and hands. A shadowy host of sorrows and of shames too black to tell, that reach with their horrible wounds for thee to drag thee down to hell. Myriad phantoms and specters thou warest against in vain. Thou art weighed in the scales and found wanting, the balance of God, O Spain. Madison Coeen A blockade was proclaimed of Havana and a number of other ports, but no attempt was made to enter the harbor, which was crammed with mines and defended by strong fortifications. The Spirit of the Maine In battle line of somber gray, our ships of war advance, as red cross knights in holy fray charged with avenging lance. And terrible shall be thy plight, O fleet of cruel Spain, for ever in our van doth fight the spirit of the main. And when beside Regulus Lake the great twin brethren came, a righteous fight for Rome to make against the deed of shame. So now a ghostly ship shall doom the fleet of treacherous Spain. Before her guilty soul doth loom the spirit of the main. A wrath arrayed in peaceful white, as when asleep she lay, Above the traitorous mine that night within Havana Bay. She glides before the avenging fleet, a sign of woe to Spain. Brave though her sons, how shall they meet the spirit of the main? Tudor Jenks Spain also had a fleet, and a strong one, on the ocean. 
It had been gathered together at the Cape Verde Islands, and on April 29, 1898, it put to sea and steamed westward into the Atlantic for a destination which could only be conjectured. THE DRAGON OF THE SEAS They say the Spanish ships are out to seize the Spanish main. Reach down the volume, boy, and read the story o'er again. How when the Spaniard had the might, he drenched the earth like rain, with human blood, and made it death to sail the Spanish main. With torch and steel and stake and rack, he trampled out all truce, until Queen Bess her leashes slipped, and turned her sea-dogs loose. God, how they sprang, and how they tore, the Grenville's Hawkins Drake! Remember, boy, they were your sires, they made the Spaniard quake. They sprang like lions, for their prey, straight for the throat amain. By twos, by scores, wherever they caught, they fought the ships of Spain. When Spain in dark Uloa's bay broke doubly plighted faith, bold Hawkins found his way through fire for great Elizabeth. A bitter malt Spain brewed that day, she drained it to the lees. Her faithless guns that morn awoke the dragon of the seas. From sea to sea he ravaged far, a scourge with flaming breath. Where'er the Spaniard sailed his ships, sailed Francis Drake in death. No port was safe against his ire, secure no furthest shore. The fairest day oft sank in fire before the dragon's roar. He made the Atlantic surges red round every Spanish keel, piled Spanish decks with Spanish dead, the noblest of Castile. From Del Fuego's beetling coast to sleety Hebrides, he hounded down the Spanish coast and swept the flaming seas. He fought till Spain's inmost lakes mid orange bowers set, La Mancha's daughters feared to sail, lest they the dragon met. King Philip of his raven reft, as forfeit claimed his head, the great queen laughed his wrath to scorn, and knighted Drake instead, and gave him ships and sent him forth to clear the Spanish main, for England and for England's brood, and sink the fleets of Spain. And well he wrought his mighty work, till on that fatal day he met his only conqueror in Nombre Dios Bay. There in his shotted hammock swung, amid the surge's sweep, he waits the lookout's signal across the quiet deep. In dreams of dark Uloa's bay and Spanish treachery, and how he tracked Magellan far across the unknown sea. But if Spain fires a single shot upon the Spanish main, she'll come to deem the dragon dead has waked to life again. Thomas Nelson Page the Sailing of the Fleet Two fleets have sailed from Spain. The one would seek what lands uncharted ocean might conceal. Despised, condemned, and pitifully weak, it found a world for Leon and Castile. The other, mighty, arrogant, and vain, sought to subdue a people who were free. Ask of the storm gods where its galleons be, whelmed neath the billows of the northern main. A third is threatened, on the westward track, once gloriously traced, its vessels sped, with gold and crimson battle flags unfurled, on Colon's course, but to Sidonia's rack, sure fated, if so need shall come to need, for sons of Drake are lords of Colon's world. A portion of the American fleet started off to look for the Spaniards, and the remainder engaged in various minor operations off the Cuban coast. On May 11th, a party rode in and cut the cable at Cienfuegos, under a heavy fire. Cut the Cables An Incident of Cienfuegos May 11th, 1898 Cut the cables, the order read, and the men were there, there was no delay. The ships hove to in Cienfuegos Bay. The Wisdom, Nashville, Marblehead, beautiful, grim, and alert were they. It was midway, past the morning gray. Cut the cables, the order said. Over the clouds of the dashing spray, the guns were trained and ready for play. Picked from the Nashville, wind slow led. Grim death waits ashore, they said. Lower the boats, Godspeed, give way. Did our untried navy lads obey? Away to their perilous work, they sped. 
Now, steady the keel, keep stroke the oar, they must go in close, they must find the wires, grim death is alert on that watching shore, that deadly shore of the hundred fires. In the lighthouse tower, along the edge, in the blockhouse waiting, the guns are there, on the lowland too, in the tall dry sedge, they are holding the word till the boats draw near. One hundred feet from the water's edge, dazzling clear is the sunlit air. Quick, my men, the moments are dear, two hundred feet from the rifle pit, and our untried lads still show no fear. When they open now, they're sure to hit, no question, even by sign they ask, in silence they bend to their dangerous task. Quick now, the shot from a smokeless gun cuts close and spatters the glistening brine. Now follows the roar of the battle begun, but the boys were bent in the blazing sun like peaceful fishermen wetting a line. They searched the sea while a shrieking blast swept shoreward swift as the lightning flies, while the fan-like storm of the shells went past, like a death-wing clearing the hissing skies, like a sheltering wing, for the hurricane came from our own good guns, and the foe might tell what wreck was wrought by their deadly aim, for the foe went down where the hurricane fell. It shattered the blockhouse, leveled the tower, it ripped the face of the smoking hill, it beat the battle back, hour by hour, then for a little our guns were still. For a little, but that was the fatal breath, the moment's lull and the friendly crash, for the long pit blazed with a vicious flash, and eight fell, two of them done to death. Once more the screen of the screaming shot with its driving canopy covered the men, while they dragged and grappled and faltering not, still dragged and searched and grappled again and they stayed right there till the work was done. The cables were found and severed each one, with an eighty-foot gap, and the piece hauled in, and stowed in place, then under the din of that deafening storm that had swept the air, for three long hours they turned from shore, steady the keel there, stroke the oar, to the smoke-wreathed ships, and, under the guns, they went up the side, our untried ones. Quiet, my brave boy, hats off all. They are here, our untried boys in blue. Steady the block now, all hands haul. Slow on the line there, look to the crew. Six lads hurt, and the colors there, wrap two of them, hold. Ease back the bow. Slow now on the line, slack down with care. Steady their back on their own deck now. The cables are cut, sir, eighty foot spread. Six boys hurt, and two of them dead. Half mast the colors. There's work to do. There are two red marks on the starboard gun. There is still some work that is not quite done. For our untried boys that are tried and true, it wasn't all play when they cut the wires. Well named is that bay of the hundred fires. Robert Burns Wilson, June 2, 1898 A few days later, on May 24, 1898, the battleship Oregon arrived at Jupiter Inlet, Florida, after one of the most remarkable voyages in history. On March 9th, the ship, then at San Francisco, was ordered to circle South America and join the Atlantic Squadron, and the journey of nearly 15,000 miles was accomplished without starting a rivet. The Race of the Oregon Lights out, and a prow turned toward the south and a canvas hiding each cannon's mouth, and a ship like a silent ghost released is seeking her sister ships in the east. A rush of water, a foaming trail, an ocean hound in a coat of mail, a deck long lined with the lines of fate, she roars goodbye at the golden gate. On, on alone without gong or bell, but a burning fire like the fire of hell, till the lookout starts as his glasses show the white cathedral of Kaleo. A moment's halt neath the slender spire, food, food for the men, and food for the fire, then out of the sea to rest no more till her keel is grounded on Chile's shore. South, south, God guard, through the unknown wave, where the chart nor compass may help or save, where the hissing wraiths of the sea abide, and few may pass through the stormy tide. North, North for a harbor far away, for another breath in the burning day, for a moment's shelter from speed and pain, 
and a prow to the tropic sea again. Home, home with the mother fleet to sleep, till the call shall rise o'er the awful deep, and the bell shall clang for the battle there, and the voice of guns is the voice of prayer. One more to the songs of the bold and free, when your children gather about your knee, when the Goths and Vandals come down in might as they came to the walls of Rome one night. When a lordly William of Deloraine shall ride by the Scottish lake again, when the Hessian specters shall flit in air as Washington crosses the Delaware, when the eyes of babes shall be closed in dread as the story of Paul Revere is read, when your boys shall ask what the guns are for, then tell them the tale of the Spanish War, and the breathless millions that looked upon the matchless race of the Oregon. John James Meehan Battle Song of the Oregon The billowy headlands swiftly fly, the crested path I keep. My ribbon smoke stains many a sky, my embers dye the deep. A continent has hardly space, mid-ocean little more, wherein to trace my eager race, while clang the alarms of war. I come, the warship Oregon, my wake a whitening world, my cannon shotted, thundering on with battle flags unfurled. My land knows no successful foe, behold, to sink or save. From stoker's flame to gunner's aim, the race that rules the wave. A nation's prayers my bulwark are, though ne'er so wild the sea. Flow time or tide, come storm or war, throbs my machinery. Land Spain has lost, forever peer, from every lengthening coast till rings the cheer that proves me near the flag of Columbia's host. Defiantly I have held my way from the vigorous shore where Drake dreamed a new Albion in the day he left New Spain a quake. His shining course retraced I fight the selfsame foe he fought, all earth to light with signs of might which God our captain wrought. Made mad from Santiago's mouth, Spain's ships of battle dart, my bulk comes broadening from the south, a hurricane at heart. Its desperate armories blaze and boom, its ardent engines beat, and fiery doom finds root and bloom aboard the Spanish fleet. The hundred weight of the golden hind, with me are ponderous tons. The ordnance great, her deck that lined, would feed my ravening guns. Her spacious reach in months and years I've shrunk to nights and days. Yet in my ears are ringing cheers, Sir Frank himself would raise. For conquereth not mine engine's breath, Nor sides still clad and strong, Nor bulk nor rifles red with death, To Spain too these belong. What made that old armada break, This newer victory won. Jehovah spake by the sons of Drake At each incessant gun. I come the warship Oregon, my wake a whitening world, my cannon shotted, thundering on, with battle flags unfurled. My land knows no successful foe, behold, to sink or save. From stoker's flame to gunner's aim, the race that rules the wave. Wallace Rice A few days before, Samson's fleet had bombarded San Juan, Puerto Rico, ineffectively, and then came word that the Spanish squadron had slipped into the harbor of Santiago, Cuba, to coal and refit. It was not until May 29th that its presence there was discovered by the Americans, who proceeded at once to blockade the harbor. Strike the Blow The four-way winds of the world have blown, and the ships have taken the wave. The legions march to the Trump's shrill call, neath the flag of the free and the brave. The hounds of the sea have trailed the foe, they have trailed and tracked him down. They wait no longer but strike, O land, with the dauntless strength of thy strong right hand, strike the blow. The armored fleets with their grinning guns have the Spaniard in his lair. They have tracked him down where the ramparts frown, and they'll halt and hold him there. They have steamed in his wake, they have seen him go, they have bottled and corked him up. Then send him home to the under-foam, till the wide sea shakes to the far blue dome, strike the blow. 
the Cuban dead and dying call, the children starved in the light, of the aid that waits till the hero deed breaks broad in the tyrant's might. The starved and the weak in their hour of woe are calling land on thee. Then why delay in thy dauntless sway? On, on to the charge of the freedom way, strike the blow. They have taken the winds of the Carib seas, thy fleets that know not fear. Their ribs of steel have yearned to reel in the dance of the cannoneer. Thy sons of the blue that wait to go would leap with a will to the charge. Then send them the word so long deferred. They have listened late, but they have not heard. Strike the blow. They have listened late in the desolate land. They have looked through brimming eyes. And starving women have held dead babes to their heart with a thousand sighs. On, on to the end, O land, the foe beneath thy sword shall fall. Thy ships of steel have tracked them home. Ye are king of the land and king of the foam. Strike the blow. On June 1, 1898, a great portion of Samson's fleet was off the harbor, and it was decided to block the entrance by sinking the collier Merrimack in the channel. The enterprise was entrusted to Lieutenant Richmond Pearson Hobson and a crew of eight volunteers. Eight Volunteers Eight volunteers, on an errand of death, eight men, who speaks? Eight men to go where the cannon's hot breath burns black the cheeks. Eight men to man the old Merrimack's hulk, eight men to sink the old steamer's black bulk, blockade the channel where the Spanish ships skulk. Eight men, who speaks? Eight volunteers, said the admiral's flags. Eight men, who speaks? Who will sail under El Moro's black crags? Sure death he seeks. Who is there willing to offer his life? Willing to march to this music of strife, cannon for drum and torpedo for fife. Eight men. Who speaks? Eight volunteers on an errand of death. Eight men. Who speaks? Was there a man who in fear held his breath with fear-paled cheeks? From every warship ascended a cheer, from every sailor's lips burst the word, Here! Four thousand heroes, their lives volunteer. Eight men! Who speaks? Lansing C. Bailey It was impossible to get the boat ready that night, but at last, at three-thirty in the morning of June 2nd, she stood away for the harbor. The Spaniards saw her as she entered and rained a storm of fire upon her. A moment later, torn by her torpedoes and those of the enemy, she sank to the bottom. Hobson and his men were taken prisoners by the Spaniards. THE MEN OF THE MERRIMACK June 3, 1898 Hail to Hobson! Hail to Hobson! Hail to all the valiant set! Klaus and Kelly, Dane and Phillips, Murphy, Montague, Charette, Whosoe'er we laud and laurel we shall be their debtors yet. Shame upon us, shame upon us, should the nation e'er forget. Though the tale be worn with the telling, let the daring deed be sung. Surely ne'er brighter valor, since this wheeling world was young. Thrilled men's soul to more than wonder, till praise leaped from every tongue. Trapped at last the Spanish sea-fox in the hill-locked harbor lay. Spake the admiral from his flagship, rocking off the hidden bay, We must close yon open portal, lest he slip by night away. Volunteers, the signal lifted, rippling through the fleet it ran. Was there ever a deadlier venture? Was there ever a bolder plan? Yet the gallant sailors answered, answered well nigh to a man. Ere the dawn's first rose flush kindled, swiftly sped the chosen eight. Toward the batteries grimly frowning, or the harbor's narrow gate. Sooth, he holds his life but lightly, who thus gives the dare to fate. They had passed the outer portal, where the guns grinned tear o'er tear, when the portentous Moro thundered, and the Socapa echoed clear, and Estrella joined the chorus, pandemoniac to hear. Heroes without hands to waver, heroes without hearts to quail, there they sat in the bulky collier mid the hurling Spanish hail. 
long shall float our starry banner if such lads beneath it sail hail to hobson hail to hobson hail to all the valiant set claus and kelly dane and phillips murphy montague charette whosoe'er we laud and laurel we shall be their debtors yet shame upon us shame upon us should the nation e'er forget clinton scholard the victory wreck june third eighteen ninety eight O stealthily creeping Merrimack, hush low your fiery breath. You who gave life to ships of strife are sailing unto your death. I am ready and dressed for burial beneath the Cuban wave, but still I can fight for God and right while resting in my grave. O men that are sailing the Merrimack, your hearts are beating high, but send a prayer through the smoking air to your captain in the sky. We know there is death in every breath as we cling to the gunless deck, and grand will be our voyage if we can make of our ship a wreck. Now drop the bower of the Merrimack and swing her to the tide. Now scuttle her braves and bid the waves sweep into her shattered side. Through the flying hell of shot and shell we pass death with a sneer. We wrenched our life from a novel strife and even our foemen cheer. Will Carleton. Examination showed that the channel had not been blocked. The Merrimack had gone too far in and had sunk lengthwise of the channel instead of across it. So the Spanish ships were not yet corked. Hobson and His Men, June 3, 1898. Hobson went towards death and hell. Hobson and His Men unregarding shot and shell and the rain of fire that fell calm undaunted fearless bold every heart a heart of gold steadfast daring uncontrolled hobson and his men hobson came from death and hell hobson and his men shout the tidings ring the bell let the pealing anthems swell from the wreck and raft and wave from the shadow of the grave every honor to the brave hobson and his men. Robert Loveman. End of section seven. Section eight of Poems of American History, Volume five, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humpel. Poems of American History, Volume 5, Period of Expansion, by Various. Chapter 5. The War with Spain, Part 3. Meanwhile, nearer home, Things were moving slowly enough, for the War Department developed a startling unpreparedness and inefficiency. Two hundred thousand volunteers were called for, but, though every state responded instantly, the work of mobilizing these troops was conducted in so bungling a fashion that, by the beginning of June, only three regiments, in addition to the regulars, had reached the rendezvous at Tampa, Florida. THE CALL TO COLORS are you ready, O oh Virginia, Alabama, Tennessee? People of the Southland, answer, for the land hath need of thee. Here, from sandy Rio Grande, where the Texan horsemen ride, here, the hunters of Kentucky hail from Chatterawa's side. Every toiler in the cotton, every rugged mountaineer, velvet-voiced and iron-handed, lifts his head to answer here. Some remain who charged with picket, some survive who followed Lee. They shall lead their sons to battle, for the flag, if need there be. Are you ready, California, Arizona, Idaho? Come, O oh, come, unto the colors, heard you not the bugle blow. Falls a hush in San Francisco, in the busy hives of trade. In the vineyards of Sonoma fall the pruning knife and spade. In the mines of Colorado pick and drill are thrown aside. Idly in Seattle Harbor swing the merchants to the tide, 
and a million mighty voices throb responsive like a drum rolling from the rough sierras you have called us and we come or missouri sounds the challenge or the great lakes and the plain are you ready minnesota are you ready men of maine from the woods of Ontonagon, from the farms of Illinois, from the looms of Massachusetts, we are ready, man and boy. Axemen free of Androscoggin, clerks who trudge the city's paves, Gloucester men who drag their plunder from the sullen, hungry waves. Big-boned Swede and large-limbed German, Celt and Saxon swell the call, and the Adirondacks echo, we are ready, one and all truce to feud and peace to faction all forgot is party zeal when the warships clear for action when the blue battalions wheel europe boasts her standing armies serfs who blindly fight by trade we have seven million soldiers and a soul guides every blade laborers with arm and mattock laborers with brain and pen railroad prince and railroad brakemen build our line of fighting men Flag of righteous wars, close mustered, gleam the bayonets, row on row, where thy stars are sternly clustered, with their daggers toward the foe. Alfred Gitterman Essex Regiment March Written for the 8th Massachusetts United States Volunteer Infantry in the Spanish War Once more the flower of Essex is marching to the wars, we are up to serve the country where error fly her stars. Ashore, afloat, or far or near, to her who bore us true, we will do a freeman's duty as we were born to do. Lead the van, and may we lead it, God of armies, till the wrong shall cease. Speed the war, and may we speed it to the sweet homecoming, God of peace. Our fathers fought their battles and conquered for the right, three hundred years victorious from every stubborn fight and still the flower of essex from the ancient stock puts forth where the bracing blue sea water stirs the sinews of the north the foe on field the foe on deck to us is all the same with both the flower of essex has played a winning game we threw them on the village green we cowed them in algiers and ship to ship we shocked them in our first great naval years we rode the great commander o'er the ice-bound Delaware, when the Christmas snow was falling in the dark and wintry air. And still the flower of Essex, like the heroes gone before, where the tide of danger surges, shall take the laboring oar. The flower that first lay bleeding along the bloody brook, full oft hath death upgathered in war's red reaping hook, its home is on our highlands, tis sweeter than the rose, but sweetest in the battle's breath the flower of Essex blows. At the best a dear home coming, at the worst a soldier's grave, beating the tropic jungle, ploughing the dark blue wave. But while the flower of Essex from the granite rock shall come, none but the dead shall cease to fight till all go marching home. March onward to the leaguer, where'er it may lie, the colors make the country, whatever be the sky, where round the flag of glory the storm terrific blows, we march, we sail, whoever fail, the flower of Essex goes. George Edward Woodbury The Gathering We are coming, Cuba, coming. Our starry banner shines above the swarming legions sweeping downward to the sea. From northern hill and western plain and towering southern pines, the serried hosts are gathering, and Cuba shall be free. We are coming, Cuba, coming, thy sturdy patriots brave, who fight as fought our fathers in the old time long ago, shall see the Spanish squadron sink beneath the whelming wave, and plant their own loved banner on the ramparts of their foe. We are coming, Cuba, coming, across the billows foam, our gallant ships are bearing our bravest down to thee, while earnest prayers are rising from every freeman's home, that freedom's God may lead them on, and Cuba shall be free. Herbert B. Sweat It was evident that an army was badly needed to support the fleet at Santiago, and on June 7, 1898, 
the force at Tampa was ordered to embark for that place, under command of General William Shafter. Everything was confusion, and it was not until June 14th that the transports finally made their way down to the bay. Comrades Now from their slumber waking, the long sleep men thought death, the war gods rise, inhaling deep the cannon's fiery breath. Their mighty arms uplifted, their gleaming eyes aglow, with the steadfast light of battle as it blazed long years ago. Now from the clouds they summon, the captains of the past, still sailing in their astral ships the starlit spaces vast, and from Valhalla's peaceful plains the great commanders come, and marshal again their armies to the beat of the muffled drum. His phantom sails unfurling, McDonough sweeps amain, where once his Yankee sailors fought the Battle of Champlain. And over Erie's waters again his flagship sweeps, while Perry on the quarter deck his endless vigil keeps. Silent as mists that hover, when twilight shadows fall, the ghosts of the royal armies foregather at the call, and their glorious chiefs are with them from conflicts lost or won as they gather round one mighty shade, the shade of Washington. Side by side with the warships that sail for the hostile fleet, the ships of the past are sailing, and the dauntless comrades meet, and standing shoulder to shoulder, the armed spirits come, and march with our battalions to the beat of the muffled drum. Henry R. Dorr The fleet reached Santiago June 20th, and Shafter decided to move directly upon the city. But the army had lost or forgotten its lighters and launches, so the task of disembarking it fell upon the navy and was admirably performed. Next morning, General Joseph Wheeler, with four squadrons of dismounted cavalry, was ordered forward. Two of these squadrons were composed of the Rough Riders, under command of Leonard Wood and Theodore Roosevelt. Wheeler's Brigade at Santiago Beneath the blistering tropical sun, the column is standing ready, awaiting the fateful command of one whose word will ring out to an answering shout to prove it alert and steady. In a stirring chorus, all of them sung with singleness of endeavor, though some to the bonny blue flag had swung, and some to the Union forever. The order came sharp through the desperate air, and the long ranks rose to follow, till their dancing banners shone more fair than the brightest ray of the Cuban bay or the hill in the jungled hollow. Into Maryland some in the days gone by had fought through the combat's rumble, and some for freedom's battle cry had seen the broad earth crumble. Full many a widow weeps in the night, who had been a man's wife in the morning. For the banners we loved we bore to the height, where the enemy stood as a hero should, his valor his country adorning. But drops of pride with your tears of grief, ye American women, mix ye. For the North and the South, with a Southern chief, kept time to the tune of Dixie. Wallace Rice After great confusion and several days' delay, the remainder of the army came up, and on the afternoon of June 30th a general advance was ordered. By dawn of July 1st the troops were in position, and the attack began. Deeds of Valor at Santiago June 1st, 1898 Who cries that the days of daring are those that are fated far, that never a light burns planet bright to be hailed as the hero's star? Let the deeds of the dead be laurelled, the brave of the elder years. But a song, we say, for the men of today who have proved themselves their peers. High in the vault of the tropic sky is the garish eye of the sun, and down in its crown of guns a frown looks the hilltop to be won. There is the trench where the Spaniard lurks, his hold in his hiding place, and he who would cross the space between must meet death face to face. The black mouths belch and thunder, and the shrapnel shrieks and flies. Where are the fain and the fearless, the lads with the dauntless eyes? Will a moment find them wanting? Nay, but with valor stirred, 
like the leashed hound on the coursing ground they wait but the warning word charge and the line moves forward moves with a shout and a swing while sharper far than the cactus thorn is the spiteful bullet sting now they are out in the open and now they are breasting the slope while into the eyes of death they gaze as into the eyes of hope never they wait nor waver but on they clamor and on with up with the flag of the stripes and stars and down with the flag of the dawn what should they bear through the shot rent air but rout to the ranks of spain for the blood that throbs in their hearts is the blood of the boys of anthony wayne see they have taken the trenches where are the foemen gone and now old glory waves in the breeze from the heights of san juan and so while the dead are laurelled the brave of their elder years a song we say for the men of today who have proved themselves their peers clinton scholard the morning was consumed in blundering about under the spanish fire trying vainly to carry out the orders of a general lying in a hammock far in the rear finally the subordinate commanders acted for themselves lawton ludlow and chaffee took the fort of el caney and the rough riders charged san juan the charge at santiago july first eighteen ninety eight with shot and shell like a loosened hell smiting them left and right they rise or fall on the sloping wall of beetling bush and height they do not shrink at the awful brink of the rifle's hurtling breath but onward press as their ranks grow less to the open arms of death through a storm of lead or maimed and dead onward and up they go till hand to hand the unflinching band grapple the stubborn foe or men that reel mid glint of steel bellow or boom of gun they leap and shout over each redoubt till the final trench is won o oh, charge sublime over dust and grime each hero hurls his name in shot or shell like a molten hell to the topmost heights of fame and prone or stiff under bush and cliff wounded or dead men lie while the tropic sun on a grand deed done looks with his piercing eye William Hamilton Hayne Private Blair of the Regulars July 1st, 1898 It was Private Blair of the Regulars, before dread El Caney, who felt with every throb of his wound the life tide ebb away. As he dwelt in a fevered dream, on the home of his youthful years, he heard nearby the moan and sigh of two of the volunteers. He raised them up and gazed at them, and likely lads they were. But when he bade them pluck up heart, he found they could not stir. Then a bullet ploughed the sodden loam, and his fearless face grew dark, for he saw through the blur a sharpshooter who made the twain his mark. And his strength leaped into his limbs again, and his fading eye burned bright, and he gripped his gun with a steady hand and glanced along the sight. Then another voice in that choir of fire outspake with a deadly stress, and in the trench at El Caney there lurked a Spaniard less. But still the moans of the volunteers went up through the murky air, and there kindled the light of a noble thought in the brain of Private Blair. The flask at his side he had drained it dry in the blistering scorch and shine, so unappalled he crept and crawled in the face of the firing line. The whirring bullets sped o'erhead, and the great shells burst with a roar, and the shrapnel tore the ground around like the tusks of the bristly boar. But on he went, with his high intent, till he covered the space between, and came to the place where the Spaniard lay, and clutched his full canteen. Then he writhed him back o'er the bloody track, while death drummed loud in his ears, and he pressed the draw he would fain have quaffed to the lips of the volunteers. Drink, cried he, don't think of me, for I'm only a regular, while you have homes in the motherland where your waiting loved ones are. Then his soul was sped to the place of the dead, all praise to the men who dare, and honor be from sea to sea to the deed of Private Blair. Clinton Scholard The fort on San Juan was carried, 
and held all the next day, despite Spanish attacks. But Shafter was alarmed and considered withdrawing the army, though strongly opposed by General Wheeler, who had been in the thick of the fighting from the very first. Wheeler at Santiago Into the thick of the flight we... Into the thick of the fight he went, pallid and sick and wan, born in an ambulance to the front, a ghostly wisp of a man. But the fighting soul of a fighting man, approved in the long ago, went to the front in that ambulance, and the body of fighting Joe. Out from the front they were coming back, smitten of Spanish shells, wounded boys from the Vermont hills in the Alabama dells. Put them into this ambulance. I'll ride to the front, he said. And he climbed to the saddle and rode right on, that little old ex confed. From end to end of the long blue ranks rose up the ringing cheers, and many a powder-blackened face was furrowed with sudden tears, as with flashing eyes and gleaming sword and hair and beard of snow, into the hell of shot and shell rode little old fighting Joe. Sick with fever and racked with pain, he could not stay away, for he heard the song of the yesteryear in the deep-mouthed cannon's bay. He heard in the calling song of the guns there was work for him to do, where his country's best blood splashed and flowed round the old red, white, and blue. Fevered body and hero heart, this union's heart to you, beats out in love and reverence, and to each dear boy in blue, who stood or fell mid the shot and shell, and cheered in the face of the foe, as wan and white to the heart of the fight rode little old fighting Joe. James Lindsay Gordon Then, suddenly, sorrow gave place to joy, and discouragement to enthusiasm for a great victory won. At nine o'clock on the morning of Sunday, July 3rd, 1898, the Spanish fleet came rushing out of the harbor in a mad effort to escape. The American ships closed in, and a battle to the death began, which ended in the total destruction of the Spanish fleet. Spain's Last Armada July 3, 1898 They fling their flags upon the morn, their safeties held a thing for scorn, as to the fray the Spaniards on the wings of war are borne. Their sullen smoke clouds writhe and reel, and sullen their ships of steel, already cannon lanyards from the fighting tops to keel. They glance upon the golden air, one glancing helpless, hopeless prayer, to ask that swift and thorough be the victory falling there. Then giants with a cheer and sigh burst forth to battle and to die beneath the walls of Morrow on that morning in July. The Teresa heads the haughty train to bear the admiral of Spain. She rushes hurtling, whitening, like the summer hurricane. El Moro glowers in his might. Socapa crimsons with the fight. The Oquendo's lunging lightning blazes through her somber night. In desperate and eager dash, the Vizcaya hurls her vivid flash, as wild upon the waters her enormous batteries crash. Like spindrift scuds, the fleet cologne, and on her bubbling wake bestrown, lurch hungry for the slaughter, El Furor and El Pluton. Round Santiago's armored crest, serene on their gray valor dressed, our behemoths lie quiet, watching well from south and west. Their keen eyes spy the harbor reek, the signals dance, the signals speak, then breaks the blasting riot, as our broadsides storm and shriek. Quick, poising on her eagle wings, the Brooklyn into battle swings, the wide sky falls in wonders, as the titan Texas springs. The Iowa, in monster leaps, goes bellowing above the deeps, the Indiana thunders, as her terror onward sweeps. And hovering near and hovering low, until the moment strikes to go, in gallantry the Gloucester swoops down on her double foe. She volleys, the Fuhrer falls lame, again the Pluton's aflame, hurrah, on high she's tossed her, gone the grim destroyer's fame. And louder yet and louder roar, the Oregon's black cannon o'er, the clangor and the booming all along the Cuban shore. She's swifting down her Valkyr path, her sword sharp for the aftermath, with leaven in her glooming, 
like Jehovah in his wrath. Great ensigns snap and shine in air above the furious onslaught where our sailors cheer the battle, danger but a thing to dare. Our gunners speed as off they've sped, their hail of shrilling, shattering lead, swift sure our rifles rattle, and the foemen's decks are red. Like baying bloodhounds lope our ships, adrip with fire their cannon's lips, we scourge the fleeing Spanish, whistling wheels from scorpion whips. Till, livid in the ghastly glare, they tremble on in dread despair, and thoughts of victory vanish in the carnage they must bear. Where Cuban coasts in beauty bloom, where Cuban breakers swirl and boom, the Teresa's onset slackens in a scarlet spray of doom. Near Nimanima's greening hill, the streaming flames cry down her will, her vast hull blows and blackens, prey to every mortal ill. On Juan Gonzalez's foaming strand, the Oquendo plunges neath our hand, her armaments all strangled, and her hope a showering brand. She strikes and grinds upon the reef, and shuddering there in utter grief, in misery and mangled, wastes the way beside her chief. The Vicaya never more shall ride from out a Saradero's tide. With hate upon her forehead, ne'er again she'll pass in pride. Beneath our fearful battle spell, she moaned and struggled, flared and fell, to lie agleam and horrid, while the piling fires swell. Thence from the wreck of Spain alone, tears on the terrified Cologne, in bitter anguish crying, like a storm bird forth she's flown. Her throbbing engines creak and thrum. She sees a beam the Brooklyn come. For life she's gasping, flying. For the combat she is dumb. Till then the man behind the gun Had wrought whatever must be done. Here now, beside our boilers, Is the fight fought out and won. Where great machines pulse on and beat, A swelter in the humming heat, The nation's nameless toilers Make her mastery complete. The cape of the cross cast out a stone against the course of the Cologne, despairing and inglorious on the wind her white flag's thrown. Spain's last armada, lost and wan, lies where the Tarquino's stream rolls on, as round the world victorious looms the dreadnought Oregon. The sparkling daybeams softly flow to glint the twilight afterglow. The banner sinks in splendor that in battle ne'er was low. The music of our country's hymn rings out like songs of seraphim. Fond memories and tender fill the evening fair and dim. Our huge ships rise in majesty, unchallenged o'er the glittering sea. Above them white stars cluster, mighty emblem of the free. And all adown the long sea lane, the fitful balefires wax and wane to shed their lurid luster on the empire that was Spain. Wallace Rice Santiago, July 3, 1898 In the stagnant pride of an outworn race, the Spaniard sailed the sea, till we hailed him up to God's judgment place and smashed him by God's decree. Out from the harbor belching smoke came dashing seaward the Spanish ships, and from our decks a great shout broke. Then our hearts came up and set us a choke, for joy that we had them at last at grips. No need for signals to get us away. We were off at score with our screws agleam. Through the blistering weeks we'd watched the bay, and our captains had need not word to say, save to bellow and curse down the pipes for steam. Leading the pack in its frightened flight, the colon went foaming away to the west her tall iron bulwarks black as night, and her great black funnels sharp in sight against the green-clad hills in their peace and rest. Her big Ontario blazed away at the Indiana, our first in line. The short-range shot drenched our decks with spray, while thirteen inchers in answering play ripped straight through her frame to her very spine. Straight to its end went our winning fight with the thunder of guns and a mighty roar our hail of iron casting withering blight, turning the Spanish ships in their flight to a shorter death on the rock-bound shore. 
the colon making her reckless race with the brooklyn and oregon close abeam went dashing landward and stopped the chase by grinding her way to her dying place in a raging outburst of flame and steam so the others facing their desperate luck drove headlong on to their rock dealt death the Vizcaya yielding before she struck, the riddled destroyers, a huddled ruck, sinking and gasping for drowning breath. So that flying battle surged down the coast, with its echoing roar from the Cuban land. So the dying warships gave up the ghost, so we shattered and mangled the Philistine host. So the fight was won that our Samson planned. Thomas A. Janiver the American battleships were practically uninjured, and the fleet had only lost two men, one killed and one injured, both on the Brooklyn. The Spanish loss was 350 killed or drowned, 160 wounded, and 1,774 taken prisoners. The Fleet at Santiago July 3, 1898 The heart leaps with the pride of their story predestinate lords of the sea they are heirs of the flag in its glory they are sons of the soil it keeps free for their deeds the serene exaltation of a cause that was stained with no shame for their dead the proud tears of a nation their fame shall endure with its fame the fervor that grim unrelenting the founders in homespun had fired with blood the free compact cementing was the flame that their souls had inspired they were sons of the dark tribulations, of the perilous days of the birth, of a nation sprung free among nations, a new hope to the children of earth. They were nerved by the old deeds of daring, every tale of Decatur they knew, every ship that, the bright banner wearing, shot to keep it afloat in the blue. They were spurred by the splendor undying, of Somer's fierce fling in the bay, and the watchword that Lawrence died crying, and of Cushing's calm courage were they. By the echo of guns at whose thunder old monarchies crumbled and fell, when the warships were shattered asunder and their pennants went down in the swell. By the strength of the race that, unfearing, faces death till the death of the last, or has sunk with the fierce Saxon cheering, its colors still nailed to the mast. So they fought, and the stern race immortal, of Cromwell and Hampton and Penn, has thrown open another closed portal, stricken chains from a new race of men. So they fought, so they won, so above them blazed the light of a consecrate aim. Empty words, who may tell how we love them, how we thrill with the joy of their fame. Charles E. Russell End of Section 8Section 9 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ed Humpel. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various. Section 9. THE WAR WITH SPAIN CHAPTER Five, PART Four. Particularly gallant was the part played by the Gloucester, a converted yacht with no armor under Commander Wainwright. She was lying inshore near the harbor mouth and opened with her little rapid-fire guns on the great battleships as they swept past. Then the moment the Spanish destroyers, Furor and Pluton, appeared, she rushed straight upon them with absolute disregard of the shore batteries. Within twenty minutes the Pluton went down in deep water, and the Fuhrer was beached and sunk. The Destroyer of Destroyers July 3, 1898 From Santiago, spurring the morrow, Spain's ships come steaming, big with black sorrow. Over the ocean, first on our roster, runs Richard Wainwright, glad on the Gloucester. Boast him and toast him, Wainwright, the Gloucester. 
great ships and gaunt ships steel-clad and sable roll on resplendent monsters of fable crash all our cannon quick maxims rattle red death and ruin rush through the battle red death and dread death ravage and rattle speed on spain's cruisers towers of thunder calm rides the gloucester moro roars at her enemies looming on their wakes heave her vast through the glooming thunders and wonders speak from the glooming sped our spain's cruisers then mid the clangor dart her destroyers lurid with anger shouts richard wainwright quivers the gloucester where the furor goes wainwright has crossed her boast him and toast him wainwright the gloucester wide to the westward el furor flutters hid in bright vapors where wainwright mutters under socapa races the faster smiles at spain's gunners laughs at disasters aiming and flaming faster and faster wide to the westward el pluton plunges at her with rapiers now wainwright lunges swords of fierce scarlet blades blue as lightning rapid guns snapping little guns brightening four pounders six pounders lunging like lightning done the destroyers blazing and bursting berserker wainwright rides to their worsting seethe the pluton sides soon to exhaust her flames the furor's deck doomed by the gloucester boast him and toast him wainwright the gloucester where the pluton lies lifts the red leaven fire clouds prodigious dash against heaven where the pluton lay void swells the ocean shattered and sunken spent her devotion waves where wet graves were deep in the ocean shrieking toward cuba agonized broken el fior is hasting her fate bespoken there in the shallows mid the white surges her guns deserted moan out their dirges swelling and knelling through the white surges wainwright in mercy does his endeavor some he shall rescue more rest for ever say a prayer for them one kindly ave spain weeps her wounded wails a lost navy fails them bewails them says them an ave off santiago when from beleaguer rushed forth cervera daring and eager who stood spain's onset who met and tossed her wainwright the mains man glad on the gloucester boast him and toast him wainwright the gloucester wallace rice the evolutions of the brooklyn under commodore winfield scott schley have been the subject of bitter controversy schley finding himself too near the spaniards made a wide turn away from them wishing he afterwards alleged to preserve his ship which was the fastest of our squadron to head off any of the spanish ships which might escape the brooklyn at santiago july third eighteen ninety eight Twixt clouded heights, Spain hurls to doom ships staunch and brave. Majestic forth they flash and boom upon the wave. El Moro raises eyes of hate far out to sea, and speeds Cervera to his fate with cannonry. The Brooklyn o'er the deep espies his flame-wreathed side. She sets her banners on the skies in fearful pride on to the harbor's mouth of fire fierce for the fray she darts an eagle from his ire upon her prey she meets the brave teresa there sigh sigh for spain and beats her clanging armor bare with glittering rain the bold vicayas lightnings glance into the throng where loud the bannered brooklyn chants her awful song down swoops in one tremendous curve our commodore his broadsides roll the foemen swerve toward the shore in one great round his brooklyn turns and girdling there this side and that with glory burns spain to despair frightful in onslaught fraught with fate her missiles hiss the spaniard sees when all too late a nemesis the oquendo's de absence swells then torn and lame her portholes turn to yawning wells geysers of flame yet fierce and fiercer breaks and cries our rifles dread the doomed teresa shudders lies 
stark with her dead. How true the Brooklyn's battery speaks, Eulate knows, as the Vicaya's staggers shrieks her horrent woes. Sideward she plunges, never more shall Biscay feel her heart throb for the ship that wore her name in steel. The Okendo's ports a moment shone, as gloomed her knell. She trembles, bursts. The ship is gone, headlong, to hell. The fleet, colon, in lonely flight, Spain's hope, Spain's fear, sees, and it lends her wings to fright, Schley's pennant near. The fleet, colon, scuds on alone, God, how she runs, and ever hears behind her moan the Brooklyn's guns. Our ruthless cannon o'er the flood roar and draw nigh. Spain's ensign stained with golden blood falls from on high. The world she gave the world has passed, gone with her power, dead neath the Brooklyn's thunder blast in one great hour. The bannered Brooklyn, gallant crew and gallant Schley, proud as the flag his sailors flew along the sky. Proud is his country, for each star our Union wears, the fighting Brooklyn shows a scar, so much he dares. God save us war upon the seas, but, if it slip, send us a chief with men like these on such a ship. Wallace Rice The Oregon, which had arrived from her 15,000-mile voyage from San Francisco, also took a conspicuous part in the battle and did splendid service. THE RUSH OF THE OREGON They held her south to Magellan's mouth, then east they steered her forth, through the farther gate of the crafty strait, and then they held her north. Six thousand miles to the Indian Isles, and the Oregon rushed home, her wake a swirl of jade and pearl, her bow a bend of foam. And when at Rio the cable sang, There is war, grim war with Spain, The swart crews grinned and stroked their guns, And thought on the mangled main. In the glimmered gloom of the engine room There was joy to each grimy soul, And fainting men sprang up again And piled the blazing coal. Good need was there to go with care, But every sailor prayed, Or gun for gun or six to one, To meet them, unafraid. Her goal at last, with joyous blast, she hailed the welcoming roar of hungry sea-wolves curved along the strong-hilled Cuban shore. Long nights went by, her beamed eye unwavering searched the bay, where trapped and penned for a certain end the Spanish squadron lay. Out of the harbor a curl of smoke, a watchful gun rang clear. Out of the channel the squadron broke like a bevy of frightened deer. Then there was the shouting for steam, more steam, and fires glowed white and red, and guns were manned and ranges planned, and the great ships leaped ahead. Then there was a roaring of coursing guns, shatter of shell and spray, and who but the rushing Oregon was fiercest in chase and fray? For her mighty wake was a seething snake, her bow was a billow of foam, like the mailed fists of an angry white her shot drove crashing home. Pride of the Spanish navy, ho, flee like a wounded beast, for the ship of the far northeast. In quivering joy she surged ahead, aflame with flashing bars, till down sunk the Spaniards gold and red, and up ran the clustered stars. Glory to share, aye, and to spare, but the chiefest is hers by right, of a rush of fourteen thousand miles for the chance of a bitter fight. Arthur Giederman the high quality of American marksmanship was never more conclusively shown than in this battle. The Spanish ships were literally blown to pieces. Here, as at Manila, the victory had been won by the men behind the guns. The men behind the guns. A cheer and salute for the admiral, and here's to the captain bold, and never forget the commodore's debt when the deeds of might are told. They stand to the deck through the battle's wreck when the great shells roar and screech, and never they fear when the foe is near to practice what they preach. But off with your hat and three times three for Columbia's true blue sons, the men below who batter the foe, the men behind the guns. 
O oh, light and merry of heart are they when they swing into port once more, when with more than enough of the greenback stuff they start for their leave ashore. And you'd think, perhaps, that the blue-bloused chaps who loll upon the street are a tender bit with salt on it for some fierce mustache to eat some warrior bold with straps of gold who dazzles and fairly stuns the modest worth of the sailor boys the lads who serve the guns but say not a word till the shot is heard that tells the fight is on till the long deep roar grows more and more from the ships of yank and don till over the deep the tempest sweep of fire and bursting shell and the very air is a mad despair in the throes of a living hell then down, deep down, in the mighty ship, unseen by the midday suns, you'll find the chaps who are giving the raps, the men behind the guns. Oh, well, they know how the cyclones blow, that they loose from their cloud of death, and they know is heard the thunder word, their fierce ten-inchers saith. The steel decks rock with a lightning shock, and shake with the great recoil and the sea grows red with the blood of the dead, and reaches for his spoil. But not till the foe has gone below, or turns his prow and runs, shall the voice of peace bring sweet release to the men behind the guns. John Jerome Rooney Admiral Pascual de Cervera, in command of the Spanish fleet, knew from the first how desperate the venture was. He made it only because forced to do so by direct orders from Madrid, the Spanish authorities fearing that Santiago would be taken and the whole fleet be made captive. Cervera Hail to thee, a gallant foe! Well hast thou struck thy blow! Hopeless of victory, daring unequal strife, valuing more than life, honor, and chivalry! Forth from the harbor's room, rushing to meet thy doom, lit by the day's clear light, out to the waters free, out to the open sea, there should a sailor fight. Where the red battles roar, beats on the rocky shore, thunders proclaiming, how the great cannon's breath hurls forth a dreadful death, smoking and flaming. While her guns ring and flash, see each frail vessel dash, though our shots rend her. Swift through the iron rain, bearing the flag of Spain, scorning surrender. Hemmed in, twixt foe and wreck, blood soaks each slippery deck, still madly racing, till their ships burn and reel, crushed by our bolts of steel, firing and chasing. Driven to the rocks at last, now heals each shattered mast, flames the blood drinking. Each with her load of dead, wrapped in that shroud of red, silenced and sinking vanquished but not in vain ancient renown of spain coming upon her once again lives in thee all her old chivalry all her old honor ever her past averse when wealth and land were hers though she might love them die for their keeping yet spain in her pride has set honor above them bertrand shadwell Santiago surrendered a few days later, and an army of occupation, under General Nelson A. Miles, landed at Puerto Rico and took possession of the island, after a few sharp skirmishes. In the Philippines, operations against Manila were pushed vigorously forward, and on August 13th, after sharp actions at Malate, Singalan, and Ermita, the city was captured. Among the killed at Malate was Sergeant J. A. McElwraith, Battery H., 3rd Artillery Regulars. Makarath of Malate, August 13th, 1898. Yes, yes, my boy, there's no mistake. You put the contract through. You lads with Shafter I'll allow were heroes tried and true. But don't forget the men who fought about Manila Bay. And don't forget brave Makarath, who died at Malate. The night was black, save where the forks of tropic lightning ran, when with long, deep thunder roar the typhoon storm began. Then suddenly, above the din, we heard the steady bay, of volleys from the trenches where the Pennsylvanians lay. The tenth, we thought, could hold their own against the feigned attack, 
and if the Spaniards dared advance, would pay them doubly back. But soon we marked the volleys sink into a scattered fire, and now we heard the Spanish guns boom nigher yet and nigher. Then like a ghost a courier seemed past our picket tossed, with wild hair streaming in his face, we're lost, we're lost, we're lost. Front, front, in God's name, front, he cried, our ammunition's gone. He turned a face of day's dismay, and through the night sped on. Men, follow me, cried Micklerath, our acting sergeant then, and when he gave the word he knew he gave the word to men. Twenty there, not one man more, but down the sunken road, we dragged the guns of Battery H, nor even stopped to load. Sudden, from the darkness poured a storm of Mauser hail, but not a man there thought to pause, nor any man to quail. Ahead the Pennsylvania's guns in scattered firing spoke, the Spanish trenches red with flame in fiercer volleys spoke. Down with a rush our twenty came, the open field we passed, and in among the hard-pressed tenth we set our feet at last. Up, with a leap, sprang McElrath, mud-spattered, worn and wet, and in an instant there he stood high on the parapet. Steady, boys, we've got them now, only a minute late. It's all our lads, we've got em whipped, just give em volleys straight. Then up and down the parapet, with head erect he went, as cool as when he sat with us beside our evening tent. Not one of us, close sheltered there, down in the trenches pen, but felt that we would rather die than shame or grieve him then. The fire so close to being quenched, in panic and defeat, leaped forth by rapid volleys sped in one long deadly sheet. A cheer went up along the line, as breaks the thunder call. But as it rose, great God, we saw our gallant sergeant fall. He sank into our outstretched arms, dead, but immortal grown. And glory brightened where he fell, and valor claimed her own. John Jerome Rooney Spain had had enough. She recognized the folly of struggling further, and made overtures for peace. On August 12th, the protocol was signed and hostilities ceased. Eight days later, the American squadron steamed into New York Harbor. When the Great Gray Ships Come In New York Harbor, August 20th, 1898 To eastward ringing, to westward winging, o'er mapless miles of sea, on winds and tides the gospel rides that the furthest isles are free and the furthest isles make answer, harbor and height and hill. Breaker and breach cry each to each other, tis the mother who calls, be still. Mother, new-found, beloved, and strong to hold from harm, stretching to these across the seas the shield of her sovereign arm, who summons the guns of her sailor sons who bade her navies roam, who calls again to the leagues of Maine, and who calls them this time home and the great gray ships are silent, and the weary watchers rest. The black cloud dies in the August skies, and deep in the golden west. Invisible hands are limbing, a glory of crimson bars, and far above is the wonder of a myriad wakened stars. Peace, as the tidings silence the strenuous cannonade, peace at last is the bugle blast, the length of the long blockade. And eyes of vigil weary, are lit with a glad release. From ship to ship and from lip to lip it is peace, thank God for peace. Ah, in the sweet hereafter, Columbia still shall show, the sons of these who swept the seas how she bade them rise and go. How when the stirring summons smote upon her children's ear, south and north at the call stood forth, and the whole land answered, Here. For the soul of the soldier's story, and the heart of the sailor's song, are all of those who meet their foes as right should meet with wrong, who fight their guns till the foeman runs, and then on the decks they trod, brave faces raise, and give the praise to the grace of their country's God. Yes, it is good to battle, and good to be strong and free, to carry the hearts of the people to the uttermost ends of the sea, 
to see the land steal up to the bay where the enemy lies in wait to run your ship to the harbor's lip and sink her across the strait but better the golden evening when the ship's round heads for home and the long gray miles slip swiftly past in a swirl of seething foam and the people wait at the haven's gate to greet the men who win thank god for peace thank god for peace when the great gray ships come in guy wetmore carroll full cycle spain drew us proudly from the womb of night a lusty man-child for the western wave who now full grown smites the old midwife down and thrusts her deep in a dishonored grave john white chadwick peace commissioners from the two countries met at paris in october and a treaty of peace was signed on december tenth eighteen ninety eight Spain relinquished all sovereignty over Cuba and ceded Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippine Islands to the United States, receiving in payment for the latter the sum of twenty million dollars. Breath on the Oat Free are the muses, and where freedom is, they follow, as the thrushes follow spring. Leaving the old land songless there behind, Parnassus disenchanted suns its woods, empty of every nymph, Wide have they flown, and now on new Sierras think to set their wandering court and thrill the world anew, where the Republic babbling waits its speech, for but the prelude of its mighty song as yet has sounded. Therefore would I woo Apollo to the land I love, tis vain, unknown he spies on us, and if my verse ring not the Empyrean round and round, tis that the feeble oat is few of stops. The noble theme awaits the nobler bard, then how all air will choir to it, and all the great dead listen, America, for lo, Diana of the nations hath she lived, remote, and hoarding her own happiness, in her own land, the land that seemed her first in exile, where her bark was cast away, till maiden grew the backward-hearted child, and on that sea whose waves were memories, turned her young shoulder looked with steadfast eyes upon her wilderness, her woods, her streams. Inland she ran, and gathering virgin joy, followed her shafts afar from humankind. And if sometimes her isolation drooped, and yearning woke in her, she put it forth with a high boast and with a sick disdain. Acton's fleeing into antlers branched the floating tresses of her fancy, and far her arrows smote them with a bleeding laugh. O vain and virgin, O the fool of love, now children not her own are at her knee. For stricken by her path lay one that vexed her maiden calm, she reached a petulant hand, and the old nations drew sharp breaths and looked, the two-edged sword, how came it to her hand? The sword that slays the holder, if he withhold, that none can take, or having taken drop, the sword is in thy hand, America. The wrath of God that fillets thee with lightnings, America, strike then, the sword departs. Ah, God, once more may men crown drowsy days with glorious death, upholding a great cause. I deemed it fable, not of them am I. Yet if they love thee on the loud May day, who with exultant thunder wreathe the flag, with thunder and with victory, if they, who on the third most famous of our fourths, along the seaboard mountains swept, a storm unleashed, whose tread spurred not the wrecks of Spain. If these thy sons have loved thee, and have set Santiago and Manila like new stars, crowding thy field of blue, new terror perched like eagles on thy banners, O oh, not less I love thee, who but prattle in the prime, of birds of passage over river and wood, thine also, piping little charms to lure, uncaptured and unflying, the wings of song. Joseph Russell Taylor But the United States was still involved in a struggle altogether unforeseen and repugnant to many of her citizens. The Philippines had been bought from Spain, and with them the United States had taken over just such an insurrection as Spain had encountered in Cuba. THE ISLANDS OF THE SEA God is shaping the great future of the islands of the sea. 
he has sown the blood of martyrs, and the fruit is liberty. In thick clouds and in darkness he has sent abroad his word. He has given a haughty nation to the cannon and the sword. He has seen a people moaning in the terrible deaths they die. He has heard from child and woman a terrible dark cry. He has given the wasted talent of the steward faithless found to the youngest of the nations with his abundance crowned. He called her to do justice where none but she had power. He called her to do mercy to her neighbors at the door. He called her to do vengeance for her own sons foully dead. Thrice did he call unto her ere she inclined her head. She has gathered the vast midland. She has reached her borders round. There has been a mighty hosting of her children on the ground. Her searchlights lie upon the sea. Her guns are loud on land. To do her will upon the earth, her armies round her stand. The fleet at her commandment to either ocean turns. Belted around the mighty world, her line of battle burns. She has not loosed the hot volcanoes of the ships of flaming hell. With fire and smoke and earthquake shock, her heavy vengeance fell. O joyfulest May morning, when before our guns went down, the Inquisition priesthood and the dungeon-making crown, while through the red lights of battle our starry dawn burst forth, swift as the tropic sunrise that doth with glory shout. Be jubilant, free Cuba, our feet are on thy soil. Up mountain road through jungle growth our bravest for thee toil. There is no blood so precious as their wounds pour forth for thee. Sweet be thy joys, free Cuba, sorrows have made thee free. Nor thou, O noble nation, who wast so slow to wrath, with grief too heavy laden, follow in duty's path. Not for ourselves our lives are, not for thyself art thou. The star of Christian ages is shining on thy brow. Rejoice, O mighty mother, that God hath chosen thee, to be the western warder of the islands of the sea. He lifteth up, he casteth down. He is the King of kings, whose dread commands o'er awestruck lands are borne on eagles' wings. George Edward Woodbury The people of the Philippines had fought against Spanish sovereignty much as the people of Cuba had. A band of them, under Emilio Aguinaldo, had assisted at the capture of Manila in the fond hope that the defeat of the Spaniards would mean Philippine independence. Instead, they found that they had merely traded masters. At once they took up arms against the Americans. Ballad of Expansion, 1899 Time was, he sang, the British brute, the ruthless lion's grasping greed, the European law of loot, the despot's devastating deed. But now he sings the heavenly creed Of saintly sword and friendly fist. He loves you, though he makes you bleed, The ethical expansionist. He loves you, heathen, though his foot May kick you like a worthless weed From that wild field where you have root And scatter to the winds your seed. He's just the government you need. If you object, why, he'll insist, And on your protest draw a bead. The ethical expansionist. He'll take you to him, coot ke coot. He'll win you, though you fight and plead. His gun shall urge his ardent suit. Relentless fire his cause shall speed. In time you'll learn to write and read. That is, if you should then exist. You won't, if you his course impede. The ethical expansionist. Envoy. Heathen, you must, you shall be freed. It's really useless to resist. To save your life you'd better heed the ethical expansionist. Hilda Johnson Misguided they no doubt were, and the warfare they waged was of the cruelest kind. But to employ them against the troops of a republic, to shoot them down as rebels, occasioned in the United States a great outburst of indignation. Rebels Shoot down the rebels, men who dare to claim their native land. Why should the white invader spare a dusky heathen band? You bought them from the Spanish king, you bought the men he stole. You bought perchance a ghastlier thing, the Duke of Alva's soul. 
Freedom, you cry, and train your gun on men who would be freed, and in the name of Washington achieve a whaler's deed. Boast of the benefits you spread, the faith of Christ you hold, then seize the very soil you tread, and fill your arms with gold. Go, prostitute your mother tongue, and give the rebel name to those who to their country clung, preferring death to shame and call him loyal, him who brags of countrymen betrayed, the patriot of the money-bags, the loyalist of trade. Oh, for the good old Roman days of robbers bold and true, who scorned to oil with pious phrase the deeds they dared to do. The days before degenerate thieves devised the coward lie of blessings that the enslaved receives, whose rights their arms deny. I hate the oppressor's iron rod, I hate his murderous ships, but most of all I hate, O oh God, the lie upon his lips. Nay, if they still demand recruits to curse Manila Bay, be men, refuse to act like brutes, and massacre, and slay. Or if you will persist to fight with all a soldier's pride, why then be rebels for the right, by Aguinaldo's side? Ernest Crosby but the administration felt that it had gone too far to draw back. Spellbinders raised the shout that wherever the flag was raised it must remain. New regiments were shipped to the Philippines, and the war against the natives pushed vigorously. On a Soldier Fallen in the Philippines Streets of the Roaring Town Hush for him, hush be still. Who comes, who was stricken down, doing the word of our will? Hush, let him have his state, give him his soldier's crown. The grists of trade can wait, they're grinding at the mill. But he cannot wait for his honor, now the trumpet has been blown. Wreathe pride now for his granite brow, lay love on his breast of stone. Toll, let the great bells toll, till the clashing air is dim. Did we wrong this parted soul, we will make it up to him. Toll, never let him guess what work we sent him to? Laurel, Laurel, yes, he did what we bade him do. Praise, and never a whispered hint, but the fight he fought was good. Never a word that the blood on his sword was his country's own heart's blood. A flag for the soldier's beer, who dies that his land may live. O oh, banners, banners here, that he doubt not nor misgive. That he heed not from the tomb, the evil days draw near, when the nation robed in gloom with its faithless past shall strive. Let him never dream that his bullet's scream went wide of its island mark, home to the heart of his sinning land, where she stumbled and sinned in the dark. William Vaughn Moody On February 15, 1899, General Ricardi's division of the Filipino army was encountered near Santa Ana and completely routed. It was at this battle that Lt. Charles E. Kilbourne, Jr. and Lt. W. G. Miles performed the exploits described in the following poems. The Ballad of Paco Town February 5, 1899 In Paco Town and in Paco Tower, at the height of the tropic noonday hour, some Tagal riflemen, half a score, watched the length of the highway o'er, and when to the front the troopers spurred, whiz, whiz, how the Mausers whirred. From the opposite walls through crevice and crack, volley on volley went ringing back, where a band of regulars tried to drive the stinging rebels out of their hive. Wait till our cannon come, and then, cried a captain, striding among his men, we'll settle that bothersome buzz and drone with a merry little tune of our own. The sweltering breezes seemed to swoon, and down the calle the thickening flames licked the roofs in the tropic noon, then through the crackle and glare and heat, and the smoke, and the answering acclaims of the rifles, far up the village street, was heard the clatter of horses' feet, and a band of signalmen swung in sight, hasting back from the ebbing fight that had swept away to the left and right. Ride, yelled the regulars, all aghast, and over the heads of the signal men they whirled in desperate gallop past, the bullets a vicious music made, like the whistle and whine of the midnight blast, on the weltering wastes of the ocean, when, 
the breast of the deep is scourged and flayed. Chanced in the line of the fiercest fire, a rebel bullet had clipped the wire that led from the front and the fighting down to those that stayed in Manila town. This gap arrested the watchful eye of one of the signalmen galloping by, and straight away out of the plunge and press he reined his horse with a swift caress. In a word in the ear of the rushing steed, then back with never a halt nor heed of the swarming bullets he rode, his goal, the parted wire and the slender pole that stood where the deadly tower looked down on the rack and ruin of Paco Town. Out of his saddle he sprang as gay as a schoolboy taking a holiday. Wire in hand up the pole he went, with never a glance at the tower, intent only on that which he saw appear as the line of his duty, plain and clear. To the very crest he climbed, and there, while the bullets buzzed in the scorching air, clipped his clothing and scored and stung the slender pole-top to which he tongue, made the wire that was severed sound, slipped in his careless way to the ground, sprang back to his horse, and then was off the bravest of signalmen. Cheers for the hero, while such as he, heedless alike of wounds and scars, fight for the dear old stripes and stars, down through the years to us shall be, ever and ever, the victory. Clinton Scollard The Deed of Lieutenant Miles February 5th, 1899 When you speak of dauntless deeds, when you tell of stirring scenes, Tell this story of the isles where the endless summer smiles, Tell of young Lieutenant Miles in the far-off Philippines. T'was the Santa Anna fight, all along the Tagal line, from the thickets dense and dire, gushed the fountains of their fire, you could mark the rifles' ire, you could hear their bullets whine. Little wonder there was pause, some were wounded, some were dead. Call Lieutenant Miles, he came, in his eyes a fearless flame, yonder blockhouse is our aim, the battalion leader said. You must take it how you will, you must break this damned spell. Volunteers, cried Miles, t'was vain, for that narrow tropic lane, twixt the bamboo and the cane, was the very lane of hell. There were five stood forth at last, God above, but they were men. Come, exultantly, he saith, did they falter? Not a breath. Down the path of hurtling death, the lieutenant led them then. Two have fallen, now a third, forward dash the other three, in the onward of that race, ne'er a swerve or stay of pace, and the Toggles, dare they face such desperate company. Panic gripped them by the throat, every Toggle rifleman, as though they seemed to see, in those charging foemen three, an avenging destiny, fierce and fast and far they ran. So a salvo for the six, so a sound of ringing cheers, Heroes of the distant isles, where the endless summer smiles, Gallant young Lieutenant Miles, and his valiant volunteers. Clinton Scollard So the war went on, with massacre, ambush, and lonely murder. The conquest of the islands was proving a costly one, but the administration held that it must be carried through at whatever sacrifice. It was a war in which victory and defeat alike brought only sorrow and disgust. Aguinaldo, Patriot and Empire When arms and numbers both have failed to make the hunted patriot yield, nor proffered riches have prevailed to tempt him to forsake the field, by spite and baffled rage beguiled, strike at his mother and his child. O land where freedom loved to dwell, which shooks the despot on his throne, and o'er the beating floods of hell hope's beacon to the world has shone. How art thou fallen from thy place, O thing of shame, O foul disgrace! Thy home was built upon the height, above the murky clouds beneath. In the blue heaven's freest light thy sword flashed ever from its sheath, the weak and oppressed to save, to smite the tyrant, free the slave. Thy place was glorious, sublime. What devil tempts thee to descend to conquest, robbery, and crime? O shameful fate, is this the end? Thy hands have now the damning stain of human blood for love of gain. 
with weak hypocrisy's thin veil, seek not in vain to bind thine eyes, nor shall deceitful prayers prevail, pray not, for fear the dead should rise. From neath their conquered countries sod, and cry against thee, unto God. Bertrand Shadwell The capture of Aguinaldo, March 23, 1901, put a virtual end to organized resistance though sporadic outbreaks continued for several years. As late as March 1906, such an affair occurred. A band of Moros, men, women, and children, being surrounded and killed on the summit of a crater at Dayo, no prisoners being taken. The Fight at Dayo March 7, 1906 There are twenty dead who are sleeping near the slopes of Bud Dayo. Near the shadow of the crater, where the bolos laid them low. And their comrades feel it bitter, and their cheeks grow hot with shame, when they read the sneering comments which have held them up to blame. They were told to scale the mountain, and they stormed its beetling crest, spite of all the frantic moros, though they did their level best, though the bullets whistled thickly, and the cliff was lined with foes, though the campolins were flashing, and the chris gave deadly blows. There was little time for judging, ere they met in deadly strife, what the sex might be that rushing waved aloft the blood-stained knife. For the foe was drunk with frenzy, and the women in the horde thought that paradise was certain if they kill first with the sword. They'd been freely offered mercy, but they'd scorned the proffered gift, for their priests had told them Allah promised victory sure and swift. They were foolish, and their folly cost the lives of wife and son. But they fought their fight like heroes. There were none that turned to run. Though they'd robbed and slain and ravaged, though their crimes had mounted high, though tis true that naught became them like the death they chose to die, one would think to read the papers that the troops who scaled their fort were a lot of brutal ruffians shooting girls and babes for sport. More than one who's sleeping soundly neath the shade of Bud Dayo, will lost his life while giving succor to the one who dealt the blow. Yet his comrades feel more bitter, and they give him far worse name, to the men who dubbed them butchers, and have smirched the army's fame. Alfred E. Wood The Philippines, meanwhile, had been placed under a civil government, but no promise was given them of ultimate independence. Their commerce was crippled by the high tariff party in control of Congress, and while their condition was vastly better than it had been under Spanish rule, it was not such as a republic, working for their good, might have made it. The acquisition and conquest of the islands is believed by many intelligent and patriotic persons to be one of the darkest blots upon American history. An Ode in Time of Hesitation written after seeing at Boston the statue of Robert Gould Shaw, killed while storming Fort Wagner, July 18, 1863, at the head of the 1st Enlisted Negro Regiment, the 54th Massachusetts. Before the living bronze St. Gaudens made, most fit to thrill the passer's heart with awe, and set here in this city's talk and trade to the good memory of Robert Shaw, this bright March morn I stand, and hear the distant spring come up the land, knowing that what I hear is not unheard of this boy soldier and his negro band. For all their gaze is fixed so stern ahead, for all the fatal rhythm of their tread, the hand they died to save from death and shame trembles and waits, hearing the spring's great name. And by her pangs these resolute ghosts are stirred. Through street and mall the tides of people go, heedless. The trees upon the common show no hint of green, but to my listening heart the still earth doth impart assurance of her jubilant emprise. And it is clear to my long-searching eyes that love at last has might upon the skies. The ice is runnelled on the little pond. A tell-tale patter drips from off the trees. The air is touched with Southland spiceries. As if but yesterday it tossed the frond Of pendant mosses where the live oaks grow, Beyond Virginia and the Carolines, Or had its will among the fruits and vines Of aromatic isles asleep, Beyond Florida 
in the Gulf of Mexico. Soon shall the Cape and children laugh in glee, spying the arbutus, spring's dear recluse. Hill lads at dawn shall hearken the wild goose, go honking northward over Tennessee. West from Oswego to Salt Sainte Marie, and on to where the pictured rocks are hung. And yonder where gigantic, willful, young, Chicago sitteth at the northwest gates, with restless, violent hands and casual tongue, molding her mighty fates. The lake shall robe them in ethereal sheen, and like a larger sea the vital green of springing wheat shall vastly be outflung over Dakota and the prairie states, by desert people immemorial. On Arizonan mesas shall be done dim rites unto the thunder and the sun, nor shall the primal gods lack sacrifice more splendid when the white Sierras call upon the Rockies straightway to arise and dance before the unveiled ark of the year, clashing their windy cedars as for shams, unrolling rivers clear, for flutter of broad phylacteries, while Shasta signals to Alaskan skies, that watch old sluggish glaciers downward creep, to fling their icebergs thundering from the steep, and Mariposa through the purple calms gazes at far Hawaii, crowned with palms, where east and west are met, a rich seal on the ocean's bosom set, to say that east and west are twain, with different loss and gain. The Lord hath sundered them, let them be sundered yet. Alas, what sounds are these that come suddenly over the Pacific seas? Sounds of ignoble battle, striking dumb, the season's half-awakened ecstasies. Must I be humble, then, now when my heart hath need of pride? Wild love falls on me from these sculptured men, by loving much the land for which they died, I would be justified. My spirit was away on pinions wide, to soothe and praise of her passionate mood, and ease it of its ache of gratitude. Too sorely heavy is the debt they lay on me and the companions of my day. I would remember now, my country's goodliness, make sweet her name, alas! What shade art thou, of sorrow or of blame, liftest the lyric leafage from her brow, and pointest a slow finger at her shame? Lies, lies, it cannot be, the wars we wage are noble, and our battles still are won by justice for us, ere we lift the gauge. We have not sold our loftiest heritage. The proud republic hath not stooped to cheat and scramble in the market-place of war. Her forehead weareth yet its solemn star. Here is her witness, this her perfect son, this delicate and proud New England soul, who leads despised men, with just unshackled feet, up the ways where death and glory meet, to show all peoples that our shame is done, that once more we are clean in spirit whole. Crouched in the sea-fog on the moaning sand, all night he lay, speaking some simple word, from hour to hour to the slow minds that heard, holding each poor life gently in his hands, and breathing on the base rejected clay, till each dark face shone mystical and grand against the breaking day. And lo, the shard the potter cast away was grown a fiery chalice, crystal fine, fulfilled of the divine, great wine of battle-wrath by God's ring-finger stirred. Then upward, where the shadowy bastion loomed, huge on the mountain in the wet sea-light, whence now, and now, infernal flowerage bloomed, bloomed, burst, and scattered down its deadly seed. They swept and died like freemen on the height, like freemen and like men of noble breed. And when the battle fell away at night, by hasty and contemptuous hands were thrust, obscurely, in a common grave with him, the fair-haired keeper of their love and trust. Now limb doth mingle with dissolved limb in nature's busy old democracy, to flush the mountain laurel when she blows, sweet by the southern sea. And heart with crumbled heart climbs in the rose, the untaught hearts with the high heart that knew this mountain fortress for no earthly hold of temporal quarrel, but the bastion old of spiritual wrong built by an unjust nation, sheer and strong, expungible but by a nation's rue, and bowing down before that equal shrine by all men held divine, whereof his band and he were the most holy sign. 
O oh, bitter, bitter shade! Wilt thou not put the scorn and instant tragic question from thine eyes? Do thy dark brows yet crave that swift and angry stave unmet for this desirous morn that I have striven, striven to evade? Gazing on him, must I not deem they err whose careless lips in street and shop aver as common tidings, deeds to make his cheek flush from the bronze and his dead throat to speak? Surely some elder singer would arise, whose harp hath leave to threaten and to moan. Above this people, when they go astray, is Whitman, the strong spirit, overthrown? Has Whittier put his yearning wrath away? I will not, and I dare not yet believe, though furtively the sunlight seems to grieve, and the spring-laden breeze out of the gladdening west is sinister, with sounds of nameless battle overseas. Though when we turn and question in suspense, if these things be indeed after these ways, and what things are to follow after these, our fluent men of place and consequence fumble and fill their mouths with hollow phrase. Or for the end all of deep arguments intone their dull commercial liturgies. I dare not yet believe. My ears are shut. I will not hear the thin satiric praise and muffled laughter of our enemies, bidding us never sheathe our valiant sword till we have changed our birthright for a gourd of wild pulse stolen from a barbarian's hut, showing how wise it is to cast away the symbols of our spiritual sway, so that our hands with better ease may wield the driver's whip and grasp the jailer's keys. Was it for this our fathers kept the law? This crown shall crown their struggle and their ruth. Are we the eagle nation Milton saw, mewing its mighty youth, soon to possess the mountain winds of truth, and be a swift familiar of the sun, where I before God's face his trumpets run? Or have we but the talons and the maw, and for the abject likeness of our heart shall some less lordly bird be set apart, some gross-billed wader where the swamps are fat, some gorger in the sun? some prowler with the bat. Ah, no, we have not fallen so. We are our father's sons, let those who lead us know. T'was only yesterday, sick Cuba's cry, came up the tropic wind, now help us, for we die. Then Alabama heard, and rising, pale, to Maine and Idaho, shouted a burning word. Proud state with proud impassioned state conferred, and the lifting of a hand sprang forth, east, west, and south, and north, beautiful armies, oh, by the sweet blood and young, shed on the awful hill slope at San Juan, by the unforgotten names of eager boys who might have tasted girls' love, and been stung with the old mystic joys, and starry griefs, now the spring nights come on. But that the heart of youth is generous, we charge you, ye who lead us, breathe on their chivalry no hint of stain. Turn not their new world victories to gain. One least leaf plucked for chaffer from the bays of their dear praise. One jot of their pure conquest but to hire. The implacable republic will require with clamor in the glaze and gaze of noon or subtly coming as a thief at night. But surely, very surely, slow or soon, that insult deep, we deeply will requite. Tempt not our weakness, our cupidity, for save, we let the island men go free, those baffled and dislaureled ghosts will curse us from the lamentable coasts where walk the frustrate dead. The cup of trembling shall be drained quite, eaten the sour bread of astonishment. With ashes of the hearth shall be made white our hair, and wailing shall be the tent then on your guiltier head shall our intolerable self-disdain wreak suddenly its anger and its pain, for manifest in that disastrous light we shall discern the right, and do it tardily. O ye who lead, take heed. Blindness we may forgive, but baseness we will smite. William Vaughan Moody End of Section 9 Chapter 6 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Pyle. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various Authors. Section 10. Chapter 6. The New Century. No country in the world entered upon the twentieth century with brighter prospects of peace, happiness, and prosperity than did the United States. A Toast to Our Native Land Huge and alert, irascible yet strong, we make our fitful way mid right and wrong. One time we pour out millions to be free, then rashly sweep an empire from the sea. One time we strike the shackles from the slaves, and then quiescent we are ruled by knaves. Often we rudely break restraining bars, and confidently reach out toward the stars. Yet under all there flows a hidden stream, sprung from the rock of freedom, the great dream of Washington and Franklin, men of old who knew that freedom is not bought with gold. This is the land we love, our heritage. Strange mixture of the gross and fine, yet sage and full of promise. Destined to be great. Drink to our native land. God bless the state. Robert Bridges But the very first year, a bolt from the blue fell upon her. In May 1901, a great industrial exposition, known as the Pan American, was opened at Buffalo, New York. It was especially notable for its electrical display and came to be known as the Dream City or the City of Light. Buffalo, 1901 A transient city, marvelously fair, humane, harmonious, yet nobly free. She built for pure delight and memory at her command by lake and garden rare, pylon and tower majestic rose in air, and sculptured forms of grace and symmetry. Then came a thought of God, and reverently, Let there be light, she said, and light was there. O oh, miracle of splendor! Who could know the crime, insensate, egoist, and blind, destructive, causeless, caring but to smite, would in its dull Sumerian gropings find a sudden way to fill those courts with woe and swallow up that radiance and night. Florence Earl Coates September 5th was set aside as President's Day. The attendance was very large, and President William McKinley spoke to an audience of 30,000 people. The next afternoon a reception was held, at which all were invited to pass in line and shake hands with the president. In the line was a man whose right hand was bandaged with a handkerchief. The handkerchief concealed a revolver. As the president stretched out his hand, the assassin fired twice, one bullet penetrating the president's abdomen. McKinley, September 6th, 1901 "'Tis not the president alone who, stricken by that bullet, fell. "'The assassin's shot that laid him prone "'pierced a great nation's heart as well. "'And when the baleful tidings sped from lip to lip throughout the crowd, "'then as they deemed their ruler dead, "'twas liberty that cried aloud. "'I, liberty, for where the foam of oceans twain marks out the coast, "'tis there in freedom's very home that anarchy has maimed its host. There tis that it has turned to bite the hand that fed it. There repaid a country's welcome with black spite. There Judas-like that land betrayed. For tis no despot that's laid low, but a free nation's chosen chief. A free man, stricken by a blow, based dastardly past all belief. And tyranny, exulting, hears the tidings flashed across the sea while stern repression hugs her fears and mouths them in a harsh decree. Meanwhile, as the cloud, though black as death, is lined with hopes, hopes light as life, and liberty, that scant of breath, had watched the issue of the strife, 
fills the glad air with grateful cries to find the sun no more obscured and with new yearnings in her eyes climbs to her watch-tower reassured london truth surgical aid was at hand it was found that the bullet had passed through the stomach both wounds were sewed up five days later the president was pronounced out of danger the next day he showed signs of a relapse and sank steadily until death came early on the morning of saturday september fourteenth faithful unto death september fourteenth nineteen o one his work is done his toil is o'er a martyr for our land he fell the land he loved that loved him well honor his name forevermore let all the world its tribute pay for glorious shall be his renown though duties was his only crown yet duty's path is glory's way for he was great without pretense a man of whom none whispered shame a man who knew nor guile nor blame good in his every influence on battlefield in council hall long years with sterling service rife he gave us and at last his life still unafraid at duty's call let the last solemn pageant move the nation's grief to consecrate to him struck down by maniac hate amid a mighty nation's love and though the thought its solace gives beside the martyr's grave to-day we feel tis almost hard to say god reigns and the republic lives richard hanfield titherton the comfort of the trees Gentle and generous, brave-hearted, kind, and full of love and trust was he, our chief. He never harmed a soul, oh, dull and blind and cruel, the hand that smote beyond belief. Strike him? It could not be. Soon should we find t'was but a torturing dream, our sudden grief. Then sobs and wailings down the northern wind, like the wild voice of shipwreck from a reef. By false hope lulled, his courage gave us hope. By day, by night, we watched until unfurled at last the word of fate. Our memories cherish one tender thought in their sad scope. He, looking from the window on this world, found comfort in the moving green of trees. Richard Watson Gilder Outward Bound Farewell for now, a stormy morn and dark. The hour of greeting and a parting brings. Already on the rising wind yon bark spreads her impatient wings. Too hasty keel, a little while delay, O moment tarry, O thou hurrying dawn, For long and sad will be the mourner's day, When their beloved is gone. But vain the hands that beckon from the shore, Alike our passion and our grief are vain. Behind him lies our little world, Before the illimitable main. Yet none the less, about his moving bed, Immortal eyes, a tireless vigil keep, an angel at the feet and at the head guard his untroubled sleep. Two nations bowed above a common bier, made one forever by a martyred son, one in their agony of hope and fear, and in their sorrow one. And thou, lone traveller of a waste so wide, the uncharted seas that all must pass in turn, may the same star that was so long thy guide o'er thy last voyage burn. No one can reach where through yon sombre veil that bark to its eternal haven fares. No earthly breezes swell its shadowy sail, only our love and prayers. Edward Sidney Tylee Theodore Roosevelt, Vice President, succeeded to the Presidency. The greatest project which the new administration undertook was the construction of a ship canal across the Isthmus of Panama, this enterprise had been agitated as early as 1826, and in 1879 a French company under Ferdinand de Lesseps had secured a concession from Colombia and started to work. At the end of ten years, the company had exhausted its resources and work ceased. Panama Here the oceans twain have waited, all the ages to be mated, waited long and waited vainly, though the script was written plainly. This, the portal of the sea, opes for him who holds the key. 
Here the empire of the earth waits impatient for its birth. But the Spanish monarch, dimly seeing little, answered grimly, North and south the land is Spain's, and God gave it, it remains. He who seeks to break the tie, by mine honor he shall die. So the centuries rolled it on, and the gift of great Calan, like a spendthrift's heritage, dwindled slowly, age by age, till the flag of red and gold fell from hands unnerved and old, and the granite pillared gate waited still the key of fate. Who shall hold that magic key but the child of destiny, in whose veins is mingled long all the best blood of the strong? He who takes his place by grace, of no single tribe or race, but by many a rich bequest from the bravest and the best. Sentinel of duty, here must he guard a hemisphere. Let the old world keep its ways, not to him its blame or praise, not its greed or hate or fear, for all swords be sheathed here. Yea, the gateway shall be free unto all from sea to sea, and no fratricidal slaughter shall defile its sacred water. But the hand that oped the gate shall forever hold the key. James Jeffrey Roche The United States was naturally looked to to carry on the project. The matter was brought before Congress, and in 1902 the French company was bought out for the sum of $40 million. The Republic of Panama was organized when Colombia hesitated over the concession, and control of the canal route was thus secured. Darien A.D. 1513 to A.D. 1901 The American Senate has ratified the Isthmus Treaty. Washington Telegram Silent upon a peak in Darien the Spanish steel red in his conquering hand, while golden, green, and gracious the vast land of that new world comes sudden into kin, stands Nunez de Balboa. North and south he sees at last the full Pacific roll, in blue and silver on each shelf and shoal, and the white bar of the broad river's mouth and the long-ranked palm trees. Queen of heaven, he cried, today thou givest me this for all my pain. And I, the glorious Girdon, give to Spain a new earth and a new sea to be her pride, war ground, and treasure house. And while he spoke, the world's heart knew a mightier dawn was broke. Silent upon a peak in Darien, four hundred years being fled, a greater stood on that same height, and did behold the flood of blue waves leaping, mother of all men, wise nature. And she spake the gift I gave to Nunez de Balboa could not keep Spain from her sins. Now must the ages sweep to larger legend. Though her own was brave, here on this ridge I do foresee fresh birth. That which departed shall bring side by side, the sea shall sever what hills did divide, shall link in love. And there was joy on earth. Whilst England and Columbia, quitting fear, kissed and let in the eager waters there. Edwin Arnold Panama, home of the dove plant or holy ghost flower. What time the Lord drew back the sea and gave thee room, slight Panama? I will not have thee great, said he, but thou shalt bear the slender key. Of both the gates I builded me, and all the great shall come to thee for leave to pass, O Panama. Flower of the Holy Ghost, white dove, breathe sweetness where he wrought in love. His oceans call across the land. How long, how long, fair Panama, wilt thou the shocks of tides withstand, nor heed us sobbing by the strand? Set wide thy gates on either hand, that we may search through saltless sand, may clasp and kiss, O Panama. Flower of the deep embosomed dove, so should his mighty nations love. Out peal his holy temple clocks. It is thine hour, glad Panama. Now shall thy key undo the locks. The strong shall cleave thy sunken rocks, Swung loose and floating from their docks. The world's white fleet shall come in flocks To thread thy straits, O Panama. Flower of the tropics, snowy dove, Forbid unless they come in love. How beautiful is thy domain! Search out thy wealth, proud Panama. 
thy gold thy pearls of silver sheath thy fruitful palms thy thickets green load thou the ships that ride between attire thee as becomes a queen the great ones greet thee panama flower of the white and peaceful dove let all men pass who come in love amanda t jones a working organization was perfected improved machinery got into place and when in the fall of nineteen o six president roosevelt visited the isthmus he found the dirt flying in a most satisfactory way the canal was finally opened to commerce in april nineteen sixteen a song of panama nineteen o six chuff 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 and a mountain bluff is moved by the shovel's song chuff 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 oh the grade is rough a liftin the landscape along we are ants upon a mountain but we're leaving of our dent and our teeth marks bitin scenery they will show the way we went we're a liftin half creation and we're changin it around just to suit our playful purpose when we're diggin in the ground chuff 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 oh the grade is rough and the way to the sea is long chuff 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 and the engines puff in tune to the shovel's song we're a shiftin miles like inches and we grab a forest here just to switch it over yonder so's to leave an angle clear we're pushin leagues of swamps aside so's we can hurry by and if we had to do it we would probably switch the sky chuff 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 oh it's hard enough when you're changin a job gone wrong chuff 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 and there's no rebuff to the shovel a singin its song you hears it in the morning and you hears it late at night it's our battery keep in action with support of dynamite oh you gets it for your dinner and the scenery skips along in a movin panorama to the chargin shovel's song chuff 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 and it grabs the scruff of a hill and boosts it along chuff 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 oh the grade is rough but it gives to the shovel's song this is a fight that's fightin and the battle's to the death there ain't no stoppin here to rest or even catch your breath you ain't no noble hero and you leave no gallant name you're a fightin nature's army and it ain't no easy game chuff 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 oh the grade is rough and the way to the end is long chuff 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 and the engines puff as we lift the landscape along alfred damon runyon in 1904 an industrial exposition to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the purchase of louisiana from france was held at st louis and was attended by millions of people the official hymn was written by Edmund Clarence Stedman, and was sung on the opening day by a chorus of five hundred voices. Hymn of the West O thou whose glorious orbs on high engird the earth with splendor round, from out thy secret place draw nigh the courts and temples of this ground. Eternal light, fill with thy might these domes that in thy purpose grew, and lift a nation's heart anew illumine thou each pathway here to show the marvels god hath wrought since first thy people's chief and seer looked up with that prophetic thought bade time unroll the faithful scroll and empire unto freedom gave from cloudland height to tropic wave poured through the gateways of the north thy mighty rivers joined their tide and on the wings of morn set forth their mists to the far-off peaks divide by thee unsealed the mountains yield ores that the wealth of ophir shame and gems and rot of seven-hued flame lo through what years the soil hath lain at thine own time to give increase the greater and the lesser grain the ripening bowl the myriad fleece thy creatures graze appointed ways league after league across the land the ceaseless herds obey thy hand thou whose high archways shine most clear above the plenteous western plain thine ancient tribes from round the sphere to breathe its quickening air are fain and smiles the sun to see made one their brood throughout earth's greenest space land of the new and lordlier race edmund clarence stedman particularly noteworthy 
was the growing sentiment of friendship between England and America. Not so many years before, the two countries had seemed on the verge of war. But all such clouds had long since been swept away. Britannia to Columbia What is the voice I hear on the wind of the western sea? Sentinel, listen from out Cape Clear, and see what the voice may be. Tis a proud free people calling aloud to a people proud and free. And it says to them, Kinsmen, hail, we severed have been too long. Now let us have done with the worn-out tale, the tale of an ancient wrong. And our friendship last long as love doth last, and be stronger than death is strong. Answer them, sons of the self-same race and blood of the self-same clan. Let us speak with each other face to face, and answer as man to man. And loyally love and trust each other as none but free men can. Now fling them out to the breeze, shamrock, thistle, and rose, and the star-spangled banner unfurl with these a message to friends and foes, wherever the sails of peace are seen and wherever the war wind blows, a message to bond and thrall to wake, for wherever we come we twain, the throne of the tyrant shall rock and quake, and his menace be void in vain, for you are lords of a strong young land, and we are lords of the main. Yes, this is the voice of the bluff March gale. We severed have been too long, but now we have done with a worn-out tale, the tale of an ancient wrong, and our friendship shall last long as love doth last, and be stronger than death is strong. Alfred Austin Within the United States a similar change was taking place. The old sectional lines of north and south were being forgotten, and a new generation arose, and the proposal to return to the south her captured battle flags a proposal which, a few years before, had met with frenzied protests from fire-alarm patriots, received general and hearty approval. Those Rebel Flags, discussed by one of the Yanks. Shall we send back to the Johnnies their bunting, in token, from blue to the gray, that brothers in blood and good hunting shall be our new watchword today? In olden times, knights held it nightly, to return to brave foemen the sword. Will the stars and stripes gleam less brightly if the old rebel flags are restored? Call it sentiment, call it misguided, to fight to the death for a rag, yet trailed in the dust derided, the true soldier still loves his flag. Does love die and must honor perish when colors and causes are lost? Lives the soldier who ceases to cherish the bloodstains and valor they cost? Our battlefields, safe in the keeping of nature's kind, fostering care, are blooming, our heroes are sleeping, and peace broods perennial there. All over our land rings a story of loyalty fervent and true. One flag, and that flag is old glory, alike for the gray and the blue. Why cling to these moth-eaten banners? What glory or honor to gain, while the nation is shouting hosannas, uniting her sons to fight Spain? Time is ripe, and the harvest worth reaping. Send the Johnnies their flags F.O.B. Address to the care and safe keeping of that loyal old Reb Fitzhugh Lee. Yes, send back the Johnnies their bunting with greetings from blue to the gray. We are brothers in blood and good hunting is America's watchword today. John H. Jewett On February 24th, 1905, Congress directed that the flags be returned and they now rest in the capitals of the various southern states. The Song of the Flags, on their return to the States of the Confederacy, February 24, 1905. We love the wild clamor of battle, the crash of the musketry's rattle, the bugle and drum. We have drooped in the dust, long and lonely, the blades that flash joy are rust only, the far-rolling war music dumb. God rest the true souls in death lying, for whom overhead, proudly flying, we challenge the foe, the storm of the charge we have breasted, on the hearts of our dead we have rested, in the pride of a day long ago. Ah, surely the good of God's making shall answer both those past awaking and life's cry of pain. But we never more shall be tossing on surges of battle where crossing the swift-flying death-bearer's reign. Again in the wind we are streaming, again with the war-luster dreaming, the call of the shell. What gray heads look up to us sadly, 
are these the stern troopers who madly rode straight at the battery's hell nay more than the living have found us pale spectres of battle around us the gray line is dressed ye hear not but they who are bringing your symbols of honor are singing the song of death's bivouac rest blow forth on the south wind to greet us o star flag once eager to meet us when war lines were set go carry to far fields of glory the soul-stirring thrill of the story of days when in anger we met ah well that we hung in the churches in quiet where god the heart searches that under us met men heard through the murmur of praying the voice of the torn banner saying forgive but ah never forget s weir mitchell the territories of the west were clamoring for admission to statehood and finally in the summer of nineteen o six oklahoma and the indian territory were admitted as one state arizona and new mexico were offered joint statehood but the former refused to link her destinies with her sister territory arizona no beggar is she in the mighty hall where her bay crowned sisters wait no empty-handed pleader for the right of a free-born state no child with a child's insistence demanding a gilded toy but a fair-browed queenly woman strong to create or destroy wise for the need of the sons she has bred at the school where weaklings fail where cunning is less than manhood and deeds not words avail with the high unswerving purpose that measures and overcomes and the faith in the farthest vision that builded her hard-won homes link her in her clean proved fitness in her right to stand alone secure for whatever future in the strength that her past is won link her in her morning beauty with another however fair and open your jealous portal and bid her enter there with shackles on wrist and ankle and dust on her stately forehead and her proud eyes dim with weeping no bar your doors instead and seal them fast forever and seal them fast forever but let her go her way uncrowned if you will but unshackled to wait for a larger day ay let her go bare-handed bound with no grudging gift back to her own free spaces where her rock-ribbed mountains lift their walls like a sheltering fortress back to her house and blood and we of her blood will go our way and reckon your judgment good we will wait outside your sullen door till the stars you wear grow dim as the pale dawn stars that swim and fade o'er our mighty canyon's rim we will lift no hand for the beige ye wear nor covet your robes of state but ah by the skies above us all we will shame ye while we wait we will make ye the mold of an empire here in the land ye scorn while ye drowse and dream in your well-housed ease that states at your nod are born you have blotted your own beginnings and taught your sons to forget that ye did not spring fat fed and old from the powers that bear and beget but the while ye follow your smooth made roads to a fireside safe of fears shall come a voice from a land still young to sing in your age dulled ears the hero's song of a strife as fine as your father's fathers knew when they dared the rivers of unmapped wilds at the will of a bark canoe the song of the deed and the doing of the work still hot from the hand of the yoke of man laid friendly wise on the neck of a tameless land while your merchandise is weighing we will bit and bridle and rein the floods of the storm rock mountains and lead them down to the plain and the foam-ribbed dark-hued waters tired from that mighty race shall lie at the feet of palm and vine and know their appointed place and out of that subtle union desert and mountain flood shall be homes for a nation's choosing where no home else has stood we will match the gold of your minting with its mint stamp dulled and marred by the tears and blood that have stained it and the hands that have clutched you hard with the gold that no man has lied for the gold no woman has made the price of her truth and honor plying a shameless trade the clean pure gold of the mountains straight from the strong dark earth with no tang or taint upon it from the hour of its primal birth the trick of the money-changer shifting his coins as he wills ye may keep 
no christ was bartered for the wealth of our lavish hills yet we are a little people too weak for the cares of a state let us go our way when ye look again ye shall find us mayhap too great cities we lack and gutters where children snatch for bread numbers and hordes of starvelings toiling but never fed spare pains that would make us greater in the pattern that ye have set we hold to the larger measure of the men that ye forget the men who from trackless forests and prairies lone and far hewed out the land where ye sit at ease and grudge us our fair one star there yet be men my masters though the net that the trickster flings lies wide on the land to its bitter shame and his cunning parleyings have deafened the ears of justice that was blind and slow of old yet time the last great judge is not bought or bribed or sold and time in the race shall judge us not a league of trafficking men selling the trust of the people to barter it back again palming the lives of millions as a handful of easy coin with a single heart to the narrow verge where craft and statecraft join charlotte m hall on the morning of wednesday april eighteenth nineteen o six an appalling calamity visited california and especially the great city of san francisco at a few minutes past five o'clock a severe earthquake shock desolated the cities of the central coast region snuffed out hundreds of lives and destroyed millions of dollars worth of property san francisco april eighteenth nineteen o six such darkness as when jesus died then sudden dawn drave all before two wee brown tomtits terrified flashed through my open cottage door then instant out and off again and left a stillness like to pain such stillness darkness sudden dawn i never knew or looked upon this ardent occidental dawn dashed san francisco's streets with gold just gold and gold to walk upon as he of patmos sang of old and still so still her streets her steeps as when some great soul silent weeps and oh that gold that gold that lay beyond above the tarn brown bay and then a bolt a jolt a chill and mother earth seemed as afraid then instant all again was still save that my cattle from the shade where they had sought firm rooted clay came forth loud lowing glad and gay knee-deep in grasses to rejoice that all was well with trumpet voice not so yon city darkness dust then martial men in swift array then smoke then flames then great guns thrust to heaven as if pots of clay cathedral temple palace tower and hundred wars in one wild hour and still the smoke the flame the guns the piteous wail of little ones the mad flame climbed the costly steep but man defiant climbed the flame what battles where the torn clouds keep what deeds of glory in god's name what sons of giants giants yea of beardless lad or veteran gray not marathon nor waterloo knew men so daring dauntless true three days three nights three fearful days of death of flame of dynamite of god's house thrown a thousand ways blown east by day blown west by night by night there was no night nay nay the ghoulish flame lit nights that lay crouched down between this first last day i say those nights were burned away and jealousies were burned away and burned were city rivalries till all white cresseting the bay were one harmonious hive of bees behold the bravest battle won the city beautiful begun one solid san francisco won the fairest sight beneath the sun joaquin miller in san francisco fire followed the shock the water mains had been broken and the flames were soon utterly beyond control and raged for two days destroying the business and principal residence portions of the city an area of four square miles the loss of life reached a thousand the property lost three hundred million dollars san francisco who now dare longer trust thy mother hand so like thee thou hadst not another child the favorite flower of all thy western sand she looked up nature in thy face and smiled trustful of thee all happy in thy care 
She was thine alone, not to be lured away down joyless paths of men. Happy as fair, held to thy heart, that she was yesterday. Today the sea is sobbing her sweet name. She cannot answer, she that loved thee best, that clung to thee till hell's own shock and flame wrenched her, swept her from the forgetting breast. Days, darling, playmate of thy wind and sun, mother, what hast thou done? What hast thou done? John Vance Cheney The whole country rushed to the relief of the stricken state. The Californians met their losses bravely and started once to build a greater San Francisco. To San Francisco If we dream that we loved her aforetime, t'was the ghost of a dream. For I vow by the splendor of God in the highest, we never have loved her till now. When love bears the trumpet of honor, O oh, highest and clearest he calls, with the light of the flaming of towers and the sound of the rending of walls, when love wears the purple of sorrow and kneels at the altar of grief, of the flowers that spring in his footsteps, the white flower of service is chief. And as snow on the snow of her bosom, as a star in the night of her hair, we bring to our mother such token as the time and the elements spare. If we dream that we loved her aforetime, adoring we kneel to her now, when the golden fruit of the ages falls, swept by the wind from the bough. The beautiful dwelling is shattered, wherein, as a queen at the feast, in gems of the barbaric tropics and silks of the ultimate east, our mother sat throned and triumphant, with the wise and the great in their day. They were captains and princes and rulers, but she, she was greater than they. We are sprung from the builders of nations, by the souls of our fathers we swear. By the depths of the deeps that surround her, by the height of the heights she may dare. Though the twelve league in compact against her, though the sea gods cry out in their wrath, though the earth gods, grown drunk of their fury, fling the hilltops abroad in her path, our mother of masterful children shall sit on her throne as of yore, with her old robes of purple about her, and crowned with the crowns that she wore. She shall sit at the gates of the world, where the nation shall gather and meet, and the east and the west at her bidding shall lie in a leash at her feet. S. J. Alexander The regeneration was moral as well as physical, for not only was the town rebuilt, but it was rescued from the corrupt ring which for years had kept control of the city government. Research, San Francisco Behold her seven hills loom white, once more as marble builded Rome. Her marts teem with a touch of home, and music fills her halls at night. Her streets flow populous, and light floods every happy, hopeful face. The wheel of fortune whirls apace, and old time fair and dare holds sway. Farewell the blackened toppling wall, the bent steel gird, the somber pall. Farewell forever, let us pray. Farewell forever and a day. Joaquin Miller. On June 24, 1908, Grover Cleveland, twice President of the United States, died at his home in Princeton, New Jersey, at the age of 71. His death called forth a remarkable tribute from men of all parties and in all walks of life, a tribute to his stainless service of the state, to his honesty, courage, and fidelity. Lowell had called him the most typical American since Lincoln. Grover Cleveland, 1837 to 1908. Bring Cypress, Rosemary, and Rue, for him who kept his rudder true, who held to right the people's will, and for whose foes we love him still. A man of Plutarch's marble mold, a virtue strong and manifold, who spurned the incense of the hour, and made the nation's wheel his dower. His sturdy, rugged sense of right put selfish purpose out of sight. Slowly he thought, but long and well, with temper imperturbable. Bring Cypress, Rosemary, and Rue, for him who kept his rudder true, who went at dawn to that high star, where Washington and Lincoln are. Joel Benton 
One feature of the country's growth has awakened great uneasiness. Over a million immigrants had been landing every year upon her shores, and the feeling has grown that America must cease to be an asylum for the ignorance and vice of Europe. Unguarded Gates Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, named of the four winds, north, south, east, and west, portals that lead to an enchanted land of cities, forests, fields of living gold, vast prairies, lordly summits touched with snow, majestic rivers sweeping proudly past the Arab's date palm and the Norseman's pine. A realm wherein are fruits of every zone, heirs of all climes, for lo, throughout the year, the red rose blossoms somewhere. A rich land, a later Eden, planted in the wilds, with not an inch of earth within its bound. But a slave's foot press, it sets him free. Here it is written, toil shall have its wage, and honor, honor, and the humblest man shall level with the highest in the law. Of such a land have men in dungeons dreamed, and with the vision brightening in their eyes, gone smiling to the faggot and the sword. Wide open and unguarded stand our gates, and through them presses a wild, motley throng, men from the Volga and the Tartar steppes, featureless figures of the Hong Ho, Malayan, Scythian, Teuton, Celt, and Slav, flying the old world's poverty and scorn, these bringing with them unknown gods and rites, those tiger passions here to stretch their claws in street and alley, what strange tongues are loud, accents of menace alien to our air, voices that once the Tower of Babel knew. O oh, liberty, white goddess, is it well to leave the gates unguarded? On thy breast fold sorrow's children, soothe the hurts of fate, lift the downtrodden but with hands of steel, stay those who to thy sacred portals come to waste the gifts of freedom. Have a care, lest from thy brow the clustered stars be torn and trampled in the dust. For so of old the thronging Goth and Vandal trampled Rome, and where the temples of the Caesars stood, the lean wolf unmolested made her lair. Thomas Bailey Aldrich The first decade of the new century has witnessed a long stride forward toward better government. State and nation have asserted the right to regulate railroad rates, to abolish gambling, to supervise the sale of poisons and intoxicants, to protect the people from impure food, from quackery and swindling, and to break up combinations in restraint of trade. National Song America, my own, thy spacious grandeurs rise, faming the proudest zone, pavilioned by the skies. Day's flying glory breaks thy vales and mountains o'er, And gilds thy streams and lakes from ocean shore to shore. Praised be thy wood and wold, thy corn and wine and flocks, The yellow blood of gold drained from thy canyon rocks, Thy trains that shake the land, thy ships that plough the main, Triumphant cities grand, roaring with noise of gain. Earth's races look to thee. The peoples of the world thy risen splendors see, and thy wide flag unfurled. Thy sons in peace of war that emblem, who beheld, bless every shining star, cheer every streaming fold. Float high, O gallant flag, o'er Carib Isles of Palm, o'er bleak Alaskan crag, o'er far-off lone Guam, where Mauna Loa pours black thunder from the deeps. O'er Mindanao's shores, o'er Luzon's coral steeps. Float high and be the sign of love and brotherhood, The pledge by right divine of power to do good, For I and everywhere on continent and wave, Are omnipotent to dare, imperial to save. William Henry Venable Especially significant has been the awakening of the public conscience, the growing intolerance of corruption in office, the demand for honesty in public as in private life, and the realization of the fact that the great public service corporations are accountable to the people and amenable to law. Ad Patrium To deities of gods and gold, land of our fathers do not bow, but unto these beloved of old, 
bend thou the brow. Austere they were of front and form, rigid as iron in their aim. Yet in them pulsed a blood as warm and pure as flame. Honor, whose foster child is truth, unselfishness in place and plan, justice with melting heart of ruth, and faith in man. Give these our worship, then no fears of future foes need fight thy soul. Triumphant thou shall mount the years toward thy high goal. Clinton Scollard O Land Beloved from My Country O land beloved, my country dear, my own, May the young heart that moved for the weak words atone. The mighty lyre not mine, nor the full breath of song. To happier sons shall these belong, Yet doth the first and lonely voice of the dark dawn the heart rejoice. While still the loud choir sleeps upon the bough, And never greater love salutes thy brow than his who seeks thee now. Alien the sea and salt the foam, wherever it bears him from his home, and when he leaps to land, a lover treads the strand. Precious is every stone, no little inch of all the broad domain, but he would stoop to kiss and end his pain. Feeling thy lips make merry with his own, but oh, his trembling reed too frail, to bear thee times all hail. Faint is my heart, and ebbing with the passion of thy praise. The poets come who cannot fail. Happy are they who sing thy pretty days. Happy am I who see the long night ended in the shadows of the age that bore me, all the hopes of mankind blending, earth awaking, heaven descending. While the new day steadfastly domes the blue deeps over thee, happy am I who see the vision splendid in the glowing of the dawn before me, all the grace of heaven, Blending, man arising, Christ descending, while God's hand in secrecy builds thy bright eternity. George Edward Woodbury. So America faces the future unafraid, confident that her problems will be wisely solved, that a splendid destiny awaits her, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. THE REPUBLIC FROM THE BUILDING OF THE SHIP Thou too sail on, O ship of state, sail on, O union, strong and great. Humanity with all its fears, with all the hopes of future years, is hanging breathless on thy fate. We know what master laid thy keel, what workman wrought thy ribs of steel, who made each mast and sail and rope, what anvils rang, what hammers beat, in what a forge and what a heat were shaped the anchors of thy hope. Fear not each sudden sound and shock, tis of the wave and not the rock, tis but the flapping of the sail, and not a rent made by the gale. In spite of rock and tempest roar, in spite of false lights on the shore, sail on nor fear to breast the sea, our hopes, our hopes are all with thee. Our hopes, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant o'er our fears, are all with thee, are all with thee. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. End of section 10. Recording by Chris Pyle. Chapter 11 of Poems of American History, Volume 5 The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Section 11. For generations, Americans had been taught by the provincially minded to glory in their splendid isolation. But the more discerning perceived that steam and electricity were making the world smaller and smaller, and that economic causes were drawing its nations more and more closely together. They perceived, too, that the democratic theory of government to which America was consecrated had two staunch champions in Western Europe, France and England, and two implacable enemies, Germany and Austria. And when, on August 1, 1914, the rulers of these two empires decreed the war which they hoped would lead to world power, many Americans felt most keenly that their country's place was by the side of France and England, in their battle for human freedom. 
Sonnets written in the fall of 1914. Awake, ye nations, slumbering supine, who round and ring the European fray. Heard ye the trumpet sound, the day, the day, the last that shall on England's empire shine? The parliament that broke the right divine shall see her realm of reason swept away, and lesser nations shall the sword obey. The sword o'er all carved the great world's design. So on the English channel boasts the foe on whose imperial brow death's helmet nods, Look where his hosts or bloody Belgium go, and nix a nation's past with blazing sods. A kingdom's waste, a people's homeless woe, man's broken word, and violated gods. Far fall the day when England's realm shall see the sunset of dominion. Her increase abolishes the man-dividing seas, and frames the brotherhood on earth to be. She, in free peoples planting sovereignty, orbs half the civil world in British peace. And though time dispossess her and she cease, Rome-like she greatens in man's memory. O oh, many a crown shall sink in war's turmoil, and many a new republic light the sky. Fleets sweep the ocean, nations till the soil. Genius be born, and generations die. Orient and Occident together toil, ere such a mighty work man rears on high. Hearken the feet of the destroyer tread the winepress of the nations, fast the blood pours from the side of Europe. In full flood on the septentrional watershed the rivers of fair France are running red. England, the mother airy of our brood, that on the summit of dominion stood, shakes in the blast, heaven battles overhead. Lift up thy head, O reams of ages air that treasured up in thee their glorious sum, upon whose brow prophetically fair flamed the great morrow of the world to come. Haunt with thy beauty this volcanic air, ere yet thou close, O flower of Christendom. As when the shadow of the sun's eclipse sweeps on the earth and spreads a spectral air, as if the universe were dying there, on continent and isle the darkness dips, unwanted gloom, and on the Atlantic slips. So in the night the Belgian cities flare horizon wide, the wandering people fare along the roads and load the fleeing ships, and westward borne that planetary sweep, darkening o'er England and her times to be, already steps upon the ocean deep. Watch well, my country, that unearthly sea, lest when thou thinkest not, and in thy sleep, unapt for war, that gloom and shadow thee. George Edward Woodbury American opinion was especially aroused by Germany's cynical disregard of her pledge to preserve the neutrality of Belgium, and by the outrages which crimsoned every step of the invasion of that little kingdom. Abraham Lincoln walks at midnight in Springfield, Illinois. It is portentous, and a thing of state, that here at midnight, in our little town, a morning figure walks and will not rest, near the old courthouse, pacing up and down. Or by his homestead, or in shadowed yards, he lingers where his children used to play. Or through the market, on the well-worn stones, he stalks until the dawn stars burn away. A bronzed lank man, his suit of ancient black, a famous high top hat and plain worn shawl, make him the quaint great figure that men love the prairie lawyer, master of us all. He cannot sleep upon his hillside now. He is among us as in times before. And we who toss and lie awake for long breathe deep and start to see him pass the door. His head is bowed, he thinks on men and kings. Yea, when the sick world cries, how can he sleep? Too many peasants fight, they know not why. Too many homesteads in black terror weep. The sins of all the warlords burn his heart. He sees the dreadnought scouring every main. He carries on his shawl-wrapped shoulders now the bitterness, the folly, and the pain. He cannot rest until a spirit dawn shall come, the shining hope of Europe free, the league of sober folk, the worker's earth bringing long peace to cornland, alp, and sea. It breaks his heart that kings must murder still, that all his hours of travail here for men seem yet in vain. And who will bring white peace that he may sleep upon his hill again? Beshel Lindsay. On sea as well as on land, the same policy of frightfulness was followed, and German submarines and raiders, finding it dangerous to attack British battleships, turned their attention to unarmed merchantmen. On February 28, 1915, an American vessel, the William P. Fry, carrying wheat from Seattle to Queenstown, was sunk by a German raider in the South Atlantic. The William P. Fry, February 28, 1915. 
I saw her first abreast the Boston light at anchor. She had just come in, turned head, and sent her hawsers creaking, clattering down. I was so near to where the hawse pipes fed the cable out from her careening bow. I moved up on the swell, shut steam, and lay hove to in my old launch to look at her. She'd come in light, a skimming up the bay lake, a white ghost with topsails bellying full, and all her noble lines from bow to stern made music in the wind. It seemed she rode the morning air like those thin clouds that turn into tall ships when sunrise lifts the clouds from calm sea courses. There in smoke-smudged coats lay funneled liners, dirty fishing craft, blunt cargo luggers, tugs, and ferry boats. Oh, it was good in that black scuttled lot to see the fry come lording on her way like some old queen that we had half forgot come to her own. A little up the bay the fort lay green, for it was springtime then. The wind was fresh, rich with the spicy bloom of the New England coast that tardily escapes, late April, from an icy tomb. The state house glittered on old Beacon Hill, gold in the sun. T'was all so fair a while. But she was fairest, this great square-rigged ship that had blown in from some far happy isle, or from the shores of the Hesperides. They caught her in a South Atlantic road, becalmed, and found her hold brimmed up with wheat. Wheat's contraband, they said, and blew her hull to pieces, murdered one of our staunch fleet, fast dwindling of the big old sailing ships that carry trade for us on the high sea, and warped out of each harbor in the States. It wasn't law, so it seemed strange to me, a big mistake. Her keels struck bottom now, and her foremast sunk fathoms, fathoms deep to Davy Jones. The dank seaweed will root on her oozed decks, and the cross surges sweep through the set sails. But never, never more her crew will stand away to brace and trim, nor sea-blown petrels meet her thrashing up to windward on the Gulf Stream's stormy rim. Never again shall head a northeast gale, or like a spirit loom up sliding dumb, and ride in safe beyond the Boston light, to make the harbor glad, because she's come. Jean Robert Foster The crowning outrage came on May 7, 1915, when the great Cunard steamship Lusitania was torpedoed without warning off the coast of Ireland, and 1,153 men, women, and children drowned. Of these, 114 were Americans. The White Ships and the Red, May 7, 1915. With drooping sail and pennant that never a wind may reach, they float in sunless waters beside a sunless beach. Their mighty masts and funnels are white as driven snow, and with a pallid radiance their ghostly bulwarks glow. Here is a Spanish galleon that once with gold was gay. Here is a Roman trireme whose hues outshone the day. But Tyrian dyes have faded, and prows that once were bright with rainbow stains were only death's livid dreadful white. White as the ice that clove her that unforgotten day, among her pallid sisters the grim Titanic lay. And through the leagues above her she looked aghast and said, what is this living ship that comes where every ship is dead? The ghostly vessels trembled from ruined stern to prow. What was this thing of terror that broke their vigil now? Down through the startled ocean a mighty vessel came, not white as all dead ships must be, but red like living flame. The pale green waves about her were swiftly strangely dyed by the great scarlet stream that flowed from out her wounded side and all her decks were scarlet, and all her shattered crew. She sank among the white ghost ships, and stained them through and through. The grim Titanic greeted her, and who art thou, she said? Why dost thou join our ghostly fleet, arrayed in living red? We are the ships of sorrow who spend the weary night, until the dawn of judgment day, obscure and still and white. Nay, said the scarlet visitor, though I sink through the sea, a ruined thing that was a ship, I sink not as did ye. For ye met with your destiny by storm or rock or fight, so through the lagging centuries ye wear your robes of white. But never crashing iceberg nor honest shot of foe, nor hidden reef has sent me the way that I must go. My wound that stains the waters, my blood that is like flame, bear witness to a loathly deed, a deed without a name. I went not forth to battle, I carried friendly men. The children played about my decks, the women sang, and then... And then the sun blushed scarlet, and heaven hid its face. The world that God created became a shameful place. My wrong cries out for vengeance. The blow that sent me here was aimed in hell. My dying scream has reached Jehovah's ear. 
not all the seven oceans shall wash away that stain upon a brow that wears a crown i am the brand of cain when god's great voice assembles the fleet on judgment day the ghosts of ruined ships will rise in sea and strait and bay though they have lain for ages beneath the changeless flood they shall be white as silver but one shall be like blood joyce kilmer no event since the sinking of the main in havana harbor had so stirred the country with rage and horror the contention of the germans that they were fighting for the freedom of the seas was indignantly scouted mare liberum you dare to say with perjured lips we fight to make the ocean free you whose black trail of butchered ships bestrews the bed of every sea where german submarines have wrought their horrors have you never thought what you call freedom men call piracy unnumbered ghosts that haunt the wave where you have murdered cry you down and seamen whom you would not save weave now in weed-grown depths a crown of shame for your imperious head a dark memorial of the dead women and children whom you sent to drown nay not till thieves are set to guard the gold and corsairs called to keep or peaceful commerce watch and ward and wolves to herd the helpless sheep shall men and women look to thee thou ruthless old man of the sea to safeguard law and freedom on the deep in nobler breeds we put our trust the nations in whose sacred lore the ought stands out above the must and honor rules in peace and war with these we hold in soul and heart with these we choose our lot and part till liberty is safe on sea and shore henry van dyke president woodrow wilson warned germany that the united states could not stand idly by in the event of further contemptuous disregard of american rights and germany promised to restrict her submarine warfare but a great portion of the country felt there was already more than sufficient cause for war and many americans entered the french aviation corps and foreign legion or went to canada and enlisted there in order to take their stand at once beside the nations which were battling for human liberty ode in memory of the american volunteers fallen for france to have been read before the statue of lafayette in washington in paris on decoration day may thirty nineteen sixteen one ay it is fitting on this holiday commemorative of our soldier dead when with sweet flowers of our new england may hiding the lichened stones by fifty years made gray their graves in every town are garlanded that pious tribute should be given too to our intrepid few obscurely fallen here beyond the seas those to preserve their country's greatness died but by the death of these something that we can look upon with pride has been achieved nor wholly unreplied can sneers triumph in the charge they make that from a war where freedom was at stake america withheld and daunted stood aside two be they remembered here with each reviving spring not only that in may when life is loveliest around neville saint vast and the disputed crest of vigny they superb unfaltering in that fine onslaught that no fire could halt parted impetuous to their first assault but they that brought fresh hearts and spring-like too to that high mission and tis meet to strew with twigs of lilac and spring's earliest rose the cenotaph of those who in the cause that history most endears fell in the sunny morn and flower of their young years three yet sought they neither recompense nor praise nor to be mentioned in another breath than their blue-coated comrades whose great days it was their pride to share ay share even to the death nay rather france to you they rendered thanks seeing they came for honour not for gain who opening to them your glorious ranks gave them that grand occasion to excel that chance to live the life most free from stain and that rare privilege of dying well four o oh, friends i know not since that war began from which no people nobly stands aloof if in all moments we have given proof of virtues that were thought american i know not if in all things done and said all has been well and good or if each one of us can hold his head as proudly as he should or from the pattern of those mighty dead whose shades our country venerates to-day if we've not somewhat fallen and somewhat gone astray but you to whom our land's good name is dear if there be any here who wonder if her manhood be decreased relaxed its sinews and its blood less red than at shiloh and antietam shed be proud of these have joy in this at least and cry now heaven be praised that in that hour that most imperiled her menaced her liberty who foremost raised europe's bright flag of freedom some there were who not unmindful of the antique debt 
came back the generous path of Lafayette, and when of a most formidable foe she checked each onset, arduous to stem, foiled and frustrated them. On these red fields, where blow with furious blow was countered, whether the gigantic fray rolled by the news or at the bois sabot, accents of ours were in the fierce melee, and on that furthest rim of hallowed ground where the forlorn, the gallant charge expires, when the slain bugler has long ceased to sound, and on the tangled wires the last wild rally staggers, crumbles, stops, withered beneath the shrapnel's iron showers. Now heaven be thanked we gave a few brave drops, now heaven be thanked a few brave drops were ours. 5. There, holding still in frozen steadfastness, their bayonets toward the beckoning frontiers, they lie, our comrades, lie among their peers, clad in the glory of fallen warriors, grim clusters under thorny trellises, dry, furthest foam upon disastrous shores, leaves that made last year beautiful still strewn even as they fell, unchanged beneath the changing moon. And earth in her divine indifference rolls on, and many paltry things and mean prate to be heard and caper to be seen. But they are silent, calm, their eloquence is that incomparable attitude. No human presences their witness are, but summer clouds and sunset crimson hued, and showers and night winds and the northern star. Nay, even our salutations seem profane, opposed to their Elysian quietude. Our salutations coming from afar, from our ignobler plane, and undistinction of our lesser parts. Hail, brothers, and farewell. You are twice blessed, brave hearts. Double your glory is who perished thus, for you have died for France and vindicated us. Alan Seeger Germany lived up to her agreement only in partial and grudging fashion, and the climax came on January 31, 1917, when the German government announced that an unrestricted submarine warfare against all ships encountered on the seas would begin next day. President Wilson at once handed the German ambassador his passports, and on April 2, after the sinking of three American ships without warning, appeared before Congress and asked that war be declared. After 13 hours of debate, the Senate passed the necessary resolution. The House concurred on April 5, and the next day the President issued a proclamation declaring that a state of war exists between the United States and the Imperial German government. Republic to Republic 1776 to 1917. France, it is I answering, America, and it shall be remembered not only in our lips but in our hearts, and shall awaken forever familiar and new as the morning that we were the first of all lands to be lovers, to run to each other with the incredible cry of recognition, bound by no ties of nearness or of knowledge, but of the nearness of the heart. You chose me then, and so I choose you now by the same nearness, and the name you called me then I call you now, O Liberty, my love. Witter Binner The Entente powers welcomed their new ally with bursting hearts, for a decisive victory, which was becoming more and more hopeless, now seemed assured. To the United States of America Brothers in blood, they who this wrong began to wreck our commonwealth will rue the day when first they challenged freemen to the fray and when the Briton dared the American. Now we are pledged to win the rights of man. Labor and justice now shall have their way, and in a league of peace God grant we may transform the earth, not patch up the old plan. Sure is our hope, since he who led your nation spake for mankind, and ye arose in awe of that high call to work the world's salvation. Clearing your minds of all estranging blindness in the vision of beauty and the Spirit's law, Freedom and Honor and Sweet Loving Kindness. Robert Bridges One of the first acts of the government was to seize all enemy ships in American ports, which, of course, included Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. These were at once overhauled and put into service under American command. The Captive Ships at Manila Our keels are furred with tropic weed that clogs the crawling tides, and scarred with crust of salt and rust that gnaws our idle sides and little junks they come and go, and ships they sail at dawn, and all the outbound winds that blow they call us to be gone, as yearning to the lifting seas our gaunt flotilla rides, drifting aimless to and fro, sport of every wind a-blow, swinging to the ebb and flow of lazy tropic tides. And once we knew the clean seaways to sail them pridefully, 
and once we met the clean sea winds and gave them greeting free and honest craft they spoke us fair who'd scorn to speak us now and little craft they'd not beware to cross a german bow when yet the flag of germany had honour on the sea and now of all that seaward fair what ship of any port is there but would dip her flag to a black corsair ere she'd signal such as we yet we are ribbed with norseland steel and fleshed with viking pine that's fashioned of the soil which bred the hosts of charlemagne and clad we are with rusting pride of stays and links and plates that lay within the mountain side where barbarossa waits the mighty frederick thralled in sleep held by the ancient sign while yet the ravens circle wide above that guarded mountain side full fed with carrion from the tide of swinish red rapine oh we have known the german men when german men were true and we have borne the german flag when honour was her due but sick we are of honest scorn from honest merchantmen the winds they call us to be gone down to the seas again down to the seas where waves lift white and gulls they shear in the blue shriven clean of our blood-bought scorn by a foeman's flag i proudly borne cleaving out in the good red dawn out again to the blue dorothy paul every effort was bent toward getting an army into the field in the shortest possible time general john j pershing was appointed to command the american expeditionary forces and started for france the national guard was mobilized volunteers called for and the first division of regulars was loaded on transports and on june fourteenth headed out to sea the road to france thank god our liberating lance goes flaming on the way to france to france the trail the gurkhas found to france old england's rallying ground to france the path the russians strode to france the anzac's glory road to france where our lost legion ran to fight and die for god and man to france with every race and breed that hates oppression's brutal creed ah france how could our hearts forget the path by which came lafayette how could the haze of doubt hang low upon the road of rochambeau at last thank god at last we see there is no tribal liberty no beacon lighting just our shores no freedom guarding but our doors the flame she kindled for our sires burns now in europe's battle fires the soul that led our fathers west turns back to free the world's oppressed allies you have not called in vain we share your conflict and your pain old glory through new stains and rents partakes of freedom's sacraments into that hell his will creates we drive the foe his lusts his hates last come we will be the last to stay till right has had her crowning day replenish comrades from our veins the blood the sword of despot drains and make our eager sacrifice part of the freely rendered price you pay to lift humanity you pay to make our brothers free see with what proud hearts we advance to france daniel henderson general pershing with his staff reached england early in june and crossed to france a few days later on the fourth of july a parade of american troops took place in paris proceeding to the picpus cemetery where general pershing placed a wreath on the tomb of lafayette legend has it that he said simply lafayette we are here pershing at the tomb of lafayette july fourth nineteen seventeen they knew they were fighting our war as the months grew to years their men and their women had watched through their blood and their tears for a sign that we knew we who could not have come to be free without france long ago and at last from the threatening sea the stars of our strength on the eyes of their weariness rose and he stood among them the sorrow-strong hero we chose to carry our flag to the tomb of the frenchman whose name a man of our country could once more pronounce without shame what crown of rich words would he set for all time on this day the past and the future were listening what he would say only this from the white flaming heart of a passion austere only this ah but france understood lafayette we are here amelia josephine burr an army of at least two million men was needed at once to secure it with the least possible disturbance of the country's economic life congress passed a bill providing for a selective draft of all men between twenty-one and thirty great training camps were built and by september the training of the national army was in full swing while the national guard regiments which had already had some training were started on their way to france your lad and my lad 
down toward the deep blue water marching to throb of drum from city street and country lane the lines of khaki come the rumbling guns the sturdy tread are full of grim appeal while rays of western sunshine flash back from burnished steel with eager eyes and cheeks aflame the serried ranks advance and your dear lad and my dear lad are on their way to france a sob clings choking in the throat as file on file sweep by between those cheering multitudes to where the great ships lie the batteries halt the columns wheel to clear-toned bugle call with shoulders squared and faces front they stand a khaki wall tears shine on every watcher's cheek love speaks in every glance for your dear lad and my dear lad are on their way to france before them through the mist of years in soldier buff or blue brave comrades from a thousand fields watch now in proud review the same old flag the same old faith the freedom of the world spells duty in those flapping folds above long ranks unfurled strong are the hearts which bear along democracy's advance as your dear lad and my dear lad go on their way to france the word rings out a million feet tramp forward on the road along that path of sacrifice o'er which their fathers strode with eager eyes and cheeks aflame with cheers on smiling lips these fighting men of seventeen move onward to their ships nor even love may hold them back or halt that stern advance as your dear lad and my dear lad go on their way to france randall parrish germany had boasted that we could never get an army to europe past her submarines but so efficient was the system of protection worked out by the navy that only one loaded transport was sunk early in february nineteen eighteen the Tuscania, carrying 2,179 American soldiers, was torpedoed off the north coast of Ireland. British destroyers rescued all but about 200 before the ship sank. Nearly all the bodies were washed ashore and were tenderly buried. A Call to Arms, February 5, 1918 It is I, America, calling, above the sound of rivers falling, above the whir of the wheels and the chime of the bells in the steeple, wheels rolling gold into the palms of the people bells ringing silverly clear and slow to church-going leisurely steps on pavements below above all familiar sounds of the life of a nation i shout to you a name and the flame of that name is sped like fire into hearts where blood runs red the hearts of the land burn hot to the land's salvation as i call across the long miles as i america call to my nation to scania to scania Americans remember the Tuscania. Shall we not remember how they died in their young courage and loyalty and pride? Our boys, bright-eyed, clean lads of America's breed, hearts of gold, limbs of steel, flower of the nation indeed. How they tossed their years to be into icy waters of a winter sea, that we whom they loved, that the world which they loved, should be free. Ready, ungrudging, they died, each one thinking, likely, as the moment was come, of the dear starry flag worth dying for, and then of dear faces at home, going down in good order with a song on their lips of the land of the free and the brave, till each young deep voice stopped under the rush of a wave. Was it like that? And shall their memory ever grow pale? Not ever, till the stars and the flag of America fail. It is I, America, who swear it, calling over the sound of that deep ocean's falling, Tuscania, Tuscania, arm arm americans remember the tuscania very peacefully they are sleeping in friendly earth unmindful of a nation's weeping and the kindly strange folk that honored the long full graves we know and the mothers know that their boys are safe now from the hurts of a savage foe it is for us who are left to make sure and plain that these dead our precious dead shall not have died in vain so that i america young and strong and not afraid I set my face across that sea which swallowed the bodies of the sons I made. I set my eyes on the still faces of boys washed up on a distant shore, and I call with a shout to my own to end this horror for evermore. In the boys' names I call a name, and the nation leaps to fire in its flame, and my sons and my daughters crowd eager to end the shame. It is I, America, calling, hoarse with the roar of that ocean falling. Tuscania, Tuscania! Arm, arm, Americans, and remember, remember the Tuscania. Mary Raymond Shipman Andrews Meanwhile, in France, the Americans were already taking part in the war. 
About the middle of October, the first division had been sent into a heretofore quiet sector of the trenches beyond Einville in Lorraine. On October 25, we took our first prisoner. A few days later, we had our first wounded. And finally, before dawn on the morning of November 3, came a swift German raid in which three Americans were killed, five wounded and eleven taken prisoner. The three whose names were Corporal James D. Gresham, Private Thomas F. Enright, and Private Merle D. Hay, were buried at Bathlemont next day with touching ceremonies. The First Three, November 3, 1917 Somewhere in France, upon a brown hillside, they lie, the first of our brave soldiers slain. Above them flowers, now beaten by the rain, yet emblematic of the youths who died in their fresh promise. They who valiant eyed met death unfaltering have not fallen in vain. Remembrance hallows those who thus attain the final goal. Their names are glorified. Read then the roster, Gresham, Enright, Hay. No bugle call shall rouse them when the flower of morning breaks above the hills and dells, for they have grown immortal in an hour, and we who grieve and cherish them would lay upon their hillside graves our immortelles. Clinton Scollard to America on her first sons fallen in the Great War. Now you are one with us, you know our tears, those tears of pride and pain so fast to flow. You too have sipped the first strange draught of woe. You too have tasted of our hopes and fears. Sister across the ocean, stretch your hand. Must we not love you more who learn to understand? There are new graves in France, new quiet graves, the first fruit of a nation great and free full of rich fire of life and chivalry. Lie quietly, though tide of battle laves above them. Sister, sister, see our tears. We mourn with you, who know so well the bitter years. Now do you watch with us, your pain of loss lit by a wondrous glow of love and power, that flowers star-like at the darkest hour, lighting the eternal message of the cross. They gain their life who lose it, earth shall rise anew and cleansed because of life's great sacrifice. And that great band of souls your dead have met, who saved the world in centuries past and gone, shall find new comrades in their valiant throng. O nation's heart that cannot e'er forget, is not death but the door to life begun, to those who hear far heaven cry, well done? E. M. Walker Training proceeded rapidly, and the sectors where its final stages took place became more and more lively, as the Americans were gradually given a freer and freer hand. End of section 11. Chapter 11 of Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J.L. Baldwin. Poems of American History, Volume 5, The Period of Expansion, by Various, Section 12. Rouge Bouquet, March 7, 1918. In a wood they call the Rouge Bouquet, there is a new-made grave today, built by never a spade nor pick, yet covered with earth ten meters thick. There lie many fighting men, dead in their youthful prime, never to laugh nor love again, nor taste the summertime. For death came flying through the air and stopped his flight at the dugout stair, touched his prey and left them there, clay to clay. He hid their bodies stealthily in the soil of the land they fought to free and fled away. Now over the grave abrupt and clear three volleys ring, and perhaps their brave young spirits hear the bugle sing. Go to sleep, go to sleep, slumber well where the shell screamed and fell. Let your rifles rest on the muddy floor, you will not need them any more. Dangers past, now at last, go to sleep. There is on earth no worthier grave to hold the bodies of the brave than this place of pain and pride where they nobly fought and nobly died. Never fear but in the skies saints and angels stand smiling with their holy eyes on this new-come band. St. Michael's sword darts through the air and touches the oriole on his hair as he sees them stand saluting there. His stalwart sons, and Patrick, Bridget, Columkill, rejoice that in veins of warriors still the gale's blood runs. And up to heaven's doorway floats from the wood called Rouge Bouquet, a delicate cloud of bugle notes that softly say, Farewell, farewell. 
comrades true born anew peace to you your souls shall be where the heroes are and your memory shine like the morning star brave and dear shield us here farewell joyce kilmer the great summons came in the spring of 1918, for on March 21 the Germans began a series of terrific attacks which they believed would end the war. On March 31, an official note announced that the Star-Spangled Banner will float beside the French and English flags in the plains of Picardy. On April 17, the order came for the 1st Division to move into the battle area. Marching Song, April 17, 1918 when Pershing's men go marching into Picardy, marching, marching into Picardy, with their steel aslant in the sunlight and their great gray hawks a-wing, and their wagons rumbling after them like thunder in the spring. Tramp, 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 till the earth is shaken. Tramp, 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 till the dead towns waken. And flowers fall and shouts arise from Chaumont to the sea, when Pershing's men go marching, marching into Picardy. Women of France, do you see them pass to the battle in the north? And do you stand in the doorways now as when your own went forth? Then smile to them and call to them, and mark how brave they fare upon the road to Picardy that only youth may dare. Tramp, 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 foot and horse and caisson. Tramp, 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 such is freedom's passion. And oh, take heart, ye weary souls that stand along the lease, for the new world is marching, marching into Picardy. April's sun is in the sky and April's in the grass, and I doubt not that Pershing's men are singing as they pass, for they are very young men and brave men and free, and they know why they are marching, marching into Picardy. Tramp, 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 rank and file together. Tramp, 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 tramp through the April weather. And never spring has thrust such blades against the light of dawn as yonder waving stalks of steel that move so shining on. I have seen the wooden crosses at Ypres and Verdun. I have marked the graves of such as lie where the Marne waters run. And I know their dust is stirring by hill and vale and lee, and their souls shall be our captains who march to Picardy. Tramp, 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 hope shall fail us never. Tramp, 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 forward and forever. And God is in his judgment seat, and Christ is on his tree. And Pershing's men are marching, marching into Picardy. Dana Burnett on June 2, the 2nd and 3rd Divisions met and checked the enemy at Chateau Thierry. The Marne offensive was followed sharply by another on the part of the British, with whom our 27th Division was fighting, and on August 8, the 27th broke through the famous Hindenburg Line. Our Modest Doughboys, August 8, 1918 Said the captain, there was wire a mile deep in no man's land, and the concentrated fire was all mortal nerve could stand. But these huskies craved the chance to go out and leave their bones. The climate's quite some damp in France, said Private Thomas Jones. Said the Major, what is more, at the point where we attacked, tough old veterans loudly swore Hindy's line could not be cracked. But the twenty-seventh said, Hindenburg, that guy's a myth. I slept last night in a regular bed, said Private Johnny Smith. Said the Colonel, they had placed pillboxes on the crests. I can safely say we faced maybe thousands of those nests. But our doughboys took one height seven times in that hell's hail. And were the cooties thick? Good night, said Private William Dale. Said the general, we were told anything we'd start they'd stop, that the Bosch would knock us cold when we slid across the top. But the seventh with a yell made the Prussian guards back down. Ya oughta lamped the smile on Nell, said Private Henry Brown. Said the sergeant, every shell seemed to whine, old scout, you're dead. And I thought I'd gone to hell in a blizzard of hot lead. But each bloomin' gunner stuck at his post by his machine. Our order said to hold it, Buck, said Private Peter Green. Said the chaplain, talk of pep, they were there, and may I add, when we clambered up the step that last fight, we only had eighty men of Company D, every one I'll say a man. And am I glad I'm home? Ah, we, said Private Mike McCann. Charlton Andrews. Early in September, eight American divisions were concentrated on the Lorraine front and organized into the 1st American Army. On September 12, an assault in force was made against the saint Miel salient, which had threatened France for four years. Twenty-four hours later, the salient was ours, together with 15,000 prisoners. Seiche Pré, September 12, 1918 A handful came to Seiche Pré when winter woods were bare, 
when ice was in the trenches and snow was in the air. The foe looked down on Seichepre and laughed to see them there. The months crept by at Seichepre. The growing handful stayed with growling guns at midnight, at dawn the lightning raid, and learned in Seichepre trenches how a war's red game is played. September came to Seichepre. A slow-wrought host arose and rolled across the trenches and whelmed its sneering foes and left to shattered Seichepre unending sweet repose. Two weeks later we began our greatest battle in an attack on the strong German positions running from the Meuse westward through the Argonne forest. It was in this battle that perhaps the most remarkable single exploit of the war was performed, when Corporal Alvin C. York, a young giant from the mountains of Tennessee, who had been sent forward with a small squad to clean up some machine-gun nests, killed single-handed twenty-eight Germans and came back with one hundred thirty-two prisoners. A Ballad of Redhead's Day October 8, 1918 Talk of the Greeks at Thermopylae, they fought like mad till the last was dead. But Alvin C. York of Tennessee stayed cool to the end though his hair was red, stayed mountain cool, yet blazed that gray October the 8th as Redhead's Day. With rifle and pistol and redhead nerve he captured one hundred and thirty-two, a battalion against him he did not swerve from the titan's task they were sent to do. Fourteen men under Sergeant Early and York the blacksmith, big and burly. Sixteen only, but fighters all, they dared the brood of a devil's nest, and three of those that did not fall were wounded and out of the scrap, the rest were guarding a bunch of Bosch they'd caught, when both were trapped by a fresh onslaught. Excepting York, who smiled amen, and spotting the nests of spitting guns, potted some twenty birds, and then did with his pistol for eight more Huns, who thought they could crush a Yankee alive in each red pound of two hundred and five. That was enough for kill-babe Fritz. Ninety and all threw up their hands, suddenly tender as lamb at the Ritz, milder than sheep to a York's commands, and back to his line he drove the herd, gathering more on the way, absurd. Absurd but true, I gospel fact, for here was a man with a level head, who, scorning to fail for the help he lacked, helped himself till he won instead. An elder was he in the Church of Christ, immortal at thirty, his faith sufficed. Richard Butler Glenzer While our Argonne offensive was in progress, the French and English had been striking mighty blows at other portions of the German line, and everywhere the enemy was in retreat. Realizing that their power was broken, and to save themselves from imminent disaster, the Germans asked for an armistice. It was offered on terms so drastic that many thought the Germans would not sign, but they did and at eleven o'clock on the morning of November 11, 1918, firing ceased all along the front. Victory Bells I heard the bells across the trees, I heard them ride the plunging breeze above the roofs from tower and spire, and they were leaping like a fire, and they were shining like a stream with sun to make its muscle gleam. Deep tones as though the thunder told, cool voices thin as tinkling gold, they shook the spangled autumn down from out the treetops of the town. They left great furrows in the air and made a clangor everywhere, as of metallic wings. They flew aloft in spirals to the blue tall tent of heaven and disappeared. And others, swift as though they feared the people might not heed their cry, went shouting victory up the sky. They did not say that war is done, only that glory has begun, like sunrise, and the coming day will burn the clouds of war away. There will be time for dreams again, and homecoming for weary men. Grace Hazard Conkling America had lost nearly 50,000 men killed in battle, and immediately after the armistice work was begun gathering together their bodies, scattered over many battlefields, and reinterring them in beautiful cemeteries, where their graves would be perpetually cared for and honored. Epicedium, in memory of America's dead in the Great War. No more for them shall evening's rose unclose, nor dawn's emblazoned panoplies be spread. Alike the rain's warm kiss and stabbing snows unminded fall upon each hallowed head. But the bugles as they leap and wildly sing rejoice remembering. The guns' mad music their young years have known, war's lullabies that moaned on Flanders' plain. Tonight the wind walks on them still as stone where they lie huddled close as riven grain. But the drums reverberating proudly roll, they love a soldier's soul. With arms outflung and eyes that laughed at death, they drank the wine of sacrifice and loss. 
for them a lifetime spanned a burning breath and truth they visioned clean of earthly dross but the fifes can ye not hear their lusty shriek they know and now they speak the lazy drift of cloud the noonday hum of vagrant bees the lark's untrammelled song shall gladden them no more who now lie dumb in death's strange sleep yet once were swift and strong but the bells that to all living listeners peal with joy their deeds reveal they have given their lives with bodies bruised and broken upon their country's altar they have bled they have left as priceless heritage a token that honor lives forever with the dead and the bugles as their rich notes rise and fall they answer knowing all j corson miller the dead think you the dead are lonely in that place they are companioned by the leaves and grass by many a beautiful and vanished face by all the strange and lovely things that pass sunsets and dawnings and the starry vast the swinging moon the tracery of trees these they shall know more perfectly at last they shall be intimate with such as these tis only for the living beauty dies fades and drifts from us with too brief a grace beyond the changing tapestry of skies where dwells her perfect and immortal face for us the passage brief the happy dead are ever by great beauty visited david morton the unreturning for us the dead though young for us who fought and bled let a last song be sung and a last word be said dreams hopes and high desires that leaven and uplift on sacrificial fires we offered as a gift we gave and gave our all in gladness though in pain let not a whisper fall that we have died in vain clinton scholard to america's soldier dead was added on january sixth nineteen nineteen a valiant and righteous warrior Theodore Roosevelt, whose sudden death at the age of 61 was a shock to the whole country. The Star, January 6, 1919 Great soul, to all brave souls akin, high bearer of the torch of truth, have you not gone to marshal in those eager hosts of youth? Flung outward by the battle's tide, they met in regions dim and far, and you, in whom youth never died, shall lead them as a star. Marion Kutoy Smith Arrangements for sending home the American army were begun immediately after the armistice, and within a few months a steady stream of khaki-clad troops was flowing through the port of Brest bound for America. Rest left behind. The sun strikes gold the dirty street, the band blares, the drums insist, and brown legs twinkle and muscles twist. Pound, pound, the rhythmic feet. The laughing street boys shout, and a couple of hags come out to grin and bob and clap, Stiff rusty black their dresses, and crispy white their Breton cap, prim on white smooth tresses. Wait, wait, while dun clouds droop over the sunlit docks, over the wet gray rocks and mast of steamer and sloop, and the old squat towers, damp gray and mossy brown, where lovely Anne looked down, and dreamed rich dreams through long luxurious hours. Sudden and swift it rains, familiar fogging gray, it blots the sky away, and cuts the face with biting little pains. We grunt and poke shoes free of muddy cakes, watching them messing out upon the dock in thick brown lakes. No more French mud, the sergeant cries, and someone swears and someone sighs, and the neat squads swing about. Silent the looming hulk above, no camouflage this time, she's white and tan and black. Hurry, bend, climb, push forward, stagger back. How clean the wide deck seems, the bunks how trim, and oh the musty smell of ships faces are set and grin thinking of months this hope was pain and eyes are full of dreams and gay little tunes come springing to the lips home home again again she's moving now across the prow the dusk soft harbor bursts into a shivering bloom of light from warehouse warship transport tramp and countless little bobbing masts each flouts the night with eager boastful lamp bright now now dimmer, dimmer, fewer and fewer glimmer. Only the lights that mark the passing shore, lofty and lonely, star the gray. Then are no more. We are alone with dusk and creamy spray. The captain coughs, remembering the rain. The major coughs, remembering the mud. Some shudder at the horror of dark blood, or wine-wet kisses lewd. Some sigh, remembering new loves and farewell pain. Some smile, remembering old loves to be renewed. Silent we stare across the deepening night, France vanishing, swift, swift the curling waves, fights in despair and faces fair, 
proud heads held high for victory, and flags above friends' graves. The group buzzes, rustles, hums, then stiffens as the colonel comes, a burly figure in the mellow light with haughty kingly ways. He does not scan the night nor hissing spray that flies, but his cold old glance plays along the level of our eyes. I don't see very many tears, he says. John Chipman, Farrar. America went wild in welcoming them as they arrived division after division. There were parades and celebrations, but with surprising swiftness the divisions were demobilized and the men returned to civil life. To the returning brave. Victorious knights without reproach or fear, as close as man is ever to the stars, our welcome met you on the ocean drear in loud free winds and sunset's golden bars. Here at our bannered gate love, honor, laurels wait. Though you be humble, we are proud, and in your stead elate. Fame shall not tire to tell, no sordid stain lies on your purpose, on your record none. No broken word, no violated fane, no winning one could wish had ne'er been won. You were our message sent to the torn continent, that with its hope and faith henceforth our hope and faith are blent. You of our new, our homespun chivalry, here is your welcome in all women's eyes the envious hand-clasp, romping children's glee, music and color and glad tears that rise. Here every voice of peace shall brute our joy, nor cease to vie with shotless guns to shout your blameless victories. But though you are a part of all men's pride, and from your fortitude new nations date, oh, lay not yet your sacred steel aside, but save it for the still imperiled state. You who have bound a girth of new hope round the earth, should its firm bond be loosened here, what were your struggle worth? A redder peril dogs the paths of war, with fire and poison wanton children play, and fickle crowds toward new pretenders pour who summon demons they can never lay. Already we can hear, importunately near, the snarling of the savage crew, half fury and half jeer. Then hang not up your arms till you have taught the ungraceful guests about our hearth and board, that in your swift encounter has been wrought a keener edge to our reluctant sword. You who know well the price of the great sacrifice, your courage saved us once, pray heaven it need not save us twice. And those who come not back, who mutely lie by Maun or Meuse or tangled Argon wood, were it to lose the gain, let them reply, would we recall their spirits if we could? Open your ranks and save their places with the brave, that liberty may greet you all, her shields of land and wave. Robert Underwood Johnson Amid all the celebrations, there was always the consciousness of those who would not return, in body at least, but whose spirits would never be severed from America's. The Return Golden through the golden morning, who is this that comes, with the pride of banners lifted, with the roll of drums? With the selfsame triumph shining in the ardent glance, that divine bright fate defiance that you bore to France. You, but o'er your grave in Flanders blow the winter gales, still for sorrow of your going all life's laughter fails. Born on flutes of dawn the answer, o'er the foam's white track, God's work done, so to our homeland comes her hosting back. Come the dead men with the live men from the marshes far, from the mounds in no man's valley, lit by cross nor star. Come to blend with hers the essence of their strength and pride, all the radiance of the dreaming for whose truth they died. So the dead men with the live men pass and hosting fair, and the stone is rolled forever from the soul's despair. Eleanor Rogers Cox One distinguished visitor was welcomed by the American people as they welcomed their own sons, King Albert of Belgium, who made an extensive tour of the United States in the summer of 1919. King of the Belgians How spoke the king in his crucial hour victorious? the words of a high decision, few but glorious. What was the choice he made that all fear surmounted, the choice of a man that leaves not the soul uncounted? What did the king in bitter defeat and sorrow? He stood as a god, foreseeing a great to-morrow. How fought the king, in silent and stern persistence, patience and power within, and hope in the distance? What was the gift he won in the fire that tried him, the deathless love of his own who fought beside him? What is his crown, the noblest of all for wearing? The homage of hearts that beat for his splendid bearing. Robe and scepter and crown, what are these for holding? Vesture and sign for his spirit's royal molding. What speaks he now, in the hour of faith victorious? 
words of a quiet gladness, few but glorious. Then as we greet him, what shall be ours to render? Silence that shines, and speech that is proud and tender. Marion Cotoy Smith Meanwhile, at Paris, the peace conference under the leadership of President Woodrow Wilson, who had broken all precedents by going to Europe, was struggling with the peace treaty. For America, the great conflict had been a war to end war, and the President insisted that provisions to establish a League of Nations should be made an integral part of the treaty. The Family of Nations With that pathetic impudence of youth, America, half-formed, gigantic, and uncouth, stretching great limbs in something of surprise, beholds new meaning written on the skies. Out of the granite time has reared a state haughty and fearless, awkward, passionate, for all his dreaming and his reckless boast betrayed by those whom he has trusted most. Years of stern peril knit that welded frame, banded those arms and set that heart aflame, burdened those loins with vigor of increase, gave to his hand a weapon forged to peace. He cannot turn the discovering hour aside, he feels the stir that will not be denied, and in the family the nation's plan forgets the boy and finds himself a man. Willard Waddles After months of struggle and negotiation, this purpose was achieved, and on July 10, 1919, the President laid the treaty before the Senate for confirmation. Strong opposition to the League of Nations developed immediately, on the ground that it interfered with America's independence and freedom of action, and various reservations were proposed, limiting America's participation. These the President refused to accept, and finally, after eight months of bitter debate, largely partisan and personal, the Senate rejected the treaty March 19, 1920. The League of Nations Lo, Joseph dreams his dream again, and Joan leads her armies in the night, and somewhere near the Master from his cross lifts his hurt hands and heals the world again. For from the great red welter of the world, out from the tides of its red suffering, comes the slow sunrise of the ancient dream, is flung the glory of its bright imagining. See how it breaks in beauty on the world, shivers and shudders on its trembling way, shivers and waits and trembles to be born. America, young daughter of the gods, swing out, strong in the beauty of virginity, fearless in thine unquestioned leadership and hold the taper to the nation's torch, and light the hearth-fires of the halls of home. Thine must it be to break an unpaved way, to lift the torch for worlds in brothering, to bring to birth this child of all the earth, formed of the marriage of all nations. Else shall we go, the head upon the breast, a Cain without a country, a Judas at the board. Mary Segrist Beyond Wars, for the League of Nations then will a quiet gather round the door and settle on those evening fields again, where women watch the slow homecoming men across brown acres hoofed and hurt no more. The sound of children's feet be on the floor, when lamps are lit and stillness deeper falls, unbroken save where cattle in their stalls keep munching patiently upon their store. Only a scar beside the pasture gate, a torn and naked tree upon the hill, what times remembered will remind them still of long disastrous days they knew of late, till these two yield for sweet accustomed things, and a man ploughs, a woman sows and sings. David Morton It was a revival of the old idea of splendid isolation on the part of men whose gaze was backward, and who had learned nothing from the war. To all others, however, it is evident that America must take her place with the other peoples of the earth at the council table of the League of Nations, and do her part toward the establishment of peace and liberty throughout the world. When there is peace, when there is peace, our land no more will be the land we knew of yore. Thus do our facile seers foretell the truth that none can buy or sell, and e'en the wisest must ignore. When we have bled at every pore, shall we strive for gear and store? Will it be heaven, will it be hell, when there is peace? This let us pray, for this implore, that all base dreams thrust out at door, we may in loftier aims excel and like men waking from a spell, grow stronger, nobler than before, when there is peace. Austin Dobson After the War After the war, I hear men ask, what then? As though this rock-ribbed world, sculptured with fire, and bastioned deep in the ethereal plan, can never be its morning self again, because of this brief madness man with man. As though the laughing elements should tire, the very seasons in their order reel, as though indeed yon ghostly golden wheel of stars should cease from turning, or the moon befriend the night no more, 
or the wild rose forget the world and june be no more june how many wars and long forgotten woes unnumbered nameless made alike despair in hearts long stilled how many suns have set on burning cities blackening the air yet dawn came dreaming back her lashes wet with dew and daisies in her innocent hair nor shall for this the soul's ascension pause nor the sure evolution of the laws that out of foulness lift the flower to the sun and out of fury forge the evening star deem not love's building of the world undone far love's beginning was her end is far by paths of fire and blood her feet must climb seeking a loveliness she scarcely knows whose meaning is beyond the reach of time richard le gallienne end of section 12 recording by j l baldwin end of poems of american history volume 5 the period of expansion by various